All right, I think we will start. Good evening. Welcome to the June 4th City Council meeting. I'm Gina Louise Shara. I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. There are many other people that need to speak this evening and I have the privilege of having more of my statements shared later in the evening. So I'm gonna to try to be as brief as possible as we begin. Um, but as I did last night, I need to open this evening by acknowledging this really current troubling chapter in a long, disgraceful and bloody history. I want to acknowledge and thank all that have taken the time to contact us and sat with us last night at the budget hearing for hours. I see and feel your commitment on your part. Doing that is important and it's meaningful. I deeply believe in protests and I thank those that have and will continue to protest. I also give a heartfelt plea to be safe and peaceful, I want you all to be safe. Um, I am going to ask again that we take a minute before we start the meeting to reflect before we proceed this evening and to not just think of the names, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, but the actual people ruthlessly murdered and the many, many before them and what we can do to bring about change. So I'm going to start some moments of silence. Thank you. Thank you. We have a very full agenda this evening with two subcommittee meetings within the city council meetings. Um, the easiest way to access the agenda for the evening is to go to the city website, which is northamptonma.gov, go to the calendar at the bottom of the homepage and click on the city council meeting on the state June 4th. Click download agenda in the right hand corner. Um, when I am able to, I will also put a link to that in the chat so people can get to the agenda um, and you can follow where we are. Uh, we're going to start this evening with public comment as we do every council meeting. The public comment is outside of the two hearings we have scheduled tonight. The continued public hearing on the FY21 budget from last night and a hearing on a poll petition for Park Hill Road. You may always speak during public comment on any topic, but if you're here to speak, to the budget or the poll petition, that's the purpose of the hearing. And the public testimony during them is part of the record of the hearing. They are, those hearings are the next item on the agenda and the budget hearing is a continuation of just the public testimony. It was scheduled, <coughs> excuse me, it was scheduled to give public, the public another opportunity to speak to the budget. As soon as we finish public comment and convene, we will move on to those two hearings. I will share again that this council experienced a very disturbing Zoom bombing incident a few weeks ago, a few weeks back, <coughs> excuse me. And as the information for this meeting has been shared very widely on social media, we need to carefully protect against another incident. Um, and again, with a meeting of this size and with the way that Zoom functions, which flips the view to any sound, all participants will need to be muted until call, called upon. We will do our best to act quickly if someone is acting clearly in a way that is inappropriate deploying profanity or slurs and outside of what one would expect in council chambers. And I will remove anyone that needs to be removed from the meeting. To be able to see the council, which is the body to whom all comments and testimony should be directed to, I request that you turn off your video unless you have the floor. If you don't wish to make a comment, we encourage you to watch on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media. The recording of this meeting will be available in Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel on YouTube. And I thank them as always for providing this public access. To make a public comment, either a general comment now pertaining, not pertaining to the budget or the poll petition, or in the hearings coming shortly after, 
please use the raise hand feature. That is how I know that you want to comment and I can recognize you. To raise your virtual hand, you click on participants, which is in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Depending on how you have it set up, it can either um, be a static bar that's there, or it could be that you just need to move your mouse over it and it will pop up. Um, when you get to that bar, click on participants. It's going to open a column. At the bottom of the participant column, you're going to see a feature to raise your hand. Uh, if you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. You can also try a keyboard shut, uh, shortcut that I haven't tried yet, which is Alt Y on a PC or Option Y on a Mac to raise your hand. If you're having trouble, you may also use the chat feature to send a message to me. I'll do my best to monitor that, but that's the only purpose for which we'll use that function. I will unmute each raised hand one by one. You may comment with or without video. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. According to council rules, we do not respond during public comment as your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you'll understand when we don't respond. To ensure everyone has equal opportunity, comments are limited to three minutes. In council chambers, we would have normally have the timer up for public comment on monitors and you would be able to see it, but the camera would be on the speaker. With Zoom, we can't share the screen with the timer yet privilege the speaker. So I will begin a timer when you start speaking You'll hear a tone at three minutes and I will ask you to please finish your sentence. I'll remind people we're always happy to receive comments or testimony by email. They are equally part of the public record. So please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. Okay, we are going to start with public comment. And again, I'm gonna remind people that this is, um, if you are here to speak to the hearings, then they will be coming very shortly, I promise. It's different than how it was yesterday, how the how it's structured. Um, so if you're here to speak on a general matter, that's not one of the two hearings, I'm gonna open up public comment. I see um, some hands, give me one moment. First, again, I'm gonna ask that people speak to items that are not the budget um, or the poll petition. First is Mimi Odgers. So I just have a quick question because um, I was told, I remember hearing last night that if we already spoke on the public record, we're not allowed to add to the public record, that that would give us too much. Uh, so I wanted to be able to just publicly comment during the open comment time, but I'm not, very spoke to the public record. So does, I don't know if this counts as my three minute time, but I'm just asking, does that, oh, I can speak still to whatever I want to talk about. Uh, it's a public comment. You may speak to whatever you'd like to talk about. If it's if okay. to the hearing, it is not until it won't count towards the record of the hearing unless you do it within the hearing. Right. Okay. That's great. All right. So Mimi Odgers, Ward 6. Last night, I participated in the budget hearing and spoke during the public response portion. I also had the privilege to listen to the throngs of citizens imploring the city council to reduce, defund, or take steps to drastically change policing as it currently exists in Northampton. This isn't a difficult ask. Los Angeles is defunding their police department by approximately $150 million and will be investing those funds into communities of color. We are asking that you defund the Northampton Police Department by $200,000 and for you to put that money into programs that provide services for our most vulnerable populations or supporting our teachers and students who year after year face losing art classes, band teachers, and critical learning opportunities because of a lack of funds. We are facing economic uncertainty and are in the midst of a recession, possibly on the verge of a depression. Given this, we should put on hold the step raises for the police officers. Revenue from all resources is down in Northampton and we have no idea what type or if any financial support may come from state or federal resources. Now, when so many people are losing their jobs, facing future eviction, drowning under the rising healthcare costs and student loans, we are asking you to do the right thing. If there is no possible way to delay the raises, then shrink the force or find other ways to divert money from the police department and invest it into social workers, youth violence prevention, or our schools or senior citizens. There were so many valid questions raised last night during public testimony regarding the Northampton Police Department. What and how many trainings do they actually undertake and what is the efficacy of those trainings? What and how many types of militarized weapons do they possess to use against residents and visitors of Northampton? Why, if they are already using mental health professionals on calls, can we not transition that component to an agency better equipped to provide support at lower cost to the taxpayer? I am asking each and every one of you on this council to actually pay attention to this moment. 
recognize that no one is protesting the DPW, the schools, the fire department, or central services. Why? Because these departments do not have the power and impunity to weaponize systemic racism in a way that results in the murder and brutalization of Black Americans. Do not rubber stamp this budget with a shrug of your shoulders. Do not tell your voters, your taxpayers, your neighbors that nothing else can be done and that your hands are tied due to contract negotiations. Enough. People are protesting in our streets all across this nation and across the globe. Prove that Northampton is the progressive town that you all believe it to be. Stand up against the police industrial complex. Stand up for those in our society who suffer from being policed. Black and brown people, LGBTQ people, those who suffer from mental illness and those who suffer from addiction. We are likely in a worse economic situation than the 2008 financial crisis. Say no to the raises, say no to the 200,000. We are watching and we are asking you, we are begging you, we are pleading you to stand on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Ryan Cheevers Brown. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ryan Cheevers Brown, Ward 7B to be precise. Um, so I am here to voice my support for passing the later item about the municipal light plant, as it is a very big step forward towards bringing a fiber network into Northampton. Um, if we can pass this now and then get the result from our feasibility studies within the next year or so, we could conceivably be well on the way to beginning to build a fiber network by this time next year. So I urge all of you city council members to please vote for that menu item about the municipal light plant. Also, I am here to say that I'm not sure what to do about this yet, but there have been an alarming number of people parking in the neighborhood behind Leeds School to go to the Mill River. I have been down there a couple of times myself and the density of people is honestly quite concerning given that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm not sure what the best thing to do about that is, but something should be done if to slow down transmission and also because we are losing places to park on the street for people who actually live here. With that, I conclude my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And next we have Dane. Oh, hey, that was fast. Hello, counselors. Hello. Uh, thanks for having us all here tonight. And typically I would be waiting for the hearing to make my comments, but I actually have to run after this. So thank you for calling on me early, Gina. I appreciate it. I have stood before this council many, many times in the last few years, although most of you who are new have not met me before. My name is Dane Cutler and I live in Ward 3. Hi, Jim. Um, and often in these cases, I defer to my colleagues who are expressing with far better eloquence and usually far more accurate statistics the points that I would like to make. So I try to serve as the person who reminds the council that you sit in a historic moment in a historic time and that we are counting on you to be the voices that we elected you to be and that we are counting on you to be the action takers we elected you to be. And that if you don't, as I have threatened before, we're coming for your jobs. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dean. Um, I've been seeing some questions about how you sign up, so I'm going to go over it again briefly. If So this is general public comment. It's not for the hearing on the budget or for the hearing on the poll petition, which is coming shortly after. Um, if you want to speak to something more generally, uh, you may speak to any topic more generally. Those hearings are coming um, on the, at the next, uh, they're the next item on the agenda. Um, but to indicate that you'd like to make a public comment now or when we start the hearings, what you do is you use the raise hand feature. Um, the raise hand feature is that, so if you go to the bottom toolbar on Zoom, it, if you click on participants, that's gonna open up a window that shows you all the participants. At the very bottom of that window, 
it's going to have a raise hand button. You hit that button and that's how I see that you want to make a comment. If you're having trouble with it, let me know. Um, that is what I'm using the chat for. That's the only purpose that I'll use the chat for is to try and help people or make sure that people who want to speak um, and are having trouble letting me know have let me know. Okay. So that's how you indicate, or it's different than how we've done things in council where you have a sign up sheet. That's not a possibility here. Basically, you are queuing up by raising your hand. Um, so, oh, um, I'm also just going to say apparently it's being streamed on channel 12 and not channel 15. So if you would like, would rather watch, um, then please go to channel 12 instead of channel 15, like I had said. Apologies for that. Next, I'm going to go to Lois Ahrens. Uh, I want to speak to the budget. Should I wait? If you'd like your testimony to be part of the public hearing for the budget, then yes. I would like my testimony to be part of Pope. So I can I get in line for that? Um, when that hearing, when we get to the hearing, then um, I, I can't set up different lines. So when we get to that point, yes. At this point, no. This is this is general public comment right now. So does that mean you we should raise our hands again during the next at the next hearing? That means that um, you should raise your hands when we get to the hearing. It's again, only if you wanna speak a public comment on a different matter and then you wanna speak at the hearing. I wanna speak at the hearing. Great, I'll see your hand then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Zakaya. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, my, uh, that's my screen name. My name is Diane Palladino. I live in Florence and I live on Sylvester Road. One of the three people in Ward 7 who live on Sylvester Road. Um, I wanna speak, I was at the hearing last night but I couldn't stay for all of it. I want to echo what people have said, which I will not repeat. No increases for the police, no $200,000. And I would even go so far as to say, no step raises at this time. I would like a few, a few things. I would like, in, for transparency's sake, to see an accounting of what is included in the police budget, other than uh, salaries and fringe benefits. I would like to know the terms of the contract between the police union and the city of Northampton. I would like to know what military grade equipment, if any, that the police department has. And I would like that to be transparent as well. And I would suggest that all police in Northampton take yet another de-escalation course, because I don't believe that in learning de-escalation, you learn about using pepper spray. So that is my short list. Thank you for he hearing me. Thank you for your comments. Okay, next we have Wendy Foxman. Hi there. Hello. Hi. I'm gonna read and I wanna, um, I'm gonna talk now because I wanna respond to last night's hearing and um, I'm really not gonna talk about the budget specifically. Uh, first, I wanna thank the council, uh, Council President Jara, Laura Krutzler and Northampton Media for making, making your, doing your work last night um, for five, a seven hour public hearing and for the, I don't know how many hours it will be tonight that you will be meeting. Um, I heard a lot of pain and anger and passion and ideas last night. I heard people tell their own stories or stories of friends or family who have had bad experiences with the police, experiences that haunt them. I share the shame and anger over the murder of George Floyd and the long legacy of lethal racism in our country. 
I am moved to see the vast response of enough is enough and hope we will stay vigilant in the work ahead with meaningful and systemic change. I am not prepared to demand the city council take any particular action. I trust you to hear our entire community and decide what is best. I am moved to speak because I worked, I have worked with police departments and individual officers multiple times during the last 30 years. I meant to say at the beginning of um, uh, my speaking that I'm in Ward 7 in Northampton in Leeds and um, that I am a white woman for those of you who cannot see me. Um, I've also worked with Franklin County Reinventing Justice and Hampshire County Reinventing Justice, which examined opportunities for improving the justice system in the courts and in the community. One of the several long lasting outcomes was the creation of restorative justice program in Franklin County. I was the director of the Mediation and Training Collaborative, which offers mediation services and training in both Franklin County and Hampshire County. And I ran a training program for the Mass Chiefs of Police Association. I mention all these to let you know that I have worked with police and understand the police culture to a certain extent and certainly alternatives um, in dispute resolution as a mediator. I worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the Northampton Police Department three chiefs ago when I ran the Northampton Saving Lives Program, a national demonstration public health and safety project. I've watched the department grow professionally since then, and I am impressed with how the department has grown. I've also mostly served as a town administrator in numerous communities in Western Mass and had many conversations with chiefs about diversifying the ranks through changes in hiring practices I felt hindered that effort. And for the most part, they took me seriously and were amenable to those suggestions. I also served with former Chief Sinkowitz, Northampton Chief Sinkowitz on the District Attorney's Civil Rights Advisory Commission. In the numerous community, oh, sorry, going back. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, in the numerous communities for which I served as a town administrator, when I was involved with a police department hiring, I heard over and over, and this goes over a 25 year period, and I still hear this from in the field, the Northampton Police Department is almost impossible to get into they have very high standards. I interviewed people who had tried, didn't make it. So Northampton Police Department has a reputation for being a high standard department. I've spent time during the last few nights speaking with or messaging a young woman I met when she was a reporter in this area. She went on to work at other newspapers and decided she wanted to be a police officer. She is now an officer in a large West Coast city like many officers, she is horrified by the police murder of George Floyd, and she shares with me that is the feeling of many of her colleagues. So that was the timer. Oh, sorry. So if you could finish I have one more sentence, okay? Most importantly, I want to say thank you to the people, both officers and civilians, who work for the Northampton Police Department, and as long as we have 400 million guns in the hands of civilians, I do not support the defunding of the Northampton Police Department. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Amy Wilson Kaling. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Amy Kaling. I'm a Florence resident and I'm executive director of the Downtown Northampton Association. And I'm speaking tonight to encourage the city council to pass the mayor's recommended order that would temporarily suspend the effect of certain ordinances in order to enable our restaurants to reopen in a timely fashion with expanded outdoor dining while following the requirements of safe social distancing. As I'm sure you all know, all of our restaurants have suffered significant economic losses, staff have been furloughed or laid off and income slashed while their overhead expenses continue. Many of our restaurants lost out not only on their regular dining income, but the critical months of April and May when graduations, Easter, Mother's Day, and those holidays generate a significant portion of their business. And now they're facing an uncertain future. They have concerns around when and how in-restaurant dining will open, 
concerns about how to keep their employees safe, their customers safe. Social distancing requirements mean for many of our restaurants that they'll go from 100% capacity to 25% or less and worry about how all of this will impact their income during the cold months and the holiday season. So for all of our restaurants in Northampton, outdoor dining will provide them a way to survive a little bit longer. It's not gonna replace their usual income and it won't solve all of their economic challenges, but it will enable them to hang on. But this will only happen if it's up and running quickly. There's a limited window of time in our lovely New England weather cycle where outdoor dining is feasible at all. And that window has already started to run. So once the governor announces a start date for phase two, allowing outdoor dining to commence, our city needs to have plans in place to allow our restaurants to be up and running quickly. The suspension that the mayor is requesting is limited in both time and scope, and it would make a significant positive impact on our restaurant community and our downtown, whereas any delay in reopening would further compound the financial devastation that our restaurant owners and staff are experiencing. So I would implore you to please pass the mayor's recommended temporary order tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you for your comments. One moment. Next is phone number ending in uh, 708. One. Yes, this is Hildegard Friedman, G68, K Hill Apartments, Government Housing. I was a participant in the 1994 Harvard, Harvard Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law. I am a white person. During the years 2013 and 14, I filed in Beckett a complaint against the police chief, Christopher McDonough, and got absolutely nowhere. You're going to find out soon why I'm giving you this history. At the same time, I worked with Officer Hunt of the Pittsfield Police on a fraud case, which I brought to Rob Lewis, the then head of Springfield FBI. We closed the doors of that business, which went far beyond Pittsfield. I worked with Lou Tulick, an outstanding detective in the Ludlow Police Department on a terrorist study, and we were prevented from getting certain information for reasons that you would ascertain uh, with your knowledge of what was going on with the state police. However, I did communicate well with Sergeant Carroll of the Lee State Police and was introduced in a very, very salient encounter with George Hamilton. The demolition and the damage that you saw to the cruisers and the police station were not merely, a re when I don't mean merely as if I'm undermining it, but it was much more than reaction against police violence. There were continual years of reaction brewing to other things. This is the rich, the prosperous against the poor. The police have much more to investigate than training and bad apples. They are favored in the court system. They charge bail, which favors prosperous. The unions prevent, prevent the lay individual, the private individual, from investigating anything. Now, I'm not presuming that military or police conduct themselves according to democratic principles. This is not Tsarist Russia. Where are we? And what happened to COVID when you watch 10,000 people marching? Are they saying perhaps you are not the only ones to be protected against COVID to the police? Come taste our germs and our past. This is a fight between prosperous and poor, Ms. and this Ms. is not. That was the, the timer 
So uh, if you could please finish your sentence. Thank you. That's it. That's it. I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Next, uh, um, for those who came in later, I'm just going to remind people this is general public comment. If you're here to speak to the hearing on the budget or on the poll petition, those are coming right after public comment very soon. Next, we have Elisa Klein. Lisa? Uh, Lisa, if you wanted to make a general comment, um, tell me in the chat, but I'm thinking maybe you have changed your mind to do it for the hearing. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, next is Rose Goldstein. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rose Bookbinder Goldstein, and um, I'm here with my kids, as many of us all are balancing um, COVID time with kids at home. Um, and I'm just going to have to do bedtime with them. So I wanted to take this opportunity, even though it is related to the budget, to speak to that. Um, I um, grew up in Northampton. I am a co-director of an organization, the Pioneer Valley Worker Center in Northampton, right downtown. And I'm also a member of um, United Auto Workers Local 2322. And I sit on the executive board of the Hampshire Franklin Labor Assembly and also the Western Mass Area Labor Federation. And I think I just wanna say that right now is a time for creative and visionary leadership. And um, you all that sit on the city council have an opportunity to be a part of that vision. There's an opening. Um, we're experiencing not only a pandemic, but a national and global um, uprising. And I've always felt in the deepest part of my body that Northampton can and should be an example. We have progressive ideals that don't always come out in its true form. And right now, you all on the council have an opportunity to do that. Um, the LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department just slashed their budget by nearly $200 million slash the, I'm sorry, the, L, the city council um, cut it, the LAPD budget by $150 million, 6% of their budget. Minneapolis is thinking about how they can re-envision what policing look like, looks like with, a with the community at my, in centered and thinking about and lifting up the leaders of black folk in that community so that they can direct what that looks like. And we have an opportunity for change. We have an opportunity for a vision. And I hope that you all take that opportunity and that you recognize that there's been over 700 people that have participated in the last two days um, who are mobilized and are here to have your back as council people to make that change. And I'm just calling on you to do that and to re-envision what that money could go for instead of us struggling to have the budget we need for our schools, for social services, for workers, um, to make that and be that change. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, we're gonna try this again. Elisa Klein. It looks like I'm unmuted this time. My Welcome name. Good. Uh, my name is Elisa Klein. I live in Leeds. Um, those of you who were uh, at the budget hearing yesterday heard me speak to the budget. Uh, today, I wanted to speak to the resolution that you're considering. I um, It does include a little bit of information related to the budget because I, I see this resolution as very much intertwined with your consideration of the budget as it pertains to the Northampton Police Department. Um, so I see in the resolution that you're considering this evening that is called a resolution in response to the most recent killings of African Americans that the co-sponsors say, quote, it is incumbent upon local authorities to respond to the suffering that racism inflicts and that the city council, quote, stands unified in our commitment to confront institutional racism. 
So I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to address institutional racism in the concrete ways that your legislative power gives you. It's not just about facilitating community conversations on racism as one of the resolution clauses suggests. It's about responding to the voices of constituents who have initiated those community conversations already, whether it be in the budget hearing last night, in the protests that are happening, and in all the other ways that activists have stepped up in this community for years. I encourage you to respond to those constituents with legislative change that mandates concrete and real steps to reduce the brutal effects of systemic racism. Passing a resolution in this case is not enough. Why not use city money to develop an exploratory body or hire consultants tasked with researching and developing a set of alternatives to policing? You as our legislative body can form a select committee as a first step. You can pass legislation mandating new approaches to the safety of members of our community. You can reduce the proposed budget tonight to defund aspects of policing in Northampton. And I just wanna finish by paraphrasing Alex Vitali, who's a professor of sociology and the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College, um, in saying that the use of the police to deal with homelessness and all kinds of other social issues as it is, is a political failure. And I would like to suggest that this is your chance, this is your opportunity to create a new anti-racist political and social reality here in our city. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Um, okay, next we have Ian Busher. Thank you. Um, my name is Ian Busher, and I just wanted to speak out against the um, the idea of uh, reopening restaurants. Uh, like nice food and going out is is nice, and it certainly benefits private business owners. Um, but that benefit isn't worth um, the public health risk now. Um, I know there's been some positive signs about uh, about uh, outdoor transmission, um, but it's too soon, and the numbers um, don't support it uh, right now. I think right now providing financial aid to the workers directly is a really good idea, an example of something that one could do if you freed up more room in the budget. I'm sorry, did you say your city or town of residence? I don't South Deerfield. Thank you so much. Next. Um, again, I'm getting questions how you sign up. Uh, you use the raise hand feature. Um, this is general public comment. If you're here to talk on the budget or the poll petition that's coming in the hearing soon. Next is Mac uh, Godinez. Godinez. Hi, my name is Mac Godinez, Northampton, Ward 3A. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Awesome. So I spoke already to my feelings about um, how we should uh, defund the police in respect to the budget yesterday. So instead today, I'm going to amplify a letter coming out of Hamden County Jail that I think could provide us um, some good context for the discussion here tonight. To whom it may concern, my name is Joshua Cruz. I'm currently being housed at the Ludlow House of Corrections. I'm writing this letter in reference to the COVID-19 outbreak and the danger we at the Hampton County Correctional Facility have and are facing here. Not only has Hampton County sent employees home and quarantined incarcerated people who are showing symptoms, but the administration is locking all symptomatic people up in three cells in a housing unit where others are also being held. Not only does this put the person with symptoms in danger, it also puts everyone in the same unit and tower that we as incarcerated people reside in because we have the same ventilation system. For example, our correctional officer was showing symptoms, including a high fever. She was sent home for about a month and has since returned, but during her absence, not one person incarcerated in her controlled housing unit was assessed or tested. Also on May 6, 2020, name redacted, was quarantined in the cell. Mind you, he has been here about a year and was symptom-free until he had physical therapy with the physical therapist doctor whose name wasn't given to us. What we do know is that the sheriff tells us that they screen all personnel before they enter the facility. So how the doctor passed the screening is beyond understanding. So I say again, after his contact with the physical therapist doctor, I, Joshua Cruz, along with others held in housing unit A2, have had contact with said individual. As I said before, we share the same ventilation system, so every person incarcerated in A tower could have been exposed and put in danger, and not one of us has been tested or assessed. 
I just want to state that everything I've mentioned so far and what I'm going to close with is what I've heard with my own ears and seen with my own eyes. The Sheriff of Hamden County holds press conferences stating that his facility is COVID-19 free, which is partially to be true because no one has been tested. So without being tested, how can you possibly know and be sure that Hamden County is COVID free? Um, all I know is that the sheriff is constantly lying to us and we would like answers in the truth. For example, when the sheriff came to our housing unit A2, name redacted, told the sheriff to please not lie to us as we are grown men and can handle the truth. He was shut down, handcuffed and sent to segregation for the remainder of the night while the sheriff addressed us. All that showed us was if you question the sheriff, disciplinary action will be taken. Here's a signature of the person who was sent to solitary confinement to attest the accuracy of the statement. Signature included here. As incarcerated people, we feel as though we have to go through drastic measures to get this letter to you and avoid disciplinary action while making sure this letter reaches our legal team. These measures include making multiple copies sent to you, um, et cetera. Sci Sincerely, Joshua Cruz, I think it's clear how this relates to the discussion on defunding the police. And so I yield the rest of my time. Thank you for your comment. Next is Patrick Burke. work. Ah, sorry about that. I remuted myself. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Patrick Burke. I actually live in Holyoke, used to live in Northampton. Uh, main reason I'm here, though, is because I'm the president of the Hampshire Franklin uh, Labor Assembly. Um, I'm also a union representative and organizer with UAW Local 2322. And uh, I actually serve on the uh, PBTA advisory board with Mayor Narkowitz. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to make a couple kind of general comments, um, you know, conceptually, you know, rather than kind of speak specifically to the to the budget. Um, you know, b basically, you know, we're at a point now where you know where we have people of conscience who have to make difficult decisions and those difficult decisions, you know, require us to step out of the frameworks that we're used to, um, you know, used to doing and used to working in, um, you know, in my work as union representative, I've had to do enormous amount to try to save and protect the lives of my members who can't rely on OSHA because it's not being used. It's not being enacted. Uh, we have employers, um, there's no watchdog, you know, we, and I echo um, what was said earlier that we don't have the resources to protect people still. Um, and in this context, you know, how we promote safety and security for actual human beings is how do we ensure that we're protecting folks from this pandemic, from health and safety violations, and you know, to that end, you know, our our assembly in consultation with the eight thousand, uh, the twenty some odd affiliates and discussions with them, you know, have taken a position to say that we you know do not want to see money invested in police. We want to see that invested in things like public transportation, healthcare, social work, protecting restaurant workers. Um, you know, and this is the discussion that we're having um, as we are looking at severe austerity. Um, so, you know, we have to actually fight to put resources into the things that actually help and save people's lives and not um, continue um, reinforcing, you know, anti-Black racism and the structural oppression that brings with it. So again, um, you know, I think I'll just say I really encourage the council members to, you know, be welcome to read up on these subjects and to continue dialogues. And I'm you know, happy to really facilitate, you know, labor, you know, really taking a stand um, on this issue because, you know, we care about the whole working class. Thank you. That was the time. Thank you so much for your comment. Can the council nod for me? Um, can you guys hear the tone when it goes off? No. It was, it, it, I, we could hear it much better last night. I don't know what I'm doing differently. I will work on that while I do all these other things. Um, 
Okay. Otherwise, I will I will tell you when it goes off, but I will try and make it louder so you can hear it. Next is Johnny W. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Johnny Williams. I live in Ward 1 of Northampton. I'm uh, going to be, I'm speaking, uh, there was a comment earlier about the concern that police keep us safer by limiting gun violence. And I just want to contradict that and raise a, raise a point that police actually don't make people safer. And that if we're going to talk about gun violence, we have to mention the very active role that police have in contributing to gun violence. And that if we really want to end gun violence, we need to start with demilitarization and with defunding the police, not giving them more money. Not only do police actively contribute to gun violence, but they overwhelmingly target black people and people of color who are most often unarmed amongst other marginalized groups. There's actually been studies done that in New York City, when the New York Police Department went on strike for a brief period in late 2014 and early 2015, crime rates actually went down. So we also have to ask ourselves why people own guns in the first place, and it's often because they don't feel safe to begin with, and they don't think that the police will keep them safe because they won't. I would just like to end by saying that there's nothing a police officer can do to stop a public emergency that a social worker trained in de-escalation skills couldn't do much better. Um, police often aren't really trained adequately in de-escalation skills, and even when they are trained, don't utilize them effectively. Um, so we really need to ask ourselves, why do we still have police when we could have social workers and EMTs filling these roles? And one last thing, as the Councilwoman Maori said on yesterday's talk, uh, Northampton is in a position to experiment with alternatives policing. What is the harm in trying that out? Um, I don't see any damage that we could cause by simply defunding the police and experimenting with alternatives. So I yield my time after that. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Foster is going to try and help me with um, a timer. So are you good to go? Do you think? Okay, let's give that a try. Thank you for your help. Um, next is Sherilyn Strader. Hi. Um, I would just like to echo what Elisa Klein said about the resolution that's being put forth later on in the meeting. I don't think it is a strong enough resolution. I really appreciate that the council is bringing it forward, but I don't think words of, are strong enough. I think the council needs to be taking action on what is currently going on. And I would like to recommend that the council um, add a line to the resolution endorsing um, the Massachusetts uh, elected official of, of colors 10 point plan um, with recommendations for federal, state, and municipal um, actions, uh, which uh, Councillor Mayori uh, mentioned on last night's hearing. Um, and in addition to um, considering uh, further um, actions that the uh, council can take uh, for um, reforms of the NPD. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, sorry, there's a really loud bird outside my window. I will try and mute in between. Um, next is Carolyn Oppenheim. Again, this is general public comment, not to the budget, not to the poll petition. You're unmuted, Carolyn. Okay. Um, I'm Carolyn Toll Oppenheim. I live in Ward 3B. I am um, a former newspaper reporter and a retired academic. I was there, I, I've been thinking more about the broader resolution and reaction. I mean, I'm, I'm very moved that we are a town of 90 something percent white people with an enormous passion for social justice. And I'd like to see that translated into some energy into making us not a 90 something percent white community. My, my only experience that leads me to think of that is that I was on the search committee in my department at Emerson College 
and there was, for, for new faculty, there was tremendous resistance by the predominantly white male faculty against us going sort of outside the usual methods of finding uh, an, you know, somebody to fill. They just said, well, you know, if the black people don't come or if they aren't the right people, that's the way it is. And um, I'm trying to, oh, okay. Trying to get my, no, it don't work, my video. So a couple of female faculty members and I, we, we tried to find some unorthodox ways of reaching out and finding publications and places that weren't the standard ones to go to, to try to find applicants. I kind of think that that may be in the 10 point plan. I'd love to read it. I feel like in some ways I'd love a, to have a diversity officer for this community that has some oversight over searches. Last night, Chief Casper was just was being um, questioned by Councilman, um, is it Thorpe? And, and she said, well, we've tried, but we just can't get white police and we pair with Greenfield Community College. Well, that's a mostly white school. There are a lot of community colleges that have higher percentages of people of color. It would seem to me, it would be make sense if we had a diversity officer who had experience and could give guidance to institutions in our community to do searches so that we have a, you know, a five-year plan to diversify this, this city. Um, there are ways to do it. It has to be intentional. I think there are models for that. But I mean, in the spirit of how we feel about what's going on, maybe, maybe our goal should be to really, and I'm not talking about immediately, we have the budget, but beyond that, developing some ways in the community to actually tackle this problem systemically. There are plenty of people who could be brought here um, through the institutions. Anyway, I think I've said what I want to say. Oh, I can't hear you. That's the timer, thank you so much. Uh, I'm told that was actually a chipmunk, not a bird, um, but it's quieted down. So I'll, I'll try and keep myself unmuted. Um, uh, so next is Eric Matlock, but there is no, there's no um, sound. So there's no way for me to unmute. Um, so if you find a way to come in with sound, uh, let me know. In the meantime, I'm going to go to Nietzsche Instrument 04. Hi. Um, my name is Nicole LaRue. Um, that was meant to read, read Nikki. Uh, my name is Nicole LaRue. I'm a graduate student at UMass Amherst and a resident of East Hampton. Um, I have lived in Hampshire County on and off since 2006, attended Hampshire College and uh, spend a lot of time in Northampton. I'm a US citizen originally from South Africa and as a white South African, I am deeply familiar with what inaction and silence enables. I am also deeply familiar with how supremacy is enabled or stopped by each individual action that we take and with the impact of racialized policing. My grandfather was the equivalent of a Supreme Court judge in South Africa during apartheid, the height of supremacy there. And he was determined in arguing with me that he was not acting politically or racially, but he was known as a hanging judge for sentencing so many people, black people to death. It is easy as white people to fool ourselves that we are allies by making statements and taking moments of silence. While these matter without action, including defunding the police and putting in place accountability, we are not acting anti-racially, but reinforcing the very system we are saying and may even believe we don't support. What we say, but more importantly, what we actually commit to do and do right now matters. We cannot stand on the sidelines and ignore that as white people, we are reproducing a racist system that devalues, exploits, and kills black people. I want to add what has, to what has already been said today and in yesterday's meeting, 
in addition to the defunding the police and absolutely not providing raises at this time, as well as increasing resources and accountability for training for police officers in de-escalation and diversity and setting measures of accountability, specific measures such as markers for decreasing police brutality in Northampton. That last night, the mayor of East Hampton, Nicole LaChapelle announced at the city council meeting that they took the mayoral pledge to introduce common sense limits on police use of force introduced uh, last night by president, possibly before by president Barack Obama. Northampton mayor Narkowitz must sign on to this pledge immediately in addition to all of the other actions, the very specific concrete steps that need to be taken. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, I'm gonna go back. Eric Matlock. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Jody Casper, uh, you compared cops making mistakes that kill people to getting a bad burger. Do you think that shows any empathy? For me and many like me, that is a lasting statement you, you gave about people of color being killed by the police. Maybe you should be paid what fast food workers make. Maybe we defund your department and simultaneously increase the fire e EMS budget. They deal with the same exact people who the police abuse without killing them. With a little more training, the police would only be needed for only very few incidents. Only, maybe not in our, our city. You nor your officers actually engage with certain people in the community. You're too afraid of a lawsuit to even talk to me. You wouldn't be if you were honest. All that training didn't stop your officers from harassing me for smoking outside, charging me for calling you cowards, or actually accusing me of racism for calling an officer ignorant, calling me, seeing me charged instead of my assailant when I was stabbed seeing me charged when I was trying to de-escalate a fight or charged with possession of legal hash oil or charged for speaking too loudly or protesting or charged because your officers pepper sprayed me without cause. Only found not guilty because one of the nice ladies working in City Hall can tell the truth. You don't recognize us as an asset to your community and you choose to criminalize us. We are brown, we are gay, bi, and trans, and we are houseless, we are disabled. The police don't protect us here, they drive us out. You are part of the problem because you try to claim it doesn't exist. Try to claim we don't exist. If you did your job even a little, you would know I police my purview unarmed for free. I protect my own community. I've come a long way through and from my ancestors. I'm not angry because of everything that we have been through. I'm free because I've fought to be. And I will not allow someone who's dead wrong and believes their badge can interrupt one moment of that freedom to do it yet again. I will fight because enough is enough. I'm not afraid of you and I do not respect you. So one wrong moment with one of your officers and I'm a dead man. This isn't the first time I've addressed you and it won't be the first time you ignore me. This is not the time to enact and increase the police budget. Find another way to keep your union obligations, Ms. Casper. Maybe have more officers walk and bike to save on some gas. Northampton does have the ability to do something new. The police force here far outweighs the amount of real crime in our city. That is all. Thank you. Okay, next is Dana Goldblatt. Again, uh, the hearing for the budget is coming soon. This is general public comment on issues not pertaining to the budget or um, this, this public comment will not be testimony for the public hearing. Um, that is coming up very soon. Same thing if you're here to speak on the poll petition, that is coming very soon. Dana? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm worried I won't have time for the actual, that I might be, uh, uh, I know a lot of people want to speak. I'm worried I won't have time to speak at the budget uh, for the actual budget part. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to address that issue now, even though it won't be part of the public comment. Um, I guess there's going to be a lot of really smart people saying really great stuff about why this is not only the wrong time to increase police budgets, but the right time to slash police budgets and transfer that money to uh, communities and people that know how to work with the populations that the police don't know how to work with. Um, 
they're going to talk about that. And I just, I, I want to give a metaphor because I think we're at a real turning point in how we understand society and how we understand community. And uh, it reminds me a lot when I'm in court, uh, I'm a public, I'm a, a criminal defense attorney. This reminds me a lot when I'm in court of what it must have been like when people had to give up the idea that the body had four humors and you had to bleed the bad humors to purge the body when you had a fever and they figured out germ theory. And germ theory makes so much less sense than the Galenic humors theory that it must have been really weird. And there were a lot of people who were just saying, well, if we don't put leeches on people with fevers, what do we do? And the answer was, well, since it can kill them, first of all, just don't do it. And second of all, it depends on what's causing the fever. It turns out there's a lot of different reasons for fevers and uh, that's what we need to be dealing with. But it must have felt really confusing. And a lot of people must have stuck with leeches for a really long time, just figuring out, studying where on the body to put the leeches. And I feel like that's what we're doing now when we're denying the reality that policing doesn't help. Putting people in prisons doesn't help. Sure, it's a great theory if you remove the human being who just did a bad thing or an inconvenient thing or behaved in a way you don't like, now the source of that is gone and society is gonna get closer and closer to perfect. But it's like the Galenic humor theory, you don't just bleed people, it doesn't work. It causes more problems than it solves. So at some point you just have to admit it's not working and stop doing it. And that's where we are now. So I guess I would just ask all of the counselors in 10 years, 15 years, I think it's gonna be really obvious that 19th century police violence was not helpful in building stable communities and it wasn't a good way to deal with social, social conflicts. That it turned out to be worse for society than nothing. And it'll be pretty obvious by then, sort of the way germ theory is obvious now. And the people that stuck around with the, oh, but what will we do instead? And we really like our police. And what about all those people that have spent their livelihoods raising leeches for us? What will we do? That seems unfair. I think they're all gonna sound a little silly. We're at a turning point here. None of this is working. And the idea that we have an armed paramilitary that goes out to deal with mental health crisis, I think is becoming more and more obviously ridiculous. And the long time we do it, I think- <laughs> That was the time, sorry. The time. We're struggling with making it um, so Turn people can hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have an, one other hand right now. Um, uh, Alaya Rahman, pardon me if I get your name wrong. Hi, we, I can hear you. Oh, not anymore. Hi, you're unmuted. Hi, my name is Ahalia Rahman and I'm a resident of Northampton Ward 3. I'm here to advocate for the defunding of the police. I believe that this money can be better spent on providing affordable housing, money for schools, better and more available healthcare, mental and otherwise. It's not possible for any institution or group of people to be given this much power and not abuse it. Holding police officers accountable via the criminal justice system is not a solution either. It simply furthers our prison industry and stunts our social emotional growth, including the mental health of those individuals who work as police officers. To quote Action Bronson, opportunity be knocking. With that, I yield my time. Thank you for those comments. Um, okay, I don't see any other hands raised for general public comment. Give people a moment if there's anybody else. Okay, there's one other hand. Again, general public comment, not to the budget hearing, not to the hearing on the poll petition. Jasper. Hi, how's it going? Um, I'm also speaking to um, defunding the police and looking into other options for that for the budget. Um, I believe that right now is the time to analyze what we mean when we think about community safety and um, lead through moving towards a more holistic approach to this. Um, I believe that 
if this money went towards um, social services in, in public schools, then it could create a, a society that that generally is is just psychically healthier. And therefore, you know, when that positive chain reaction happens, I believe that there's frankly less to police in, in one sense. Um, yeah, I passionately uh, believe in investigating all options for ways um, in which the, the role of um, police can be substituted for um, other positions such as social workers and de-escalation trainers, as noted earlier, um, because a lot of people feel like right now reform isn't enough. Um, you know, um, obviously there's so much um, atrocity um, going around right now nationwide that I'm sure everyone's aware of, but even the Minneapolis um, um, Police Department um, had a lot of those those trainings that we speak of. And I'm sure that, you know, that, that came from, there was really tragic events that led up to an emphasis on those trainings. But, you know, it, it, it's really sad to say that I, I genuinely don't feel like that's enough. And I think um, a lot of people, um, feel that feel that way like there's a gap between all of these mindfulness trainings and then kind of the mindfulness um in 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 action in action excuse me um people aren't seeing um that that come through and um because and um what's the last thing i was gonna say this is a radical change in both culture and infrastructure but i believe it to be a necessary change or else the inherently violent internal logic of policing will continue and um yeah and and, and this is an internal logic that um that has um a, 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 a dark history so i think that we can um be leaders in northampton and, and think critically about um those histories and think critically about what we mean when we think of safety um thank you for your time before you mute jasper um i need you to give your name and your city or town of residence please of course sorry uh jasper kesson um florence ward five Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, there is another hand uh, being indicated to me. Um, Ty Tig Ridley, tell me how you say your name. Hi, my name is Ty Ridley. I'm from Ward 3, Northampton, Massachusetts, Wilson Avenue. Um, I want to speak on behalf of teenagers and young people who are standing up right now. Um, I'm in New York City at the moment. I've been going to protests here in Brooklyn. I've seen um, rampant aggression against peaceful protest. And it's done by normal workers and it's done by men and women um, who are no more different than people in our own city in a lot of regards. Um, I FaceTimed my sister who was at a rally at the police station. She called me with tears in her eyes because she had been pepper sprayed. She was 15 granted. And her and her friends had gone to stand up for what they were seeing online and for what they were seeing across the country. Um, my grandmother has been a counselor in town and a therapist for my entire life. I have seen her clients and her patients get tossed from low-income housing to low-income housing, and I've seen them get in trouble with the police consistently. There is a disregard and there is a lack of empathy for low-income and people of color in Northampton. And I ask, um, I ask my representatives to, to listen to young people and to listen to minority groups and to listen to the voices that are in pain and that are, are crying out for change. Um, the city has long been a really safe place in my mind. And I, I'd like to see us vanguard a new kind of safety in the future. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Um, Okay, I see another hand. I'm just gonna do one more reminder. So if you are here to speak on the budget, if you're here to speak at the budget public hearing, that has not started yet. Comments that you make now will not be part of the record for that hearing. So um, that hearing is gonna start very soon if we can get to it. Um, but if you're here to speak on something other than the budget hearing or the other hearing, which is for a poll petition, that's what this time is for. Um, Pennington Geis. Hi. I'm here because even, even though you can see that I am white, what you can't see is that I have, I live and love in a multicultural, multiracial family. And if you go to my Facebook 
page right now, you will see this family at, at a reunion. And so, although I'll never know what it's like to worry about my son driving while black, I do know what it is to worry about relatives who are black. I have a nephew who was at Ms. U during Ferguson. So I, I have that not in my stomach feeling. And because of that, I am particularly grateful to our chief of police and our police department for all of the sensitivity training they've done for really working to make our force more, uh, more diverse. So this isn't a budget question. I just wanna make a public thank you to our police chief and our police department for really trying to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Is there any more general public comment? We don't see any more hands. I don't see any chat. Seeing none, we can convene the meeting. So I, I'm just gonna make, I made this request at the very beginning, so I'm gonna make it again. Um, if you are not commenting and you don't have the floor, then if you could please turn off the video, that enables the council who have their video on, unless they're having some kind of technical issue, to be visible to people. Um, what happens is they get bounced all around and then people can't see the council and the council is to whom you're directing anything that you're saying. So um, if you could comply with that and turn off your video, I would greatly appreciate it. It would make it much easier for everyone else to just be able to participate with the council. Thank you. Um, we can now convene the meeting as we finish public comment. Laura, when you are ready, could you please take the role? Sure. Councilor Dwight. Oh, sorry. This is the other problem with not being able to see the council. They, here we go. Okay. Here. Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to start with public hearings. First, we're going to start with an announcement of a public hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing concerning the Northampton Capital Improvement Program for FY 2021 to FY 2025. That public hearing is going to be Thursday, June 18th, 2020, in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures. Section 7-5, Capital Improvement Program B. Public hearing by order of the City Council, the Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing via uh, remote participation on Thursday, June 18th, 2020, 7.05 p.m. The City Council will consider the Capital Improvement Program for FY 2021 to FY 2025 and hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Instructions for accessing the public hearing will be posted on the June 18th, 2020 City Council agenda, which can be found on the city's website at www.northamptonma.gov. The City Council meeting will begin at 7 and that hearing will begin at 7.05. So that is the announcement of the public hearing. Next, we are gonna to move to the, actual, the hearings that we have on the agenda. Um, we will hear from as many people as we can this evening. Um, by being here to speak with us, you are doing what you need to do, and I thank you for it. It's very, very important. We also need to do what we need to do to fulfill our roles, and we have many items on the agenda that we need to get to. We will, um, we will take the, we will take the first the public hearing, which is 20.048 first, as it's also a legally posted hearing. And the poll petition hearings have historically been very brief, so we're going to do that one first, and then we're going to go to the public hearing, um, which is the continuation from last night. So the first item that we're going to do is public hearing uh, 20.048 National Grid slash Verizon New England poll petition for Park Hill Road. Uh, petition number 257-63215. Um, Move to open public hearing, please. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to open the public hearing. 
um, we need a roll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Hold up. Councillor Thorpe. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. She's saying yes. I'm here. Story. Yes. Yes. Um, Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Nash. Switch the order. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. Uh, the hearing is open. I am first going to ask if there are any proponents. Let me see if I can find, I don't see the usual person who comes, which is Lisa Jasinski. Yeah. Am I right that I don't see her? Hmm. I don't see her. She was notified, uh, we did speak and she was aware of the hearing. I did mention to her that it might get started a little late. So perhaps she will be joining us later. Um, uh, Should we thinking move maybe. to continue the hearing? That's what I'm I, thinking. I, I move to continue the hearing at the next available date. Uh, rather than after, meeting. rather than simply after the public hearing on the budget, or do you want to? Well, I, I, I strongly yeah. suspect that that's going to be very late, and I would okay. actually recommend that this poll petition be um, continued to the next council meeting. Gotcha. Thanks. A second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on continuing this poll petition to the next meeting? Is uh, is this a time sensitive matter that will cause any issues if we don't do the hearing tonight? I don't know. If there's anybody who can speak to that, hold on. Uh, if there's anybody who can speak to that, tell me in chat. I don't think so though. I know it's for the polls related to the solar array. Um, for new telephone, new utility polls. Okay. Well, any, um, we don't know the answer. Presumably, no. Um, any other discussion on continuing? Hearing? If we had, if this is something we would vote on twice, just understanding. No. Um, no. So this would this is the hearing, and then the the vote is in actually in the consent agenda. I got um, you. So if we have not had the hearing, we would remove it from the consent agenda. I got you. Thank you for the clarification. Of course. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay. Okay. That is continued. Um, so we can move to the continuation of the public hearing from last night, June 3rd, 2020, um, concerning the FY 2021 budget. I move that, to open the continuation of that. You know. I'm, um, I guess it doesn't hurt to have a motion. Since it's open, I'm not sure that we need a motion on it, but. Well, we did close and we moved to continue. So um, just in case. Let's do it. Um, any discussion on continuing? Hearing um, none. Roll call, please. Okay, we're opening the continuation of the hearing, right? Um, right. I'm sorry. Who was the second? Mary. Council of Barge. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, 
second. Okay, Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that hearing is continued. Um, wait. Wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. That we are now continuing. Um, okay. So um, this is the continuation from last night. If you spoke last night, if you submitted testimony or email um, to us uh, during that hearing or after, um, I'm gonna ask that you give other voices a chance to speak. I know you all understand the importance of everyone having an equal opportunity to share their comments with us. So I'm gonna please respect that you choose to step back and give others space. Um, also, please, uh, I, so a hearing is for us to gain information. Please only add new information. We have a lot that we have to get to today. Um, if something you wish to say has already been said, you um, and you want to be recognized for that, feel free to come on and just say ditto. That fully counts for us. We, we recognize what that means. Um, so, please, so we are going to get to as many people as we can. We do have other items on the agenda. So there may come to come a point where we need to move on. So if, if you've already spoken, as I said, please give other people space to speak. Um, and please only add new information if you can, because we have to get the rest of our agenda and to get to these votes. Thank you so much. And we are gonna start this process. So, um, Councillor Foster, are you prepared to help me again? I am, yes, I have the timer ready. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, okay, we're gonna start with Lois Ahrens. Okay, thank you. Uh, as Rose Bookbinder mentioned um, yesterday, uh, while you all were meeting and people were speaking uh, simultaneously, um, the mayor of Los Angeles recommended cutting $150,000, $150 million from their 2021 police budget. He said he would reallocate those dollars to communities of color, quote, so we can invest in jobs in education and healing. And quote, the cut, his quote, his cut of 150 million is about 8% of the LA police budget. If we were to do that here, the cut would be a little bit more than half a million dollars, a good place to start in 2021 after rejecting the mayor's additional request. Northampton is a small town with a small population of 30,000 people. There are 60 sworn officers. And of course, that doesn't include all of the people that work for the police who aren't officers. The average police force for a town our size is 48. Way too many, I think, but a lot less than what we have here, considering there is almost no crime. Northampton police armed with guns and tasers have become an expensive substitute for health and mental health providers and mediators. We do not need armed police addressing vandalism, drug overdoses, noise complaints, ensuring that people wear masks even when police don't wear masks, interacting with people who are unhoused or people misusing substances. Given the loss of revenue in the city, now is the time to reject the mayor's request and significantly reduce the police budget and reduce, re, redirect money to provide needed services, connections, and care, which will be more effective, less expensive when done by nonviolent trained outreach people from the community for the community who can provide us with a different idea of what public safety can mean, real public safety. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Next is Alex Holland. Hi, um, I'm just here to also uh, voice my support 
Uh, I'm from Chicopee. I'm here to voice my support for defunding the police and also recommending that perhaps the Northampton Police Department, if they continue to exist, switch to a uh, type of cruiser the next time they acquire vehicles that are not a danger to pedestrians and don't cost so much money to fuel. Thank you. I'm Thank done. you. Can you repeat your name for the record, please? Alex Holland. Thank I'm you. a resident of Chicopee, but I often do business in Northampton. Thank you so much. Next is uh, Theo Pirels. Uh, Pirels, yeah. Uh, okay. Name Theo Pirels, town of Amherst. Uh, regardless of your perception of and relationship to the Northampton PD, black and brown residents have spoken out against the violence and discrimination they have experienced at the Northampton police's hands, and it is your duty to listen to them. To fund the Northampton police is to cause harm to marginalized communities and to view the police as protectors is a privilege. Funding social services and community-based support systems is the only option that will uplift and support all residents rather than perpetuate existing violence systems. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ashley Rogers. Uh, hi, so uh, my name is Ashley Rogers. I'm with the uh, Independent Socialist Group of Western Massachusetts, uh, and I'm a South Hadley resident, uh, and I'd like to talk for a moment about the budget proposal. Um, I remember about two weeks ago, there was an article uh, where Mass Live interviewed the mayor, um, and he said, you know, the, the, the budget needed to be cut. Um, and in that article, it said, uh, you know, the equivalent of, I think, 17, 17 and a quarter full-time jobs are being cut from this new budget. Uh, and this is right, right before a recession, right? This is a budget, uh, you know, cutting these jobs and, and putting people unemployed right before a recession. And, and after all this, right, to save $600,000 uh, with these cuts, we're giving $200,000 more to the police department, a full third of that amount. Why does the police department need an extra two hundred thousand dollars? Do they need like to buy more military equipment and weaponry to patrol our streets, right? For more officers to harass our community members, uh, you know, to pepper spray people for participating in democracy, right? Senior services, a twenty five percent cut in this new budget. The amount we're increasing the police budget by would cover that amount twice and then some. Veteran services cut by sixty thousand dollars. Right, without the property tax override that was delayed because of coronavirus, uh, Superintendent Provost said in uh, February that the district is going to be short almost uh, $600,000. Uh, so why is that like desperately needed money going to the police? Are we okay with the cuts to our schools and to our teachers that's gonna need to happen because this money is being spent on the police? Right? This money should, be give, should, should not be given to the police to buy more military equipment. This money should be given to our schools. 38% of Northampton renters spend more than half of their income on, to, to pay rent. Why isn't this money being spent on affordable housing? Uh, how many masks could this money buy, right? How much hand sanitizer could this money buy? This money should be used where it actually matters, right? We need to demilitarize the police. We need to give the community oversight and democratic control over the police. We need to cut the police budget, just like Los Angeles has just done, just like plenty of other cities are about to do. We need to put this money where it's actually going to help people, like working people. We are hurting because of coronavirus, right? All of us are hurting, and this is only going to hurt us more. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Esther White. Hi, um, thank you for holding this meeting. Um, my name is Esther White. I live in Northampton in Ward 1. And I have two young children, one who will be entering kindergarten in the fall, and my children's grandparents also live in Northampton. I'm telling you this just to make it clear how invested my family is in this city and how much I care about it. Um, we need to make changes and urgently. We need to do more than acknowledge other people's suffering. A moment of silence or a resolution is meaningless without action. And the city budget is a reflection of our priorities. I demand that you begin to address institutional racism from the council 
and the global pandemic by rejecting the proposed budget. I understand the financial strain that the city is under, but responding to a revenue shortfall in the face of this pandemic by cutting senior services and veteran services is unconscionable. Even if we cannot reopen the senior center, there's so much that we can do for our city's most vulnerable population. I wanna take a minute to describe a few of the ways that one small city department and an all volunteer board has found creative solutions to serve our community. Um, as a board member of the Northampton Arts Council, I watched the arts and culture department rapidly pivot from developing cultural programming to offering mutual aid to our constituents. Before the shutdown, we were planning for a spring grant round that would have funded arts and culture projects across the city. Um, the council quickly pivoted to develop an emergency fund for local artists facing loss of income and has since raised and distributed $40,000 to 120 artists. I'm really proud of the com committee's, the Northampton Arts Council's response to our community's needs. The board also leveraged our resources to fundraise for purchase and distribute PEPE almost immediately. Um, our city has never seen anything like this before and we have to respond accordingly with creative solutions. Um, so city councilors, a budget that slashes human services funding while granting the police an increase shows a lack of compassion and a failure of imagination. I think we can all agree that a new car would be nice, but the police can manage with what they've got. And now is the time to reevaluate the position that we give to the police in our community. The officers are not equipped to address public health or social problems, and nor should they be called upon to do so. We need to invest more and in new ways in human services to address racial and class disparities in our community. We need to stop relying on the police to address mental health crises, opioid addiction, smoking cessation, social distancing, and homelessness. It's imperative that we come up with solutions that actually work and that don't involve an officer armed or otherwise. I implore you to make a commitment to address racism with more than a moment of silence, reject the proposed budget and prioritize social services, education and public health. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Megan Cantarella. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Cool. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Megan Cantarella. Um, I live in East Hampton, uh, but I lived in Northampton for four years previously. Um, and I also work in Northampton. Um, and I'm here because I want to demand the Northampton Police Department be defunded um, and be defunded substantially. And for those funds to be allocated to social services. Um, I think ironically, some of the best points for defending this department were made uh, last night inadvertently by Chief Casper, um, last night and on some other occasions. Uh, last night at the hearing, she admitted that crime is most often a result of poverty and desperation, then turned around and used that to justify siphoning the city's resources towards more policing during a pandemic and economic crisis. Uh, but as many people have already mentioned uh, tonight and last night, police don't help communities, um, especially our most vulnerable, um, that being Black, Latino, um, and homeless people. Um, Chief Casper claimed she would love to see more social workers involved in crisis calls and then said that this would be expensive, uh, which sounds to me like holding hostage our idea of safety uh, to spend even more money on the police. Um, with the money, when the money that we would save by taking back those resources from the overfunded police department, you could better fund social services. Many people mentioned Tapestry, which is an awesome organization. Um, and also help keep police away from these situations where they would likely do more harm than good. Um, in 2018, during a hearing in which Chief Casper defended the department's need for $75,000 allocated to the appropriation of unspecified military tactical gear and training, Casper said herself that if any of her officers were asked to lessen their carrying of firearms, she wouldn't have any officers anymore. These are the people we're discussing giving raises to. She said it herself, not one officer would stay if, if their job was to help the community without the threat of force. In Minneapolis, uh, city councilors have suggested the idea of disbanding their police department altogether. LA, like many people have mentioned earlier, um, is cutting their police budget after a huge public outcry. 
the fact that our police chief was on here asking for more money just days after one of her officers maced a minor is disturbing. And her claiming to condemn, condemn the murders of George Floyd while doing so is incredibly disrespectful. Um, I think it's not enough to reject this latest proposal of nearly 200,000 more dollars. Um, and it's not even enough to reverse the um, expansion of, of almost a million dollars from last year for the police department. We need to seriously defund this department. People have suggested slashing it by at least half and cutting our, like, cutting um, the amount of officers we have by at least half. Um, we need to make serious efforts to defund, disarm, and decrease the amount of officers in Northampton. That's the Everybody. time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rowan. Again, I'm going to ask people if you spoke previously, if you sent us an email, please give other people space to speak. Um, Rowan. Hello. Rowan Lupton, she, her, Ward 6. Um, the macing of a 15 year old on Monday is just the latest incident proving that there's no place for police in our community nor our society at large. Blocking an increase in funding and putting out some nice words are nowhere near enough. I call on Northampton to immediately abolish the Northampton Police Department and sever all ties with state and national policing outfits. Minneapolis counselors are working on this, we can too. If you're confused about what this could look like, or if you're per presently in a position of political power, the book The End of Policing is currently available as a free ebook from Verso Books. No justice, no peace. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Ben Rivell. Uh, hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Ben Rivell. I'm a resident of Ward 7. Um, in recent days, there has been much discussion of privilege and the responsibility of those with privilege to use it to the benefit of those without. Northampton is a privileged community. We are not just privileged economically, but privileged by the fact that we have a city council and a mayor who are willing to give the people a voice on the issue of policing and seem to be committed to finding the most beneficial solutions. Because of this privilege, we have a responsibility to act. Northampton should be pushing the envelope in terms of alternative methods to ensure public safety and well-being, rather than doing the bare minimum to remain in compliance with national standards. I was unable to attend the full hearing yesterday, but of the parts I did hear, one of the things that stood out to me was Chief Casper's characterization of police attempts at having a dialogue with the community. Casper tried to shift responsibility for a lack of productive dialogue to residents rather than police. Instead of pointing fingers, I think it's more informative to take a step back and consider that the fact that dialogue is impossible, even in such a progressive community, indicates that there is a divide between police and civilians that cannot be bridged. It is a divide formed by the inherent and involuntary power hierarchy created by an armed police force. Implicit bias trainings and community engagement efforts are half-hearted attempts to paint over this hierarchy. Considering Chief Casper cannot provide any evidence that these efforts have been beneficial other than anecdotal reports, they are nothing more than aesthetic changes that hold no benefit for Northampton residents. Our tax dollars flow to the other side of this divide to the tune of $7 million a year, and yet they are not returned to us in a meaningfully beneficial way. As a result, like the many people who have spoken before me, I request that the city council and the mayor drastically reduce police funding and replace the vast majority of police responsibilities with more safe and effective methods. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Paul Waterman. Hold up. Let's try that again. Hello? Yes. Good. So, thanks very much for doing this. I think that. Uh, uh, this is a great opportunity for people to voice their opinion, but I'm a little confused about why we're going after the police department <laughs> um, when there are other areas, I think, in the city budget that deserve to be looked at in terms of defining wastes. And I realize that going after the police department is probably politically correct, but I think to compare the Northampton Police Department with the awful situation that happened in Minneapolis is a little bit unfair to uh, the Northampton police. So I am in favor of um, increasing funding for social services and education, but I think that, that there are other areas in the budget to look at other than the police department. I think that our police department performs a, a fine job in protecting the citizens of Northampton. And I know I'm, again, a minority in this opinion, at least in this forum, 
But I think that if we're really concerned about funding other social areas, that there are other areas in the budget that we should be looking at and not just the police department. Again, it's politically correct right now to look at the police department for because of everything that has happened. But if our real purpose is to uh, look at funding the Cedar citizens uh, and other, again, social areas, then I think we're looking in the wrong area. Thank you for your time. Keep up the good work. I'd like to thank my city councilor, John Thorpe. I'm a resident of Ward 4. John keeps us informed of everything that's going on. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Sadie Elizabeth. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, hi, my name is Sadie Sherberg and I'm a resident in Ward 3 and I've lived in Northampton since 2018. I urge you to deny the budget request from the police department. I want to bring up something that I noticed during yesterday's budget hearing. During the period of questions uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, during the period of questions from the counselors to Superintendent Provost, they questioned him about the increase in school budgets. There was more vigor in the words and questions of counselors um, about the quality of sports gear and their own children's athletic careers than questions softballed Chief Casper about her budget increase request. It's despicable and craven that you kowtow to the police chief continuously as witnessed by two council meetings I attended about further funding for riot gear for the Northampton PD in 2018. I also wanna raise a point about the outsized role of police unions and fraternal order police organizations. No other public sector union in the entire country, I feel like, and in this area has the same bargaining power influence in the same way that police unions do. This is wrong and can be changed. Although I'm not a union member currently, I'm a restaurant worker and I know the police aren't labor. Police are historically the ones, and currently the ones, that you call the crackdown on labor. And their outsized influence, you have that power. Abolish the police. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Rachel Powers. Hello. Hi. My name is Rachel Powers, and I live in uh, Ward 4. I agree with the overwhelming response that you have heard last night and continue to hear tonight, and I urge you to not only reject the proposed budget, but to defund the Northampton Police Department. Uh, further funding of the Northampton Police Department is irresponsible and dangerous. Those funds need to be re redistributed to social programs that will actually help and strengthen our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sarah Howard. You're unmuted. Oh, you're muted again, though. Sarah. Hello. Hi. Hi, sorry. I was trying to un. Happens all the time, sorry. Okay. Hi, Sarah Howard, Ward 5, Lawrence. I'm a registered nurse working in the field of addiction treatment. My patients are struggling with houselessness and a dire lack of resources. Many patients fall out of care due to lack of the most basic resources, such as a bed to sleep in at night, a phone, or access to transportation. Many of my patients also fall out of care when they go to jail as a result of activities they end up engaging in in order to survive. I am privileged to get to know my patients' stories well, and I can assure you these are good people facing impossible situations. As teachers, healthcare workers, and social workers already understand, in order to address difficult behaviors, we need to find out where the needs are not being met and meet them. A police presence simply does not put roofs over heads. As many people have already expressed in beautifully eloquent and impassioned statements, an armed police force is not appropriately matched to the task of performing the social work type outreach that is often needed. A uniformed officer carrying a gun, no matter how well-meaning or well-trained, is simply not the worker needed in many of the situations that are currently handled by the police. I am a parent of two children in the Northampton public schools, and the presence of a police officer in the schools does not make me feel safer. Instead, it sends the message that we expect violence from our children, 
and we will meet it with more violence. As far as I'm concerned, the police presence in the schools tells the children that we believe we have already failed them. This is no, in no way a critique of the personal character of individual officers. It is just the reality of what a police presence represents. Funding increased salaries and new police cruisers while so many of our fellow community members remain unhoused is simply not reasonable. In the COVID pandemic, we can only expect more houselessness and unemployment for the foreseeable future. And the budget should prioritize a plan for addressing those increased needs over an increase in the police department budget. Council members, please reject the budget increase for the police department this year. Mayor Narkowitz, please reallocate the funds toward housing, social services, schools, and toward meeting the basic needs of the most vulnerable among us. Going forward, I recommend forming a special commission to study a shift in practices towards scaling back the police force and addressing these issues holistically. Thank you for your work on behalf of our community. Thank you. Next is Ethan Tupelo. Yes, hi. Um, Ethan Tupelo, Northampton Ward 1. Um, I'm also a member of the Pedal People Cooperative, um, and I'd like to speak on the public works budget, which in a roundabout way is also about police. Uh, I also want to make it clear I'm commenting as an individual worker who's a member owner of Pedal People, and I'm not speaking for the organization as a whole. Um, I appreciate that several council members try to ask questions about the concerns we raised in our letter to you about the DPW budget yesterday. Um, however, I don't believe you received complete responses from the mayor or the DPW director. Um, I'm going to try to be specific. Um, if you look at the line items for the proposed solid waste enterprise budget, this is page 99 of the PDF. Um, you'll see that the line item for security services is $120,000. If you look at the same line for last year's budget, it was $10,000. Now, I'm not an expert on reading budgets, so I'm open to being told if my interpretation is incorrect. But this increase is not about police officers directing traffic on Saturdays on Locust Street. Um, if you haven't been to the transfer station recently, since the COVID situation started, there's now a five vehicle limit for the use of the transfer station at a time. And vehicles need to wait in three lanes um, until a space opens for them. It appears there's always a police officer stationed there at the transfer station whose main function seems to be to choose which vehicles move forward next. From my own experience, the peak wait times can be up to 20 minutes. I want the council to question if this function really needs to be filled by a police officer, especially at this expense. Now, I, I think we're all pretty reasonable people here in Northampton overall. We understand social distancing, and would accept anyone filling this particular role if it's needed. You know, just give someone a DPW, best um, and uh, the police can be called maybe in extreme circumstances if needed. And while it was mentioned that we do have an additional $100,000 in recycling costs, which is a real situation largely out of our control, um, note that this additional security detail is budgeted for an extra $110,000 compared to last year. That is greater than the increased recycling costs, greater than the line item for the gatekeepers, the regular transfer station workers. In short, prices are being raised and city services cut back be more because of this police detail than for other increased costs like recycling. We have a massive transfer going from our solid waste budget basically to pay for police. I urge the council to question the use of police as a default solution to the situation and any other similar situations in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mark Cody. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so my name is Mark Cody. Uh, I am a resident of Ward 1. Um, and I thank the council for their time for this hearing. I, like uh, many others here today, have, got, have gone uh, to protests uh, against the killing of black people by police. Um, we are not anti-police, we are anti-racist. 
And I believe that racism isn't just a belief by individuals, it's a system. Um, as a lifelong resident of Northampton, a community organizer and a concerned citizen, I urge uh, the council to vote against the mayor's budget proposal for fiscal year 2021 as currently written. While I find much good in the budget, uh, I have serious concerns as well. This is in regards to the proposed budget increases for the police department of nearly $200,000. Uh, while many other important departments face significant budget cuts. Uh, I have spoken with many residents who are pushing to significantly cut the budget of the NPD. Uh, I imagine MPD will strongly disagree with that approach. Regardless, I think in the middle of a pandemic caused budget crisis, it would be at the very least be unwise to approve any further budget increases for the MPD, while around 20 city employees lose their jobs. Uh, even the mayor has said that crime continues to climb downwards. It is essential more money is allocated to public community services, relying on law enforcement to lead our city's efforts on the pandemic response and dangers both them and us. We need to think about what other departments are equipped to best prepare our residents to get through this disaster safely. Uh, due to unforeseen circumstances of COVID-19, I think that we should consider delaying the contractual salary increases for MPD officers. Also the acquisition of new hybrid patrol vehicles, while a noble goal should wait as it is both expensive and unnecessary right now. We have future opportunities for both when the pandemic is behind us. Uh, well, the senior center is currently shut down and may not need its full operating budget, there are some programs seniors rely on that must continue. It is vital there be funding to restart its affiliated transportation van. This is so seniors will have access to booking rides for essential medical appointments, grocery stores, and pharmacies that otherwise they would be put at additional risk of further health issues. Uh, I also, the Office of Veteran Services is being expected to continue to fully operate while absorbing a significant cut to its already small budget. The primary mission of the Veteran Services Department is to assist veterans with receiving the benefits due to them and to provide food and housing, medical and uh, employment assistance Mark, as necessary. Mark, the time, that's the time, it's up. Can you okay. finish your sentence? Sure thing. We need our budget to reflect the values of our great city. If we put community services such as health, transportation, housing, and food assistance behind security, will our community be truly safe? While they provide an important role in the community, we cannot afford a major budget Thank you. increase. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh Phone number ending in nine six seven eight. Good evening, counselors and others. Thank you for taking my call. I want to ditto for the not raising the police budget and seriously considering um, cutting it. I'll leave that for others to talk about more. Um, my name is Brett Constantine. I am. Uh, I live on Willow Street in Ward 5. I'm a resident for more than a decade. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a member of the pedestrian and bicycle subcommittee. And like Ethan before me, I am a worker owner of Pedal People, but I'm only speaking on my own behalf. Um, you've heard earlier how there's a current system where only five vehicles at a time are limited, uh, are, you, are allowed to dump their recyclables and trash and compost and wastes. Um, and the others must wait while they, uh, while those five must wait their turn, up to 20 minutes. And in the summer, the cars will be idling. Most cars are idling um, anyway, and um, that poses many health concerns for waiting in line. Heat exhaustion for one, or if this lasts long enough, cold in the winter. The fumes, and I believe COVID is hard on folks who have lung conditions. But I wonder if we can connect the dots to why um, fumes from cars is um, definitely a uh, carcinogenic um, effect. Uh, there was a no idling sign at the DPW Transfer Center, but that seems to have been removed. Um, and the director doesn't 
recall anything about it. Um, I think it's a very car centric system at the moment and it's a big outside area. It may be small as a transfer center. We may wish it were bigger, but it's still a big outside area. And I think we can start allowing more, a few more vehicles at a time. I see hundred percent of people wearing masks and I see a hundred percent of people giving each other distance. If we need to shrink the number later, we can do that. And as Ethan mentioned, the police are being used simply to direct traffic. And I think that money could be better spent by um, leaving another day open. Instead, the proposal is to cut another day. Um, we've already eliminated a day um, immediately for COVID. And the proposal is to cut yet another day from the transfer center's hours, which I'm worried will be a slippery slope and um, lead to a degradation of the product and more people will uh, take their business elsewhere. All of you who are listening who use the transfer centers in town, um, this is a public resource and please use it. Please buy your permits. Please buy your blue bags. Please use this resource while we have it or else we may not have it. Um, I'm worried that closing more transfer center days would um, in, in, in the long run be very bad for um, the transfer center and the resource that we have. Thank you. That is the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura, can you check the chat for me? Sure. Thank you. Um, okay. Next, we have Selena Della Croce. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so my name is Selena Della Croce. I live in Ward Five in uh, Alex Jarrett's ward. I'm the coordinator of a research institute locally, the Tricon uh, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. And I um, just a few things, it's impossible to fit everything into three minutes, but I'm against increasing funding for the police. I think instead it needs to be cut. Um, for beginners, if we cut the police budget in half, for example, we'd lay off 36 and lay off 36 officers, we'd free up $3.5 million. And I wanna just lay out what if we're talking about concern for public safety, what that kind of what that money could be used for, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Other people have referenced this before, but to be more specific, it's if we're really concerned with public safety, we should be producing testing kits, which are, which are not available even to first responders, which I've experienced personally. Um, we could be providing housing to people who don't have homes and can't possibly practice sanitary conditions, who can't wash their hands, who can't isolate because they have nowhere to go. We could be providing food to people, considering that massive unemployment has left a lot of people food insecure. Um, there's the International Labor Organization projects there to be 3.4 trillion people um, who've lost their jobs globally. Just in the US, two point, uh, 1.8 million people in the US filed for unemployment last week, 2.1 million people filed the week before in one week. So that tally is, adds to the tally of 42.5 million unemployed people filing for unemployment just in 11 weeks. And so if we wanna talk about public health, if we wanna talk about taking care of the community and enacting the values that Northampton says that it has, that could look like actually taking care of each other in the midst of a pandemic. So to be more specific also, the amount of money that we're spending on one riot gear load could buy 55 frontline care workers full PPE. A helmet costs $170, um, while a face shield for a frontline medical worker costs $2.70. And so I think we need to think about how we're prioritizing our um, our resources, not even to mention many other people have already talked about the gross um, brutality and violations of the police across the country. And it's Northampton isn't an exception. The first day that I moved to Northampton, I watched a Northampton police drag a homeless man down the street on his back in the ice right along Market Street where I work. So Northampton isn't an exception to that. Um, and I think we need to be um, to not just be rejecting this funding, but to be cutting our police measures. People have already mentioned Minneapolis has done something very similar. And to I think this proposal is really um, 
blind to, to the economic reality that most people are suffering and we need to keep in mind where we're putting our resources. So I'll end there. Um, and I'm again, I'm against um, against the budget increase and um, think that the budget should be cut in half. Thank you. Next is Isadora Germain. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Isadora Germain. I um, use they, them pronouns. I live in Amherst and work in Northampton. I believe it would be extremely irresponsible to raise the NPD budget during this crisis. They have done nothing to keep the public safe. Black and brown people in our community do not feel safe in our town. And as a town that calls itself progressive, we should be ashamed of ourselves. I echo what people have said yesterday and today defund the Northampton Police Department and put the money to human services that will actually benefit the community. Black Lives Matter and I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Margot Shockett Green. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Margot Shockett Green. I'm a resident of Northampton in Ward 2. I graduated from Northampton High School last year, and I was the chair and co-chair of the Mayor's Youth Commission for two years. I want to thank the city councilors for making sure to listen to each and every one of the public testimonies and for providing this space for discourse on very difficult issues. I've worked with some of you closely and know that you are doing your best to involve the voices of this community, so I thank you. I have lived in this city for my entire life and know how much our community ad identifies as one that seeks to be a leader in social justice and progressive change. Fighting for equity and justice has always been what the citizens of Northampton have prioritized and voiced with our votes and our demonstrations. Now we must prioritize intersectional issues. We wanna make our voices heard on the subject of police brutality and systemic oppression that plagues our community. It must be acknowledged that our community is not immune to the institutionalized racism which occurs within our police force and affects black citizens disproportionately and violently. We are not outliers amongst the rest of the state or the rest of the country. The citizens of color in our city have felt the impact of racial profiling and unjust violence just as any other community has. I ask that you consider the wishes of the community and think of the change that can stem from these, these budget meetings, even if the decisions made tonight may not impact the future of the city or the police department. The city council can start by taking action to research and propose progressive ordinances, which will have a great impact on our city. Alternative methods to policing have been suggested by citizens, and I ask that you consider these in order to build a safer system, which will benefit all members of this community. This movement will not end, and I am asking that you all be a part of it. I ask that you consider the personal experiences and research that people have brought to you in these past meetings and pair it with your own investigation. We have the opportunity to be a leader in the movement against racism and brutality for other communities, and I hope that you act according, according to the beliefs that we hope to uphold as the city of Northampton to fight against racism and violence. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Katie Leinert. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Katie Leinert and I'm a Florence resident and Northampton High School 2019 graduate. I want to strongly urge my city councilor members and citizens to separate their personal positive experiences with the North Northampton Police Department from their decision on the budget expansion. I recognize my white privilege and understand that my positive experience of experiences I've had with the police department does not make them a good cop. As the saying goes, bad apples come from a rotten tree. You've heard countless voices on why po policing is systematically racist and I encourage you to continue to educate yourself on these issues outside this meeting. It is important to acknowledge these clear incidents of police brutality against minorities in our community and give them every penny of compensation that they deserve. We cannot sweep these incidences under the rug to preserve the heroic reputation. Hundreds of citizens have sat through the seven hour meeting last night sharing their personal or witnessed experiences with police brutality. And I would, it would be a slap in the face to our community if you vote yes on the Northampton police budget expansion. 
after the overwhelming outcry of rejection. Rejecting this offer will not be enough, but it can be the first step. I beg you to open your eyes, ears, and mind. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Oriana R. You're on, oh, you're muted again. Let's try it again. Hello? Hi. Yes, you're unmuted now. Okay. Hi, my name is Oriana Riley. I live in Northampton in Ward 3. Um, I would pretty much like to echo all of the, the things people have said in support of defunding the police and specifically um, cutting the staff number of police officers by half and the budget by half. And I also recognize that the city council, it's um, the only thing you can actually do tonight is reject or approve the budget. And I think the meeting of, of yesterday and today has really shown that the solutions to the alternatives that people are discussing actually gets to a greater issue, which is how the budget is decided. Um, clearly the mayor has almost full control over the budget and is very um, heavily influenced by the police union. And the new piece of information I would like to add and plant as a seed for coming up with these solutions in the future is something called participatory budgeting, which has been used in many cities around the country um, and often leads to reductions in police budgets because it gives control to community members to decide what the budget is in a much more democratic and representative way um, and gives control to the people most affected by these decisions. So uh, cut the budget in half and look into participatory budgeting to make the vision that people have demonstrated a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sailor. Hi, my name is Sailor Chiquetti. I'm a resident of Ward 1 in Northampton. Um, I would like to re reiterate the horror that several other people have expressed that we currently have a police force that is willing to pepper spray a 15 year old child for protesting, but unwilling to give up military grade armaments. Um, it's also important that to note that in policing the police budget in light of the deaths of George Floyd and several other black community members across the country is not only tone deaf, but it's also a slap in the face to citizens of our own city of color who have been irreparably, irreparably harmed by police brutality. I would like to take a moment to point to Minneapolis, where the city council have not only vowed to um, defund the police, but they're looking at disbanding the police altogether. Um, and mentioned that social workers are consistently more effective at ending violent situations and um, disbanding crime. I would like to suggest that we improve our social programs for our most community pro members and increase fundings to emergency medical services because that would make our community safer. Um, our, the communities across the country with the least amount of crime and violence are not communities with more policing, rather they are communities with more access to social and economic resources. That's why I'm here tonight to call to not only defund but disband our city police entirely. I also call our city council members and our mayor to listen to what has been said by the majority of the community today and to make their final decisions based upon empathy, especially for the marginalized voices who have spoken up. If you find yourself unable to do so, then you must make the conscious decision to step down immediately. Black Lives Matter and white silence is violence. I yield my time. Thank you. Next, uh, it just says SS. Can you, can you hear me? Yep, you're unmuted. Fantastic. My name is Sylvia Simmons. I'm a resident of Northampton. I have been for the past five years. Um, I'm in agreement with a majority of the folks who have spoken on this matter of defunding the police. Um, during this time of uncertainty, to me personally, and probably for many others, the Northampton Police Department's presence in the town only adds to the stress I'm already feeling in the midst of this pandemic. Um, not only do they follow, harass, and generally disturb the communities of color in Northampton, but the visiting people of color as well, they escalate situations they should not be in charge of responding to in the first place. Um, in my five years of living in Northampton, I've witnessed and received testimony about police harassing teens and young adults of color at various bus stops around town, 
um, not announcing themselves as they come to residence doors and pound and pound for minutes to however long it takes for residents to open the door to these unknown people as they do not announce themselves. This has happened at my own apartment twice in the past year. Um, I have also interacted with police coming to the wrong residence and proceeding to question me anyway, um, or needing to be pointed in the direction of the correct residence, um, which goes to show that we really do need people. If the if if we need the police, which we don't, they have to be residents of this town. Um, and just last year, I was approached for questioning while I was sitting in my driveway in my car. Um, I was asked where I live, who I live with, the names of the people I live with, and information on my neighbors before I was told about the incident I was being questioned for. Um, I had no information. I said I had no information. I'd never heard of this person. Um, I went back to my business. The cop went to their cruiser, came back with more information I didn't ask for, and opened my car door to give it to me without asking for permission. I gave no permission. It was purely of their own volition. Um, I believe that there are so many other things this town could be doing with all the money that is going to the police department. Um, I would like to see that budget cut in half over the next few years. And I don't know what else to say. I'm pretty sure, I hope you guys are getting this message at this point. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next is Shelby. Hello. Hi. Hey, my name's Donovan Lee. Uh, I live in East Hampton. I used to live in Northampton for a while back there. And I would just like to stand in solidarity with the movement to significantly decrease the police budget. As an experienced CMT, I've worked closely with police on scene of mental health crisis before. I've always worried on my way to these calls that the officers on scene, who are there purely for the physical safety of EMS and the patient, would have no real concern for that safety. I've been asked many times by police to approach people reported to be violent, armed, or both first. Or even worse, arrive to find police on scene yelling in the faces of mental health patients. In opposition to that, I have arrived on scenes with mobile uh, counselors to find them calmly speaking with patients and trying to get them true meaningful help. We the people do not ask or request defunding the police in favor, favor of social services. We demand it and we will not be denied, suppressed, or overruled by word or force. Power in the hands of the people. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is John Liebman. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm John Liebman. I've been a resident of Northampton for 22 years. Um, we've heard from a large number of younger people over the last few days. And their voices have been very articulate and clear. I'd like to speak, however, as an older person born in the 1950s in the days when the law upheld segregation and discrimination. Over those decades, I've seen police attack and beat civil rights protesters, anti-war demonstrators, anti-nuclear demonstrators, demonstrators trying to keep open public hospitals, and on and on, up to the present moment when police are once again attacking and beating demonstrators for racial justice. Many of the younger spe speakers have expressed their deep horror and anxiety about living in such a society. They've clearly articulated an alternative vision of the future, which does not just give lip service to equality, but truly works to end racism in America. A future which is less militarized, less violent, future in which the police might act to protect the First Amendment instead of stomping on it, future in which the police do not act as the agents of those with money and property, but instead protects those who are less powerful and marginalized. We should listen to those younger voices because they're right. If we continue to do as we always have, upholding the status quo, we will continue down the path towards an increasingly ugly and dystopian future, more inequality and more violence. We've already trashed America. We've institutionalized racism and inequality. We've incarcerated an unconscionable number of people. We've impoverished our cities. We've defunded public services and now find ourselves unable to respond to the COVID pandemic, killing thousands and plunging tens of millions of people into unemployment and poverty. And we've unleashed the police powers in the state on those who simply demand a better future. We don't have to choose that. We can instead do something better, something we can be proud of rather than ashamed. The council should listen to the voices it has heard and cut the police department's budget significantly, spending that money on services that are best delivered by civilians rather than armed officers. 
We'll know in a few years if that was wise. But if we don't take that step, we will surely know that we failed. Thank you. Thank you. Next is, it says, Day. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I believe so. My name is Day Savely Hale. I'm in Ward 1B. My pronouns are they, them. I'd like to gently encourage everyone else to introduce yourself with your pronouns. So supposedly, you city council members hold the positions you do because you care about public safety and well-being. If this is actually the case, you should be enthusiastic that you're being given the opportunity to join us in working to defund and abolish the police. Chief Jody Casper said it herself yesterday. Police are given a few years of training and a lot of weapons and expected to handle everything from organizing traffic to helping a rape victim. She thinks this makes it a difficult job to do right. I say it's an impossible job to do right. There are some improvements you can make. You can try and use your guns less or hire social workers, and I'd prefer you do this than do nothing. But again and again, you will run into the fact that the problem isn't a good system that's been broken by Trump or a few bad apples, but a bad system working exactly as it's supposed to. On your own website, you discuss this. You discuss the history of Northampton policing, how it started off as the Northampton Society for Thieves and Robbers, a group that would protect property from robbers and thieves. And then when an actual police department was formed, you say their mission was to keep order, to remove suspected persons, and to protect property from loss or damage. Your job is and always has been to protect capital and capitalism, not to protect the people. But whatever decision these people make, I want my other community members to remember that we are the community. We are Northampton, not them. And whatever they do, we can and must work on different kinds of emergency response programs separate from the police and mutual aid programs. And doing this, we can make our community safer and the police will become less and less powerful. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Emily Divins. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Emily Divins. I'm a resident of Northampton Ward 1, and I use she, her pronouns. I would just like to voice my uh, support for what people have been saying about uh, defunding and demilitarizing uh, the police and diverting those funds into our social services. Uh, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Felix Willenberg. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Felix Willenberg. I use they, them pronouns. I live in Ward 2 in Northampton and I work in Florence. I'm requesting the council to not pass the budget increase for the Northampton Police Department. I have worked as a licensed nurse for seven years in multiple outpatient settings and in each of my jobs I've managed medical and mental health emergencies and sometimes both at the same time. When I call emergency services, I need help from someone who has specific training and resources to help me with what's happening. And I can't remember any time when I felt like I needed a police officer or anything that they have to offer, but they almost always show up anyway. I'd like to voice agreement with what others have said about the need for social services in the community rather than police force. Even if someone is potentially violent, I don't want police and I have never felt that they were there to protect me or my patients. I want someone to help de-escalate without force, not to come in with a gun on their belt. Since discussion last night about how Northampton Police Department serves the community was largely about emergency mental health services, I'd like to note that current best practice standards for reducing trauma and mental health care heavily emphasize reducing or eliminating the role of police in crisis intervention and replacing them with trained mental health professionals. I think of limiting funding for the police as an opportunity to begin reforming how we maintain public safety and establishing public services that will effectively serve our community. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Matthew Grimaldi. Hi there. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Wonderful. I spoke yesterday, so I'll keep this short. Thank you. Um, ditto everything is saying about defunding the police. I think it would be irresponsible to do so at this time. I would also like to say that the police are a fixture in society that disproportionately harm and attack people of color, specifically black people in this community. It is unconsciousable for you to give that community more money when they hurt another community. Thanks. Thank you. Next is CC Major. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you all so much for holding this forum and for listening to hours and hours of all of our testimony. 
my name is Cecilia Major. I am a Ward 3B in Northampton. I echo what the majority of attendees say here. Counselors, if you need information or ideas to explore your own creative solutions, please look at MPD 150. You can find them at MPD, M as in money, <laughs> PD150.com. This organization makes very humane arguments and may help you understand um, a way of going about defunding the police. I'd also like to share the words of a close friend of mine, a young woman of color who has worked in Northampton for four years and lived here for two. Uh, my friend would often ask, and this was years ago before any of um, you know this George Floyd uh, tragedy emerged, my friend would often ask me to stay in her car when she was driving through downtown Northampton, because as she said, the longer she had a white woman in her car, the safer she was, the less likely she was to be pulled over. This comment not only broke my heart, but broke my illusion that the systemic racism and police brutality as an institution doesn't affect us here in Northampton. It doesn't affect those of us who are white and middle class, which are the majority of the voices, both speaking and listening here tonight. But it is time that you counselors vote in a way that reflects caring for everyone in our community. And put your money where your mouth is and only approve any budget that forces the MPD to shrink and to reallocate those funds into uh, not only supporting the social services that currently exist, but to creating new communities as Councillor Mayori began suggesting yesterday. Let's be a leader in this country and thank you for my time. Thank you. Next is Robin Schuster. Hi. My name is Caleb Simone. I'm from Ward 5 in Florence. I would like to point out that the voices I've heard from folks this evening and last evening supporting the increased budget for the police have not spoken to any positive confrontational experiences. They have spoken to their conception of the police or their bureaucratic interactions, such as Wendy Foxman's testimony. That is a privileged perspective. Those interactions have nothing to do with the actual police presence in this community. I don't care if individual cops are friendly to white women. I care about the violence they enact on vulnerable and minority populations. As to what the older white man said earlier about why we're attacking the Northampton police when they are not like other police departments. Every officer from every city is a part of the same organization. Every officer in every city is complicit in every act of police brutality. I personally am not daft enough to join an organization and deny how my presence represents support for the actions committed by every chapter of that organization. If Northampton police and a few city councilors who claim to represent the interests of the community actually listen to this community and center our collective interests, you will not only veto this proposed budget, but you will take steps to defund the police immediately. Also, defunding the police is not an ahistorical idea. There are plenty of resources available, available about the long and rich history of movements and organizations working to defund police. Those reducing the current effort to political correctness should do their research. My city councilors, this community is watching you and we're going to hold you accountable and we will not stand by if you continue to fail us. I yield. Thank you. Next is Patty O'Neill. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Patty O'Neill. I live in Ward 5. I go by she, her. I just want to echo what everybody, um, many people have been saying about um, rejecting the proposal to increase the budget for the police and uh, would be in favor of defunding the police and instead supporting more social services and more creative, more compassionate ways of dealing with um, many of the problems that we're facing today. Um, that's basically it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Next is Dana. Dana, you spoke earlier um, at public comment. You also spoke yesterday. I've asked people to give others space. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, but unless there is something that is new, um, I would really like that you let other people give um, their thoughts to us uh, since this would be the third time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I put my name on in part because I wasn't sure if I'd be here, but I don't know if Jamila is on again, but I know she got cut off last time and I want to make sure there was space for her. And 
if not, if there's someone else who's a person of color that wants to speak about their uh, experiences with the Northampton Police Department, I think those are really important voices to center. So I'd like to just propose that you go off cue and either find Jamila, because she got cut off last time, or uh, Jamila Gore, if she's on here today, or uh, find and center another voice of a person of color who wants to talk about their experiences. Thank you for that. For Thank her. you. Sure she was on. She she is on. She um, actually was able to continue her testimony yesterday. You may have been off by that point, but she um, was on with somebody else over speakerphone and uh, was able to speak fully. Great. I was off by then. Uh, I yield my time to her if she's uh, has her hand up again. But otherwise, uh, I'm happy to yield to somebody else. Okay. Everyone has such great stuff. Thank you. Next is Robbie Dunning. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. My name is Robbie Dunning. Uh, I lived in uh, Northampton for many years, uh, probably at least a decade where I lived in, um, voted there and now I live up in Greenfield, but I still work and spend a lot of time in Northampton. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. I would like to add my voice as a resounding ditto to the diversity of voices who have called for you, the council members, to reject the budget increase for the Northampton Police and to defend and to defund them further, redistributing those funds to better served areas like schools, PPE, social workers, better low income housing, and the pursuance of a citywide research to fully defund the police. To any callers unsure of why so many are calling to defund the police, I recommend you open your eyes and ears to the free education other callers provide as well as numerous news articles of late or even the recent statement by Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Lastly, if you find yourself using the phrase politically correct to cast a stain on the, those requesting the defunding of the police, I urge you to check the nearest clock and calendar because you may be trapped in an especially racist corner of the 1990s. Thank you and I yield my time. Thank you. Next is uh, Hillary Montague asked, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, my name is Hilary Montague Asp, and I am the co-chair of Glisten, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Glisten, Massachusetts, which is the local chapter of the nation's leading organization working to make K through 12 schools safer for LGBTQ students. Uh, Glisten, Massachusetts works in Northampton often, uh, including with individual ed educators, school administrators, families, lots of young people and students, uh, and several of our board members also live in Northampton. As an organization, we are here to demand that the nearly $200,000 increase uh, to the Northampton Police Department's budget is not granted, and also that the department is uh, abolished as a whole. As an organization, Glisten conducts a national school climate survey every two years. The last couple of decades of data from the national school climate survey tells us that queer and trans students of color, uh, especially black queer and trans students, experience incredibly high uh, rates of verbal harassment and physical assault at school and are at a much higher risk than their white counterparts for missing school or being forced out of school for using drugs and for experiencing sexual assault. Furthermore, we know that queer and trans students of color and black queer and trans students in particular uh, experience school discipline at a much higher rate than their white cisgender and or heterosexual peers. More specifically, 46.7% of black LGBTQ students, 44.1% uh, of Latinx LGBTQ students and 47.3% of multiracial LGBTQ students reported being disciplined at school in the last year. This is compared to 36% of white LGBTQ students. As many others have said, we know that the police do not protect or help our communities, but instead cause a great deal of harm, violence, and murder. Uh, the students I just spoke about who experience increasing, uh, increased levels of school discipline uh, often are forced out of school and often end up in our prisons and jails. As educators and many others who work in underfunded jobs can tell you, $190,000 is a lot of money that can go a long way. Residents of Northampton will benefit so much more if this $190,000 is invested into public education and other social services as opposed to the police department. Instead of providing training to the police, residents of Northampton will benefit from providing trainings and professional development to classroom teachers, social workers, et cetera, to support the overall health and well-being of black and brown young people, including LGBTQ black and brown students. While it may seem impossible to defund the police, listen, Massachusetts can promise you that it is not. Please do not 
hesitate to contact us. If we can support you or offer additional feedback in the process, please do not grant the $190,000 budget increase to the Northampton Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Carl Tong. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carl Tong. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a resident of East Hampton, and I've worked in the Northampton community. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the vast majority of the impact of this pandemic is felt by the Black community and people of color. The response should not be to use this crisis as an excuse to increase the militarization and presence of the police in our society. The idea of buying hybrids for the police station is an insulting example of the white liberalism that cares about the environmental impact, but it's historically ignored the damage done by police to our communities through the years of violence described on this call. I echo calls not only to vote against increasing the police budget, but to also defund the police and invest in community resources, housing, social workers, education that actually help our community and keep the most vulnerable of us safe. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Jackie Kosey. Hey, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Sorry, some tech difficulties. Um, okay, so before I start, um, I want to read a quick tweet um, from Wagatwe Wanjuki. She's an award-winning anti-rape activist, writer, and educator on Title IX, Abuse and Trauma, and she's a Black woman. She says, using woman of color because you're too afraid to say Black is part of white violence. You're chipping away at a tool that can help us create better anti-violent movements that actually include our needs. So I want to bring that up because many folks tonight and yesterday have used the phrase people of color when they're actually meaning to talk about black folks. I think that is incredibly important. So I'll real quick read what I've prepared. My name is Jackie Kose. I use she, they pronouns. I've lived and worked as a social worker in Ward 1 of Northampton for a little under five years and currently work and reside in New York City as a social worker for an alternative to incarceration program. So I know more than anyone how possible it is to rely on options other than police and the carceral state. First, while I would like to, while I would be incredibly surprised if the council considered social workers as an alternative to policing, I do urge folks to consider the white supremacist, savior-oriented roots embedded in so much of social work in particular as an institution, and the fact that social workers are themselves weapons of the carceral state as mandated reporters. Really think about the fact that social worker is most often an extension of policing because of the way social workers are bound to the state through licensure. Do not replace one predominantly white state sanctioned group with another. I would also echo what previous folks have said about considering transformative justice, and I would like to publicly state as a person of color who has done restorative justice work that I'm deeply disgusted by any supposed restorative or transformative work that supports policing, which has been mentioned in this call. Second and lastly, I would like you to continue to please hear that the Minneapolis Police Department is currently considering disbanding their police, which is unprecedented. It took the murder of George Floyd to push them to consider this. And I urge you not to wait for the murder of a black person by police in Northampton to take action. Because if you do choose to wait, thousands of people, I promise you, will remember this moment. Please do not be on the wrong side of history. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Jasmine Butello. Butello. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Jasmine Buentello. I am currently a resident of East Hampton, um, but I grew up in Northampton and I have many loved ones who live in Northampton and go to Northampton schools. I am here today because I do not support a budget increase to the Northampton Police Department. I do not believe that they need it. Jody Casper herself spoke on how they have no real evaluation system put in place to know if the training exercises they send their officers to even work or make an impact. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, but yet she wants to request thousands of dollars to waste on these same programs that she has no idea if they produce real results. I also would like to bring up a point that was brought up yesterday. Councillor Nash had asked her how much one cop costs. She said $60,000. I can't help but think that if they eliminated a couple of positions, they would have a lot more money in their budget to put towards things like step raises. And speaking on step raises, I would also like to point out that we are in a global pandemic. The whole world is struggling. If there was ever a time to implement implement impact bargaining, now would be the time. Um, I just would like to say, I feel that the NPD needs to make a better effort to be to not be a burden on the limited budget during a global pandemic. As I said before, the whole world is in a hard place right now. 
and the police department asking for new hybrid cars just seems incredibly inappropriate. I'm really worried for the low income children who are going to suffer and face so many new struggles, um, trying to adjust to the new school systems that they have to attend and for the teachers as well. You heard Superintendent Provost speaking on how there are at least 20 families that they were unable to help during this crisis. We cannot let our children get left behind. This will affect them for the rest of their lives. Their futures in education should be a huge priority to us. There are plenty of departments that deserve this money more. And lastly, I would like to say you wouldn't be getting an attendance level like this if it was a message to be ignored. Please do the right thing. Invest in your city and your children. We need you right now. We need you to use your power to make a positive difference in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next is um, Alisa or Alyssa Kuhn. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa Kuhn. Um, I'm from Ward 6, a resident in Northampton. Um, I would like to start with loudly agreeing and seconding everything and everyone who is calling to reject the 200,000 increase and defund the police. $200,000 is insurmountable compared to the 116 million that is being proposed for next year, but $200,000 is not pocket money, and it is insensitive and grossly inappropriate during these times. Whether or not you want to defund the NPD, you should be able to recognize this and think about all the good that money could do if actually applied to help the community. I know the council members have received all of our calls and emails, and if you still approve the increase after all of this, you have failed the people who have put you there. With that said, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, next is Joshua Strassman. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm an educator and resident in Amherst. In our teachers union, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Teachers Association, we have a saying, which is that students' learning conditions are our working conditions. This means that if a student comes into school hungry, that is our problem too. It means if a student does not have adequate housing, that's our problem too. It also means if our students are being harassed or pepper sprayed by police, that is also our issue. As an educator, I can tell you right now that families are struggling. I've heard stories of people waiting in line for hours at food banks, waiting for food to feed their families. Now is the time to defund the police and put money into ensuring everyone has adequate housing and access to food. Uh, I do wanna say there's one thing that the police chief said last night that I agree with, which is that no one knows if training works. I'm from Seattle where this week police have have tear gassed peaceful pro protesters three nights in a row. This is in a city that is under progressive leadership where police undergo rigorous training that is rooted in, in social justice even. I would like us to learn from that example, instead of putting money into training that we do not know works, put it into social services and make sure everyone is fed and housed. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Shira Breen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. My name is Shira Breen. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. I'm writing to demand that Northampton defund the police and now reading this to you. Like I assume many of you white city councilors, I was raised to believe that police keep me safe. I'm from Minneapolis and despite the countless awards that that Minneapolis, just like Northampton police have received, it didn't take too long to realize that police were killing people, which did not line up with the save the day cop propaganda I learned as a kid at birthday parties like the ones Northampton police does. Police in Northampton are police. Police in Minneapolis are police. Police at birthday parties are still police. Police kneeling are still police. Police in unions are still police whose work is descended from slave catchers. Defunding the police is not politically correct, it is human. We reject a false sense of safety from murderous hands. We reject the past proposals of Northampton police being trained on counterterrorism by who else but an apartheid state itself, Israel. 
At this moment, when our president is egging on police violence against protesters, increasing our police budget is exactly what Trump wants us to be doing. There is no middle ground. It's a question of which side of history you will be on, Trump's police state of increased police budgets or the people you claim to serve and protect. I get that hearing people say abolish the police might be scary because you might lose your job, but we can help you find another job. We will fight for that with you. Choose to defund police and you gain support from the most powerful and dedicated community that wins its fights. It's your choice. We can help you find another job, but we can't bring back people who have been killed by the police. It's time we listened to the survivors of domestic violence that the police have never believed. The people who know the cops have never been there for them and never will be. Indigenous people who have led the fight against cops ever since they showed up to steal the land that we are all sitting on now. It's time we follow the lead of the Minneapolis City Council members who are currently discussing disbanding the police, the lead of the LA Police Department that just voted to defund police by $150 million. This is not a game, this is not a joke, this is not a young, radical, naive dream. This is happening already, and Northampton, if you want to maintain your progressive image to the world, you need to catch up with the times, and at the very least reject this egregious budget increase that will only lead to more harm in our communities. Many people have said these things, and many more will say them. This speaks to the weight and the truth of our words. We will not stop talking, we will not stop overcrowding City Hall, even if it's over Zoom. People were out all night last night and they aren't going anywhere anytime soon. We'll be here as long as it takes. There are too many of us. Listen to your constituents, do your job as the democratic leaders we elected you into and defund the police budget as Lois Ahrens outlined in her plan now. Thank you. Next is Emma Coleman. Hello? Yes, hi. Hi. Hello, my name is Emma Coleman of Ward 4, and I agree with the majority of people who have spoken tonight and last night to reject the proposed budget of the NoHo PD and utilize those funds into social services, PPE, and schools. I find it interesting that the city council touts the term progressive. We are progressive in thought, but not in action. If you are truly anti-racist, you will reject the proposed budget of the no help police. Laziness is no excuse. White supremacy feeds on white silence and white complicity. Chief, uh, Chief Jody Casper has done little to show her constituents that she cares about these issues. Saying that the public, public doesn't want to engage with her and place, is placing blame on the people she supposedly protects. You'd think no hope uh, PD would want to hear our opinions. We have so many colleges, universities, highly educated people in the Valley. You'd think defunding the police would have been proposed sooner. The protest last week was met with total and utter hostility by the uh, by NoHo PD. After hours of marching, the police were in riot gear, a peaceful protest organized by high school students, a peaceful protest where a child was maced. No words were ex exchanged, just total and utter hostility. And um, you see the, the police, you, you see yourselves as representatives of the community. Birthday parades don't need armed officers. Taking care of our houseless population with force is by no measure a human, humane way to treat people. We need medical professionals, therapists, people on the ground, not people with guns um, who have unbridled power in this country. I believe these funds can be better used, better utilized. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, it is 9.46. There are eight people left remaining to speak. Um, if any of you have already spoken um, and want to give your space to someone else, um, I encourage that. Otherwise, I'm going to have to close this at some point because we have to get to the rest of our agenda. So I'm going to take the next eight people um, and then we must continue with the rest of our agenda and um, because we have items that we have to finish this evening. This is Balin Rodriguez. Hey everyone, my name is Balen. I use she, her pronouns and I live in Ward 3, Northampton. 
I'm here to reiterate that the council must reject the proposed increase in the Northampton Police budget and consider eventually defending the Northampton Police Department entirely. Where we spend money now, will decide what kind of town we live in for the years to come. Homelessness, racial discrimination, and gun violence are not inevitable crises. They are direct results from policy decisions and investing more money in the de police department is not a solution to these crises. For many of the most marginalized people in our communities, including black and brown people, immigrants and queer people, police signal less safety, not more. I hope you all reject the proposed increase and eventually defund the Northampton Police Department as that's what the majority of residents are calling for right now. I yield my time. Thank you. Zalia Maya. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Zalia Maya. I live in District 1 of Northampton. I'm here today to question the necessity of Mayor Narkowitz's proposal for a $200,000 increase in police funding. I was surprised by this proposal, considering that the mayor's budget plan for 2021 states, quote, crimes continue to trend downward in the city with 1,249 major crimes reported in 2019, compared to 1,436 in 2018 and 1,636 in 2017, end quote. If the crime rates have been steadily decreasing for the past few years, why does Northampton PD need more funding? As stated by Mayor Narkowitz via Facebook, 25% of the budget increase to the Northampton Police Department is going towards the purchase of hybrid police cars. Northampton teachers have been asking for a raise and were told that there was no money, but miraculously money appears for hybrid cars. While the Northampton school system is cramming students into classes and pulling several advanced placement math courses at the high school, you decide to discard brand new police vehicles to replace them with hybrid one? A city shows its values in the way it spends its tax money. Finally, throughout yesterday's meeting, counselors continuously praised the NPD for being progressive, but you failed to recall that a few years ago, the police department, and the chief in particular, was going to go to Israel to learn about police techniques from the IDF. This startles me. Just a short Google search for IDF police training reveals pages and pages of articles that demonstrate how the IDF training is, to put it kindly, problematic. To learn training from an organization committed to the occupation of the Palestinians suggests that the police think of itself as an occupying force. These decisions only prove Northampton's lack of regard for true public safety. safety. In a time where it is so necessary to show support for those affected by police brutality, why are we choosing to fund unnecessary expenditures like vehicle upgrades? Is it really keeping the public safe or is it just bolstering Northampton's identity as a pseudo liberal white city? I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Jake Wise. Hi, Jake Wise, he, him, his. Um, I'm gonna keep it quick since I spoke yesterday and I encourage you to take everybody who has their hands up. There are only 10 of them or 11 of them when you said there were eight. I encourage you to, to hear everybody out. Um, I just wanna add that there was a statement that a lot of time, a lot of people, this was their first city council experience in Northampton. I had one a few years ago. It was when the police wanted to install the surveillance cameras downtown. And that was also something that was gonna impact uh, people of color, black and brown people, uh, disproportionately, it was going to put, you know, undocumented people at, in disproportionate danger and disadvantage. And so I just want to say that you all did the right thing in that case. So I want to see you build on your, the, you, you, do, <laughs> you do have the ability to do the right thing. So do it. And, um, and I just, with the number of people on this, it just seems to me that once you, uh, if you don't act in a good way right now, you're probably going to have some people running against you in the next time you are running for election. Um, also, it's not a choice between uh, police and safety. I have several browser tabs open right now. You can read all about alternatives to policing. It's, uh, it's pretty well out there. And I urge you to follow in the steps of Minneapolis and Los Angeles, which are taking huge, huge steps. I mean, even where I'm from, Richmond, Virginia, they're taking the monuments, the Confederate war monuments off. Northampton has the war monuments. They're just not on pedestals, but they're there. They're in the shadows. So please take action. Thank you. Thank you. Cleo is next. Hold up. Why is it? There we go. Uh, hi. My name hi. is Cleo Vizi. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. 
Um, I just want to really echo what uh, literally every community member said last night about defunding the police um, and what I've heard a lot of people say tonight. Um, and I also just want to touch on a couple specific things that I've heard. Um, last night, Chief Casper talked about wanting more training for cops um, around mental health and addiction. And I just want to make it really clear that cops have no place in mental health care or people's uh, addiction recovery. Addiction is um, pretty criminalized in this country, especially for black and brown folks, and especially for houseless people. Um, and at best, what cops do in times of crises is section people, forcibly hospitalize them and drug them. And at worst, um, they kill people. So I would really encourage that money to go towards um, mental health services that are actually not connected to the cops. A lot of the crisis services in Northampton are directly connected to cops and will call the police on people they deem um, unsafe to themselves. Um, other than that, I just wanna like touch on um, this idea that the Northampton Police Department just needs more de-escalation training or um, more diversity hires. Um, Honestly, we can see pretty clearly that de-escalation training doesn't do anything. Um, the Minneapolis Police Department had de-escalation training and was seen as a really progressive police department. And just a couple nights ago in Atlanta, two black students were pulled over. Um, the window of their car was smashed. They were both tased and at least one of them sustained injuries. And the cops had literally just gone through de-escalation training. And um, at least two of those cops were also black officers. And I'm saying that because um, Chief Casper talked about wanting more diverse hires. And that is not gonna change the fact that the police were created to uphold slavery and white supremacy. Um, other than that, I just really want to urge the city council people tonight to um, do what they're supposed to do, do their job and actually represent the voices of their community. We've made it incredibly clear that we want to defund the police department in Northampton. Um, so do your jobs tonight um, and vote to defund it. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Natalie Faust. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Natalie Faust. I live in Ward 5. Um, yeah, I, I have lived in Northampton for eight years. Um, and during my time here, I've, I've dealt with, um, I've, I've been stalked and I went to the police for that. They did, they did nothing. And I don't, I don't even want, I've dealt with a lot with, with addiction. We talked about the opioid epidemic. And I think that the only reason I was able to get through and get sober was because I didn't have to deal with the police because I had a house because I had access to a therapist and we should be we should be doing the work to make sure that everyone has these opportunities that that is the only way to make a community safe like the the fact that i haven't had to deal with the cops the police is the only reason that i was able to get through all this i'm echoing everything that everyone said and i'm exceeding the rest of my time thank you next is the phone number ending in 2392 hi can you all hear me Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm Ryan Shavers Brown again from Ward 7B. I just wanted to call in and say that before we advocate completely defunding the Northampton Police Department, we should at least go over the expenditures and find out what Chief Casper wants the $200,000 for. Additionally, I would like to echo what other people have said about expanding our mental health care and hiring some social workers to deal with people who are not in a very good place. With that, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kaylin. Hello, um, my name is Kaylin. Um, I'm a resident of Northampton in Ward 1, and I would like to echo the words of those before me and call for the defunding of Northampton Police. Unfortunately, I wrote this testimony as if Police Chief Jody Casper were actually here, though I do not see her in the chat. So excuse me for speaking to someone in the second person singular when they aren't here. I would like to put it on public record that yesterday night, Jody Casper, and don't get me wrong, many others on the Zoom call, broke my heart from the inside out. To use the language of the generation of people working to defund and abolish people like you, 
I just think it's funny how yesterday you decided to use your time to spew cop propaganda instead of addressing how problematic Northampton police have already proved themselves to be. I cannot speak to the experiences of our Black community in Northampton. What I can speak on is my experience as a minor in crisis who would have literally done anything to receive help from a social worker rather than a police officer when they were the only ones available. As a domestic violence survivor, someone who you claim Northampton PD has helped, I would also like to put it on record that when I was 16 years old and running away from home alone in the middle of a night during domestic violence crisis and nothing but my pajamas, the first place I went to actually was not Northampton PD, but the Domino's on King Street and then the Pride gas station and then to the King Street convenience station and every other gas station and 24 hour shop on that street. And let's be honest, there's a lot of them. So why did I choose to go to random businesses instead of the police department? Because I was scared. I was vulnerable. I was in crisis, which needed help from real human beings with hearts and who cared about my well-being, something I couldn't and I'm certain I will never find at the Northampton Police Department. Eventually, I did make the most regrettable decision of my life, which was to return to the Northampton PD for help. When I say those words, I feel shame in the fact I ever thought they could bring any type of help to anyone. Further, I won't even begin to detail how they only worsened my trauma. Because I ask for you, Jody Casper, if you're listening, to speak with your so-called fleet and ask them and see what they have to say about the concerns I and every other community member who has spoken before me has raised. And while you're at it, maybe also look into why police language is so militarized, something you would never find in an institution which works for the well-being of the public. And to the counts and people, many of the people whose children I've attended high school with, people I've served as a cashier and waitress downtown Northampton, the people who have sworn to represent me, I ask of you now that you have record proof of a story where a Northampton minor who wished for nothing but crisis help and comfort literally chose a commercial pizza store on the side of the road over Northampton PD. What will you do with this information? I yield my time. Thank you. Um, next we have Bola O. Hi, my name is Bola O'Grady and I live in Ward 3 and use she and they pronouns. I am here to urge you to defund the police and invest in social services and especially in funding for community organizations like Tapestry for all the reasons mentioned by others. I agree with much of what's been said and I just want to remind you that if the idea of shifting funding away from the police feels daunting, remember that you don't have to figure this out all by yourselves. Look at this turnout. There are lots of people in this community who've already shared so many ideas and information and will keep sharing it. You don't have to have all the answers right now to start moving in the right direction. There are organizations all over the country and all over the world working on this. There's books and data on all these issues and there's evidence-based research about how to divest from militarized police forces. And all of that research shows that the kinds of reforms and training mentioned last night do not lead to increased community safety. You've mentioned wanting to fight racism and so I urge you also to center the voices of people most directly affected. You need to listen to people of color and specifically black people who are giving clear demands about changes that need to be enacted. I know some people are saying that the police make them feel safe and protected, but a lot of other people are saying that the police make us feel less safe. If you're one of the people who feel safe most of the time, one of the people who feel that the police protect you and your interests, you really need to listen to what other people are saying. As people have already mentioned, the US police force originated as patrols against enslaved people. They've always existed to protect the existing social order and the existing social order has always been extremely inequitable. I urge you to shift the funding towards supporting community members needs rather than criminalizing them. You can take a step toward making this happen by denying this budget increase and we are watching. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Fran. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Fran. Hi, uh, so my name is Casey Flaherty. I live in East Hampton and I work locally in Northampton. Um, so basically I feel that police it basically used to be about, you know, to protect and serve. And now these days it's basically about trying so hard to catch good people doing something wrong. And I just don't get why that is. So I basically had a few incidences myself over the past few years. Um, in 2016, I was wrong, wrongfully arrested by a cop that was trying to make his quota for the night. And I had to go to trial to prove my innocence and get justice. And a jury had to decide my fate. And there was no evidence. The officer sat on stands agreeing that he had no reason to pull me over or arrest me that night. And that's after paying over seven grand and losing years of my life to a fight. 
And I've had many incidents after that where my family has been involved. My father was attacked by a drunk man that got out of the car in a rage when my dad kindly asked him to move out of the driveway. And the police showed up and didn't arrest the man for being under the influence or for attacking my father. And it's because he was friends with the cops. So he just got to go. And incidences like this happen all over, all the time. And we just, you know, people just let these people be in charge of us on a day-to-day basis. I just, I don't get it. Like, I don't feel safe from cops. When I was growing up in, in middle school, I never felt safe when cops would come in. And I know there was a nurse that just talk about, talked about that with, you know, their children at school with them and when they would run into cops and they didn't feel that way either when they saw them. And it's never been that case in the towns nearby, East Hampton, North Hampton, Greenfield. There's been also so many bad cases that are just like what's going on all over. And yeah, we just, we can't let let this budget get increased. We can't let it pass. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Susan Edelstein. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I can't, I have this, Never mind. I will start. Um, I was not even intending to um, testify. I was just intending to listen, but I want to make sure that my voice is heard as well. The primary goal of my speaking is to echo what everyone else has said, which is to reject the proposed budget. And as others have eloquently stated, Police budget should not be increased, but rather either defunded or cut drastically. I understand that defunding is not going to happen in this budget, but we should work towards that as a potential. Um, in, in addition, that the police should be demilit- demilitarized. I do want to talk also about what other people have said about all the needs that the city has, all the funding needs, COVID related needs for PPE and testing, social services needs such as mental health, senior services, veteran services, food assistance, housing, education, increase in public transportation, which disproportionately affects low income people and people of color, black and brown people. Finally, I do want to say that I think the city should start thinking outside of the box for solutions. One thing that just in this meeting that occurred to me is that in addition to housing development for subsidized housing, that the city look into, is there a possibility for the city to have a subsidy program such as federal section eight or the Massachusetts rental voucher program? Could Northampton have its own Northampton rental voucher program? And that's just one thing that I thought of. I'm sure there are other other ways to think outside of the box, other ways to look towards other members of the community for ideas to think outside of the box. So in sum, for right now, reject the proposed budget, go back to the drawing board to reduce, um, not only not increase the police budget, but to reduce it as well. I yield my time. Before you mute, I need you to please state your name and your city of town. I'm sorry. Um, I was all prepared to do that. Um, My name is Susan Edelstein. I am in Ward 4, and um, I use the pronoun she, her. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Charlotte Coleman. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Charlotte Coleman, and I live in Ward Uh, Ward 3 of Northampton. Like many of my constituents, I reject the budget increase of nearly $200,000 in police department spending and urge to defund the police. Not only would increasing contractual salaries, training, and hybrid cars squander the memory of Black lives who have been killed from police brutality, but also it would ignore Northampton's most vulnerable residents. Rubber bullets, batons, and tear gas may be categorized as less than lethal ammunitions, but they are still hostile. They cause irreversible harm. They fracture skulls. They blind. They cause brain damage. Last week, the high school students who organized a protest and the hundreds who joined were marching in peace, but when they wanted to converse with officers, the police emotionally belittled them and caused unnecessary tension. They stood in a blockade of silence, holding shields and tear gas children. Police Chief Casper, if you pride yourself on working with the community, why did you not speak to protesters that day? 
Police departments across America are in charge of way too much. They are not healthcare workers nor social workers, yet they are taking on social issues related to addiction, substance abuse, mental illness, basic emergency medical care, houselessness, etc. We need law enforcement alternatives that reconnect people to social networks. Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis City Council members are currently looking to dismantle their police department and replace it with a new model for public safety. Northampton can think about doing the same efforts. This city has the privilege to be a leader in this country and take risks and experiment, which can in turn radicalize the ways we protect people and help abolish a violent system that has existed since slavery. Police Chief Casper once said in a 2018 Gazette article commenting on the Northampton opioid crisis that quote, arresting people as I've been doing for 20 years doesn't work. That's the lesson we've learned, end quote. Police are not the solution. They are, there is no perfect solution, but as Casper mentioned, arresting people does not work. Let's dismantle and defund the police, reallocate their budget to actually help the people, invest these funds in support of grassroots social service organizations. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Mimi, you're going to understand that I'm going to skip over you because you spoke yesterday. You also spoke today on this issue. There are three more people that we are going to um, get to. They are the last three people on the list. And then, uh, and then I'm going to ask for a motion from the council to close the hearing so that we can get on with the rest of the agenda. Um, Adele Fantasia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Adele Fantasia. Um, I live in Ward 5, and I grew up here and have gone to the JFK Middle School and Northampton High School, and I live here again now. Um, I think there was probably a lot of discussion already about the cop who said the hamburger comment. I just wasn't sure and I wanted to let you guys know that there is a video circulating on Twitter. My best friend said um, the algorithm came up with it for her. She didn't search it and there are 977,000 views and there are, excuse me, let me see. Um, 30,000 likes and 10,000 retweets. So I feel like that is not good in terms of optics for Northampton, especially since we think we're awfully productive in um, the sense that I've gotten since I've lived here. Um, and you know, what if there was a video of the cops um, pepper spraying those 15 year olds, you know, like that is not progressive. And so I just, think you guys should know that and also um like bill dwight said yesterday the culture isn't ready to abolish the police that's for sure but um this is a symbolic sentiment it's a very real symbolic sentiment and ideally the police will be abolished in the long term to do so we need to start thinking creatively about alternatives now so um like the implementation of social workers like you guys said yesterday and then non-punitive approaches to drug abuse and then in terms of not um, creative alternatives, but rather necessary ones. I think in the interim, we should be talking about civilian review boards and law enforcement liability insurance. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening and thank you all um, hundreds of people who are here and have voiced their opinions. I echo much of that. Um, all right, I yield the rest of my time, thanks. Thank you. Next is uh, Carolyn Sh uh, Shreed Shred. I'm sorry, everyone with your names. I apologize. Carolyn. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Carl Shred. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a resident of Ward 4 in Northampton. I would like to echo the statements of many others in not approving the budget increase for Northampton PD rather defunding if not disbanding them and reallocating this funding to community resources especially the northampton public schools where i am a student your you our council members must listen to the desires of the public specifically our black community members and our community members of color to not grant this increase of almost two hundred thousand dollars to the annual pd policing is an inherently violent white supremacist supremacist institution 
and Northampton's liberal reputation does not exclude them from that. Black Lives Matter, and I yield my time. Thank you. And the last person is Justine Barrett Figura. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Justine Barrett Figura. I'm a resident of Northampton Ward B. I'm a small business owner in Florence. This is my very first city council meeting after living here and starting my business over five years ago. I am here to ask that you vote unanimous, unanimously against the proposed budget so that we may defund the Northampton police starting with this next year 2021 budget vote. The speech given by Chief Casper, as somebody more recently mentioned, you can find it online, during the peaceful protest on Monday, suggesting that one bad hamburger doesn't discredit all other hamburgers in comparison to the officers in Minneapolis who murdered George Floyd, that statement demonstrates just how tone deaf and out of touch the Northampton police are with not only the issues surrounding the death of George Floyd and others that have been murdered by police over the years, but specifically to their own community standing at their very doorstep asking for, at best, reform, accountability, a simple acknowledgement of police brutality, and at the very least, just asking for simple empathy for the black and brown members of this community. They have proven our worst fears are true that they would rather hold their position than speak out against their fellow law enforcers and take a knee. There are more peaceful protests organized for the coming weeks and I want to underline that they are peaceful. The organizers for the protests are spreading the word to all participants that we are here to protest our concerns and to do it peacefully. Northampton police, I urge you to be an example of humility and unity to a nation torn apart over the simple statement that black lives matter. I'm currently looking at the last three years of budget proposals most years, the budget has been increased for the Northampton police by an average of one and a half to 2% a year. However, last year's budget proposal called for and passed a significant increase of 13% more money for the police department, nearly $1 million more as many people have said. So what exactly is the $200,000 needed for over the last year's major budget increase? What did last year's budget increase not address that you needed the more money for? Someone also earlier mentioned a failure of imagination is what someone, um, I'm sorry, I'm half reading a script. A failure of imagination is what someone else said earlier with a question of what's to be done with that money. I can't agree more. If we want to know what we should be doing with that money that honors our black and brown community members, we should start with asking them. Thanks so much. This has been my first meeting and it's been really eye-opening. I yield my time. Thank you. Um, April, I am, oh. April, I'm going to unmute you. April was having trouble accessing how to uh, raise her or raise their hand. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is April Gray. I'm a resident of Northampton Ward 3. I've lived and worked in downtown Northampton for six years. And like so many others here tonight and last night, I'm here not only to oppose the increase to the police budget, but to challenge my community to imagine and build towards a world without police or prisons. Several years ago on a hot summer morning, I awoke to the sound of my housemate screaming at a man who had broken into our house in the middle of the night and then fallen asleep in their bed. My housemate was coming back from their partner's house and discovered him there along with the trail of destruction he had left on his way to their bedroom. He had broken our back window and let himself in, obviously very intoxicated. After he left the house, we pieced together that he turned out to be a man that I knew through work. We called our landlord to ask him how to go about getting the window fixed, and he insisted we call the police. Having long before made the collective decision to never call the police, but being young and without money and not sure how else to get our window fixed to once again be able to lock our door, we reluctantly obliged. When the police arrived, they split my roommates and I up and interviewed us separately. They accused me of lying about someone breaking into the house, perhaps to disguise the fact that I had had a secret party while my roommates were out, perhaps because we had drunkenly broken the window ourselves and wanted the landlord to cover the cost of the repairs. They made a lot of accusations about why it was that we had called for their assistance. Um, and I'm just thinking about all of the ways that they made the situation worse. Um, 
and ultimately um, didn't actually help us <laughs> in our in our goal. Um, and I'm thinking about the ways that they um, made us feel as though we had done something wrong in the process. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, who else could I have called um, in that situation? Um, what would it have looked like if there were no police in Northampton and, you know, we had had the opportunity to call on someone who could mediate this conflict that occurred between ourselves and someone who was our neighbor? Um, what would it have looked like if we had been able to ask someone to help us hold this person lovingly accountable for the ways that their behavior had harmed us? Um, what would it have looked like to be able to go through a process of transformative justice together to simply fix our window and not have to call the cops because that was our only recourse as young, poor, working class queer people in Northampton? Um, so I just share this anecdote with you all um, to help you imagine and implore you to imagine what kind of world might be possible if 911 was not the only emergency helpline that people reached for when they needed assistance beyond what they could provide for themselves. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, that is the time. Um, thank you to everybody. Um, uh, I think we are somewhere at maybe, correct me if anyone knows the time, somewhere probably about seven hours of testimony that we've heard from people, we're deeply thankful for it. Um, and we, um, I have now extended the, uh, the amount of people three times. Um, so we need to move on and get to the rest of our agenda. We have a very long agenda. Um, and I am going to unmute the council I don't know if I'm missing any of you because you're all on, you're all over the place. I'm going to try and get you all back on. Um, anyone who still has their, uh, still has their video on, I don't see that many. If you could turn it off, that will help us be able to have uh, the council seen by other people. Let's see, two, four. Okay, I think we are actually... You're all on page two, but I think I found you. Okay. I am looking for action from you. Um, motion to close a public hearing, please. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Discussion on closing the public hearing. Hearing and seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. The barge. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the hearing has been closed. We thank everybody for your comments. Um, we uh, tried to get to everyone. We asked people to be uh, brief and ditto and not um, speak again. And um, we did the best we could to get to everyone. Um, and we made it through the list actually three times. So um, we are now moving on with the rest of the agenda. Next on the agenda is um, uh, any updates from committee chairs? Councilor Dwight. Um, just to say that legislative matters of course will convene depending on possible referrals from tonight. If not, then if there's no agenda, we will not be convening on Monday. Thank you. Other updates? How about one minute announcements or recognitions? 
Okay. Seeing none. Um, Mayor Narkowitz, do you have, oh, hold up. You won't be able to tell me, hold on. Mayor Narkowitz? I have no announcements. Okay, thank you. Um, we- I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> thank you. Um, we have no resolutions that um, were made it onto the agenda by the filing deadline for deliberation. Um, though there is one later in new business. And we can move to the consent agenda. We are going to remove item B from the consent agenda as we didn't cover it. Um, we did not do the hearing. So uh, there's only one item on the consent agenda. Um, what, how about the uh, recap? Councilor Shara? Yes. Were you going to recess for the Committee on City Services Committee oh, meeting? Oh, I'm uh, so Building sorry. Commissioner Flag. Apologies. For... Yes, of course. I apologize. Yes, actually, we are going to recess for the Committee on City Services. Thank you, Councilor Shara. Of course. Okay. I'd like to call um, to order and a roll call on the Committee on City Service. Sure. Uh, Councilor LaBarge. Here. Councilor Foster. Here. Councilor Mayori. Here. And Councilor Quinlan. Councilor Labarge, we really cannot hear you. Yes, I'd like approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of March 2nd, 2020. Could you hear me? I will me move to approve please? the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Um, I think we have to All have right, a roll Jerome. call. Madam Chair. Uh, roll call. Okay. Um, Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. We have um, one item referred to our committee, and that is the appointment of Jonathan Flagg as building commissioner. I'd like to um, introduce um, Mayor David Narkowitz. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor LaBarge, and thank you um, to the members of the City Services Committee. Um, it's my great uh, privilege to um, introduce to you my appointee to become our next uh, building commissioner in the city of Northampton, uh, Jonathan Flagg. Um, uh, Mr. Flagg is currently our assistant uh, building commissioner and um, comes has extensive experience uh, prior to his time here in Northampton since last fall. Um, he was previously the uh, building commissioner um, in the uh, city of East Hampton, um, uh, town of Hinsdale, town of Blandford, city of Westfield, um, and um, uh, town of Russell. Um, he also has um, significant um, experience just in, as a, in, in construction, uh, car work running his own carpentry firm um, and obviously has all of the necessary uh, certifications that are uh, required to um, hold this position which are quite extensive. Um, as many of you know um, our longtime uh, building commissioner um, uh, Louis Hasbrook um, uh, announced his um, retirement actually somewhat earlier than planned retirement. Um, in one way to try to help um, the city during this um, uh, serious economic situation um, to, to try to uh, preserve and free up some additional uh, funding in his budget for FY 2021. Um, and, um, and I 
think you probably read the reports that uh, uh, Mr. Hasbrook strongly uh, supports uh, Jonathan Flagg um, stepping in as the commissioner um, and believes he'll be able to lead uh, this department forward. Um, and I share that as well. And so it's my uh, pleasure to, um, to, to introduce him to you and put forward uh, formally his appointment to you tonight. Mayor, are you going to um, present the candidate to our committee? Um, I, I, yes, I believe I, I did, and I believe- No, this... but is he here tonight? I, I am. Yes. yes, he is. Yes, I am here. Yes, sir. Turn it over to you, uh, John. Okay, thank you, Mayor. I, have, uh, I appreciate your endorsement, as well as that of uh, my good friend, uh, Louis Hasbrook. Um, Louis and I, we have a lot of the same background. We got our certifications um, about 12 years ago at about the same time. We took classes together. We took our tests together. We have a lot of the same background. We have a lot of the same mindset when it comes to, um, you know, helping the, whoops, sorry, I just lost somebody here. Hmm. Sorry about that. I just lost my video. Uh, but anyway, um, can you can you all still hear me? We can yeah. still see yeah. you actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Still see you. Okay. Yep. Um, so anyway, when uh, um, in working in Westfield, working in East Hampton, um, you know, uh, we tried to do the best we could as far as, you know, being uh, business friendly. We tried to do everything we could to, um, um, to get people to where they want to be when they want to start a project. To not just, you know, say, no, you can't do this. Uh, we'll try to find a way to help them get there. Um, working with uh, many city planners over the years, um, we've, we've done a lot to, to help that um, in every pretty much every community I've worked in. Um, again, my, my background, I spent, uh, I spent five years as a commissioner in Westfield. Uh, Westfield is a city, of course, is 45,000 square, uh, 45,000 people, 48 square miles. And we do about, well, Westfield was doing about the same amount of permits, uh, actually a little bit more than we do here in Northampton. Northampton is a very, very busy community, uh, very business friendly, and I'm actually looking to keep that going, as Mr. Hasbrook has in the past uh, 12 years, I think it's been. <laughs> yeah. 15, so. 12 as commissioner, he he, yeah. he 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 moved up from assistant just just as you are. Yep. yep. So, I mean, does, does anyone have any questions for me? I'm going to open the floor for questions or comments from the counselors. Can you hear me? Would any of the counselors like to speak to Jonathan Flagg on the floor, please? Councillor Lem, okay. Councillor Quinlan, you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, well, Mr. Flagg, um, you know I'm really uh, very impressed with what what you've sp just spoken about. I think you made a case for for the job beyond the mayor's endorsement and your predecessor's endorsement. So uh, I'm I'm very comfortable and and uh, and I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. No, thank you. Any other councillors? Councillor Nash, Councillor Labarge. All right, there we go. Hello, Jonathan, um, and uh, direct, Director Flag, and um, I, um, I, I just want to take a quick opportunity to say how terrific your predecessor was and what big shoes you have to fill. I, I felt that Louie was always responsive, thoughtful, brought a lot of detail, and, and really sweated every problem. There, there was, there was there was never a time where I brought something to him where he he just kind of brushed it off. He 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 really was thoughtful, and um and I really appreciated that he brought that to the building department, and and I I am pleased that that he is your uh, your your ideal for how to fill that job, and so um 
So I, I'm, I, I, I'm thankful of that. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And then you're right. I do have some very big shoes to fill. Louis is, uh, he's incredible when it comes to his, his passion um, for the city of Northampton. Now, I live in Westfield, um, but uh, that doesn't mean my passion's not going to be there. I still, you know, I, I plan on doing the job that, uh, um, that I'm being presented for. And that's the way I've been doing it for the last 12 years or so. so I look to carry that forward. Great. Thanks. Yeah, welcome to Jonathan. We're, we're a little bit tired tonight, but we're glad that you're here with us. So thank you for being here and we're excited for uh, your future here. Oh, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate that. It's been a, it's been a long meeting. Uh, it is obvious that uh, the city of Northampton has some very passionate people um, uh, as, uh, as residents there. And I've already dealt with some of them you know, uh, in my job as the, uh, as the assistant commissioner and I'm doing everything I can to, again, to help them uh, get through whatever, you know, mini crisis or whatever, you know, project they want to get, uh, they want to get going. Jonathan, um, I want to thank you for taking this position. It's not going to be an easy one. I have worked. I have worked with Tony Patillo for all the years that he served the city, and then Louis. And Louis and Tony both were fantastic building commissioners. Very good report. Very helpful. And it's going to be very difficult to fill Louis' shoes. Believe me. Yeah, no, I'm I, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. I hope you are. Yep. Because, I mean, you know, <laughs> even with Ward Six, it's a busy ward, and I really appreciate our building commissioners because you'll have your hands full. Hopefully, the economy will get back on its feet eventually, and you'll be busy in your office again with building permits and bringing in some money. But I want to thank you for taking Louis's advice and hopefully to be recommended as our new building commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, um, the one other thing that I wanted to say was that uh, this is the first time that I've actually taken over a position from a, another commissioner where I actually had time to work with them as a transition. Uh, when I was uh, appointed the commissioner's position in Westfield, it was um, my predecessor was fired and I was the guy the next day. No warning. I had no idea it was coming. It was just there. East Hampton was the same thing. Um, the commissioner there gave his two minute notice, walked out the door, and I walked into another department that I, you know, I had no idea what was going on, but we made it work. Um, I've been through some pretty adverse times in different departments, and I have no doubt that I can uh, I can get the job done. I don't know if I can do it as well as Louie did it, but I'm certainly going to try. I know you well, and thank you. Are there any more questions from any of the counselors? Okay. So if there are no more questions... I would be happy to entertain a motion. Make a motion. Uh, may I make a motion? Go ahead, Karen. Oh. Make a motion. Um, second. Great. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second to forward the appointment of Jonathan Flagg as building commissioner to the full city council with a positive recommendation. Is there any discussion? If not, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. And Councillor Quinlan? The motion is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Flagg. 
The appointment will be on the full city council's agenda at its next regular, <laughs> regular meeting. Thank you very much, all of you. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Confirmation vote will be on the June 18th city council meeting. Thank you all. Again, thank you all. You all have a good night. You too. You too. Can I make a motion to adjourn city services? Second. All in favor? <laughs> Roll call. Roll call. Uh, Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. And Councillor Labarch? Yes. Le Councillor Labarch, okay. Okay, we are back in the regular council meeting. Councillor Foster, your hand is up. My hand is up because I'd like to re request a recess. Yes, um, five minute recess work. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but we are gonna come back from recess and we're gonna go to the consent agenda. Um, we are gonna remove item B. And so that just leaves um, minutes of May 21st, 2020 on the consent agenda. Uh, hold up, let me unmute you all. Okay. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. It's been made and seconded uh, to approve the consent agenda. Roll call, please. There we go. Roll call, please. Sure. Councilor Mayori. She's, she's coming. Yes. Sorry. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. <laughs> Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we approve the consent agenda. We are now going to recess for the Committee on Finance. Laura, when you're able, can you take the roll, please? <laughs> Councillor Shara. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Quinlan. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay. First item is approval of minutes from the May 21st, 2020 meeting. Okay. Motion's been made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by? Second. Second. I think. Um, any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, roll call, please. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. The minutes from the last meeting. Going to now move to the financial orders. Um, we are, so in finance, we put forward a recommendation, um, and then we take up the full deliberation in the council on the items. Um, so we are going to go through them. First one is 20.053 in order to approve the FY 2021 general fund budget and the order... Oh, there we go. The order, uh, I'm gonna, I'll read the order, um, which has, I believe the totals in it. So in the city council, June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.053 in order to approve FY 2021 general fund budget, ordered that the sum of 95,444,320, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 general fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, 
be appropriated for the purposes stated, provided that the appropriation for Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School shall be used solely for the purposes of meeting net school spending as defined by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and no funds so appropriated shall be transferred to any account or extended for any purpose that will not be included in the calculation of net school spending. To meet this appropriation, $1,392,873 will be raised and appropriated from parking meter receipts reserved, $1,042,826 from sewer enterprise funds, $577,268 from water enterprise funds, $83,466 from solid waste enterprise funds, $341,407 from stormwater enterprise funds, $15,776 from the Community Preservation Act um, administrative funds, $20,932 from the Reserve for Police Station Debt Service, uh, $935,020 from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund, and $91,000 and $34,752 will be raised and appropriated. Um, Councillor uh, Jarrett, I'm gonna to go to Councillor Jarrett. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, so I have a conflict of interest for one item in this general fund budget. I know for the regular um, meeting, we have made arrangements to remove to consider that item separately so that I may participate, but that isn't possible in finance. So um, I can't participate in this item because of Federal People's contract uh, with central services. Uh, so I will turn off on my video and audio. Um, thank you. Um, hold on one second. So there are two more pages in the order. Um, oh, okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, I will read the totals for, so there, Laura, can you put them up on the screen? Yes, let's get them up here. Um, Are you going to read the total at the bottom or? Well, it, it's the council's pleasure. Would you like me to read every line item or the totals for per department or per section? Okay, let's do it. Um, general fund, general government, city council, Personnel services, $140,393. Ordinary maintenance, $55,500. Uh, total, $195,893. Mayor, $416,456. Ordinary maintenance, $16,442. Total, $432,898. Auditor, $362,230. Ordinary maintenance, $5,280. Total three hundred and sixty-eight thousand five hundred and ten. Assessors one hundred and eighty-nine thousand eight hundred seventy. Ordinary maintenance one hundred and twenty-three three fifty. Total three thirteen uh, two hundred and twenty. Uh, treasurer collector three hundred and seventy-seven thousand nine hundred eighteen. Ordinary maintenance maintenance two hundred seventy-six thousand four hundred thirty-five. Total six hundred fifty-four thousand three hundred fifty-three. Legal services, ordinary maintenance, no person, no personnel, um, no personal services. Ordinary maintenance is uh, two hundred and seventy-five thousand for total. And that is also the total. Human resources, two hundred ninety-nine thousand six hundred eighty-four. Ordinary maintenance, thirty-seven thousand fifty. Total, three hundred thirty-six thousand seven hundred thirty-four. Information technology. Uh, 374,370 ordinary maintenance, 678,510 total 1,052,880 city clerk registrar of voters, 300,243 ordinary maintenance, 32,525 total 332,768 
planning sustainability, 376,443. Ordinary maintenance, 59,200. Total, 435,643. Central services, 709,046. Um, ordinary maintenance is 1,046,160. Total is $1,755,206. Um, that is, so for the total under personal services is 3,547,654. Under ordinary maintenance, 2,605,452. And the total for uh, general government and the general fund is six million one hundred fifty-two thousand one hundred and six. Give me one second. I'm going to make this a little bigger for my poor eyes. Take a sip of water. Okay, moving on to public safety. <clears throat> Police under personal services five million nine hundred fifty thousand two hundred sixty-two. Ordinary maintenance six hundred and twelve thousand three hundred and sixteen. Other than ordinary maintenance. 350,825. Total is 6,913,403. Parking division enforcement, 182,601. Ordinary maintenance, 12,200. Total is 194,801. <clears throat> uh, public safety communication center, um, 672,310. Ordinary maintenance is 49,341. Total is 721,651. Fire rescue, 5,636,486. Ordinary maintenance, 529,430. Other than ordinary maintenance, 210,000. Uh, total 6,375,916. Building inspector, $449,216. Uh, ordinary maintenance, 26,200. Total 475,416. Parking division maintenance, $234,509. Ordinary maintenance, 269,198. Other than ordinary maintenance, 90,000. Total 593,707. Um, uh, so for public safety, the total for personal services, 13,125,384. For ordinary maintenance, 1,498,685. Other than ordinary maintenance, 55, uh, wait, hold on. Other than ordinary, 650,885. Total is 15,274,894. Okay. Education, uh, Smith Folk, the uh, total for this budget is 9 million. $6,705 for the school department, $32,162,012. Total for education, $41,168,717. Public works, uh, administration and engineering, $238,033. Ordinary maintenance, uh, $34,800. Total 272,833. Street General Highway, 724,987. Ordinary maintenance, 383,400. Uh, other than ordinary, 420,000. Total 1,528,387. Street Snow and Ice Control, $131,000. Um, for ordinary maintenance, $369,000. Total is $500,000. Parks and Cemeteries Division. Uh, personal services, 897,348. Ordinary maintenance, 272,450. Other than ordinary is 150,000. Total is 1,319,798. Total for public works, for personal services, 1,991,368. For ordinary maintenance, 1,059,650. For other than ordinary, 570,000. Total, $3,621,018. Human services, health department, 
personal services, 348,906. Uh, ordinary maintenance, 98,710. Total is 447,616. Senior services, 195,412. Uh, ordinary maintenance, 46,264. Total, 241,676. Veteran services, 213,645. Um, ordinary maintenance, six, uh, 655,983. Total is 869,628. The, for the total under human services is for personal services, 757,964. Under ordinary maintenance, 800,957 for a total of 1,558,921. Moving on to the next page. Hopefully you all can see this on the screen as well. Culture and recreation. Forbes Library under personal services, 1,200,000. And 2,759 ordinary maintenance, 188,485. Um, total, 1,391,244. Lily Library, 269,630. Ordinary maintenance, 81,807. Total of 351,437. Recreation, 311,681 300, for personal services. Ordinary maintenance, 32,500. A total of 345,181. Arts, arts and culture, uh, 65,173 for personal services. Ordinary maintenance, 16,250. Total, 81,423. So for culture and rec, under personal services, the total is 1,849,243. For ordinary maintenance, 320,042. For the total being 2,169,285. Under debt service, for municipal indebtedness, uh, ordinary maintenance, 3,591,700. That's also the total. Interest on municipal indebtedness, 80, 882,212, which is also the total. So the total debt service under ordinary maintenance is 4,473,912. Under, um, uh, which is the, the same as the entire total. So moving on to employee benefits. Contributory retirement system, personal services, 6,559,443, which is the total. Pensions, non-contributory and OPEB, 30, 332,000. Uh, under ordinary maintenance is 10,000 for a total of 342,000. Workers' compensation, 684,360, and that is the total. Unemployment compensation, 103,935. Ordinary maintenance is 10,000 for a total of 113,935. Group medical insurance, 11,576,432. Ordinary maintenance of 15,000 for a total of 11,591,432. Life insurance is 55,000. That's the total. Employee taxes. 942,500, uh, which is also the total. And unused sick leave, 180,000, um, which is the total. So under employee benefits, benefits, the total for personal services is 20,433,670. Ordinary maintenance total is 35,000. Uh, grand total is 20,468,670. Capital projects and miscellaneous. Capital projects, uh, there is nothing in this budget. General liability fund under ordinary maintenance is 76,200. That's the total. Property and auto insurance, ordinary maintenance 309,397, which is the total. Public employees liability insurance 70,200, which is the total. Reserve for personnel under personal services is a uh, hundred thousand, which is the total. So the total for capital projects and miscellaneous 
Under personal services, 100,000. Under ordinary maintenance is 455,797 for a total of 555,797. So the total general fund appropriation in this budget is 95,444,320. Non-appropriated uses reserved for abatements and exemptions is $550,000. Other amounts to be raised, $27,122. Cherry sheet offset receipts, 1,411,645. State assessments, cherry sheet, 3,641,594. Total, uh, so for um, non-appropriated uses, the total is 5,630,361. Total budget plan for the general fund, 101,074,681 dollars. That is the order, let me get back to my agenda. Okay. Um, so I've read the most, I've, I've read the order. And now, Councilor Quinlan, yes. So, we don't discuss this at this time. You can. Um, we we will be deliberating in the full council. Um, as you know, Councilor Jarrett's not joining us in this discussion. Um, mm -hmm. But we will be doing some removals when we uh, or we will be voting to see if we wish to do some removals to. Um, to have the deliberation in the full council. Okay. But um, you're, you know, I know that Susan Wright is here. I know Mayor Narkowitz is here. We're welcome to discuss now. Um, no, I mean, if we're, if, if we're all gonna discuss it together, uh, you know, in the next part of our full council agenda, I understand completely. Um, we, what we need to do to have any discussion though, is we need a motion. Um, so, Councilor Nash, you're not on finance. <laughs> Councilor LaBarge, are you trying to speak? No, okay. All of the motions, I move to approve it. Okay, so the motion to approve, uh, a motion to make a positive recommendation on the general fund budget has been made. Yes. Seconded. And seconded by Councilor Quinlan? Thorpe. Thorpe, sorry. Hard to hear you guys. Um, okay, now discussion. Councillor Nash. Thank you. Um, so, and in, in this uh, relates to Councillor Quinlan's question. So if we're gonna discuss removals, we would do it in finance, not in uh, back at council. We, should we be having that discussion here or? Or we're, it's up to us, to, right? Um, what I'm trying to explain is that we are going to be do when this goes, we're going to be doing something somewhat complicated when it comes back to council to accommodate Councillor Jarrett's conflicts, right. um, which we are not able to do in finance. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Councillor Dwight. I think it's worth clarifying that that um, because of this extraordinary circumstance with Councillor Jarrett, it, it, this is not necessarily the normal procedure. And it 
in order to have him be able to participate and not be excluded from the discussion, which I'm pretty sure he wants to be involved in, um, it's appropriate to move it to the floor where removals, amendments, modifications can be made. We have to do a removal in order to accommodate his um, conflict. Once we address that, then all other discussions, he will be allowed to participate in. Normally, this you would be able to have this discussion in finance and uh, the rest of the council can participate. But because of this the extraordinary circumstance, we're, we're, we're left with gymnastics. And I, I don't envy Council Shara on this. So. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call on a positive recommendation on the general fund budget. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, we will take that up in council when we, uh, after we get through the finance agenda. Um, next is an order to approve the FY 2021 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget. In City Council on June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.054 in order to approve FY 2021 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget, ordered that the sum of 6,177,500, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 Sewer Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. 5,134,674 to be raised from sewer receipts and 1,042,826 shall be allocated to indirect costs. Laura has it up on the screen. So for sewer general sanitary, 1,051,250. Sewer treatment is 2,217,734. Sewer debt. 209,235. Sewer interest, 61,804. Sewer indirect costs, 1,042,826. Sewer transfer to capital projects, 1,594,651. Total sewer enterprise fund, 6,177,500. So I have read the motion. Move I read the order. Um, Sorry, I need to move, move to make a positive recommendation to the full council Second. on this order. The motion was made by Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And seconded. seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, um, roll call, please, on a positive recommendation. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, we will take this up in the full council as well. Um, moving on to 20.055 in order to approve FY 2021 Water Enterprise Fund budget. Oops, I'm up. In City Council, June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, in order to approve FY 2021 Water Enterprise Fund budget, ordered that the sum of $6,945,000, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 Water Enterprise, Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation, 6,367,732 is to be raised from water receipts, 
shall be allocated to indirect costs. And that's comprised of for water general, 2,949,566. Water debt, 1,684,863. Water interest, $262,190. Um, uh, water indirect costs, 577,268. Water transfer to capital projects, 1,471,113. Total water enterprise fund, $6,945,000. I have read the order. motion to move for a positive recommendation. Motion is made by Councillor Thorpe. Second. Seconded by Councillor Quinlan. I got to put my thing on. Yes. Okay. Um, any discussion? Oh, discussion? No. Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Quinlan. Are you muted? No. Councillor Quinlan, am I muted? Oh, he may be frozen. Okay, maybe we can. <laughs> Councillor Quinlan, try turning off your video. Uh, oh, I just you. got back. Uh, I yes. Okay, Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. How do I get that off? Okay, uh, we will take that up in. The council that was water enterprise. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Moving to 20.056 in order to approve FY 2021 solid waste enterprise fund budget. Councillor Jarrett. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay. Um, I ha have a conflict of interest as well in this as Pedal People has a financial interest in the decisions made with the solid waste enterprise fund budget. Uh, so I will turn off my video again, step away for this. Don't worry about discuss, discuss it all uh, here if you like. Um, it, I will also be stepping away in the full council. Thank you. Thank you for that disclosure. Um, okay, let me pull up the order. In City Council, June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, in order to approve FY 2021 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget, ordered that the sum of 795,326, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the, for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. 439,534 is to be raised from solid waste receipts. 83,466 shall be allocated to indirect costs and $272,326 to be made available from the retained earnings balance of the solid waste enterprise fund. Um, that's comprised of, from the solid waste transfer station, $711,860. Solid waste indirect and in, direct and indirect costs, 82466 Total solid waste enterprise fund, 795326 Okay. I've read the order. Motion to move forward for positive. Move to a Second. Motion was made by Councillor Thorpe, seconded by Councillor Quinlan, I believe. Um, Councillor Dwight, hold on one sec. Hold on. I got like three monitors and you guys are just on one of them. Give me a sec. And they and in two different mouses. Give me a second. Okay. There we go. Um, I'd like to follow up uh, with the mayor and or Susan Wright about the um, issue that was brought up um, in public comment about the not necessarily for the, uh, the the traffic management on Locust Street, but more about subsidizing a police officer to manage the traffic within the the campus of the transfer station it does seem like a 
rather disproportional cost and expense that could probably be managed by someone in an orange vest. All right, I'm, I'm unmuting Mayor Narkowitz and I'm gonna find Susan. Sure, I'm right um, here. Okay. Um, yeah, Councillor, um, so the, um, we uh, were began using uh, tra uh, traffic details. And again, these are off duty officers. These are not, we're not, um, these are not officers that are on duty that we're taking away or adding to, you know, adding, doing overtime. We're doing, these are off duty officers who are on detail. Sometimes they may be reserve officers, but um, during the COVID-19, particularly starting with the COVID-19 outbreak, um, we needed to be able to really control social distancing because if you've been to the transfer station, it's a fabulous ballet of people crisscrossing and going back and forth. And we actually ended up moving one, one of the dumpsters in order to um, in order to make more room um, and keep people separated. But we ended up um, limiting the number of vehicles that could sort of be in line at any one time. Um, and um, and so th that's when sort of having the officer there, we've always had an officer directing traffic um, on Saturdays where it's been the busiest, um, but um, we have had a, a significant increase in, um, in sort of issues related to um, people's, um, I guess, uh, behavior and, and this is even before COVID-19 with we've had complaints from our um, from our gatekeepers about the um, about just residents not complying and being abusive towards the gatekeepers we've had a couple of gatekeepers who've uh, quit um, because of abusive behavior toward them and um, you know they're 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 the people in the orange vests um, they tend to be retired folks and um, and basically said like I, I don't I don't get paid to get screamed and yelled at and so um, so we have had um, we have had officers there um, particularly for the traffic managing the traffic inside the site um, and it's been very um, helpful and the uh, not only for the traffic piece of it but the gatekeepers have. Um, uh, been very grateful because it has taken some of the pressure off of them in terms of um, being screamed at. Um, and so, um, and even literally last Saturday, the detail officer had to leave um, and um, and there was a uh, several incidents that occurred that the gatekeepers reported. So, um, so Director Lascalia feels strongly that having, um, having some sort of uh, traffic detail there for each of the days um, is important. And so we don't know how long the COVID-19 uh, situation will last and whether or not we'll need to uh, maintain that, how long we'll need to maintain that. Um, but we are, um, this is what she's looking to incorporate into the budget. Again, it's a budget. We don't know that we'll actually use all of it, um, but that's what, that's, that's the basis of it. And again, uh, the idea of just getting a, a good citizen in an orange vest um, that's what we've been trying to do, and it hasn't been very successful. Councillor Dwight. Sorry, just follow up then. Um, what, how does this translate to uh, the increased fee, um, the cost of, of the extra duty police officer? Well, I mean, it's, it's incorporated into the overall. Well, so first of all, the, the, if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the solid waste enterprise fund budget, um, the budget itself is um, uh, has to be supplemented with um, uh, you know with reserve funds from the solid waste enterprise fund because we've been because we haven't raised the fees in uh, since two thousand and nine, and because we do have um, we've seen a significant drop in the number of um, of stickers. Um, and, uh, and because we do have, um, some of the, you know, our, our transfer station is open more than nearly any other uh, transfer station in the area. And we have the lowest sticker fee. So we, we needed to address this issue of fees. Um, but in terms of the, that particular cost, um, it's a, definitely a portion of it, 
Um, but I don't, it's not, we would still need to raise the fee um, and, and adjust hours. Um, and also, uh, you know, irregardless of the security part of it. Maybe count, maybe Susan Wright could, could give you a clearer percentage on that or something. I don't, I don't know, she might be able to um, quantify that better. Um, we're, we're using 272,326,000 of retained earnings to supplement the um, solid waste budget. And we have been doing that um, for the past, I would say six or seven years, we've been supplementing that budget because we are not bringing in enough revenue to fully cover the cost of that service. Um, the retained earnings that the solid waste fund has built up over the years that the city operated a landfill. Um, so at some point, um, we will get to the point where we will run out of retained earnings. That being said, many of the costs at the transfer station, as the mayor pointed out, haven't been raised in years. And um, we do have among the lowest um, fees, even with the increase that's being proposed. Um, also, the recycling fees have gone, the cost for disposing of recyclables is now a cost. It wasn't before. Uh, trash disposal fees are also increasing. So uh, this seemed like a good time to recalibrate uh, the, the uh, costs of operating the transfer station. So it's, I mean, the, the I think the, 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 the decision around having, um, you know, having a, a traffic officer there is more about, is more operational and more uh, behavior based. And we'd be having that conversation regardless of the, of the situation with the solid waste enterprise, uh, enterprise fund. Um, so it's not really, so yeah, that, that, I guess that's sort of a separate issue. Um, and it's more of an operational issue and it's something that, Director Lascalia feels has been very beneficial, um, and the gatekeepers have been very um, supportive of the idea. Um, and and so, for whatever reason, um, you know, having having that uh, traffic person there um, seems to keep things flowing uh, better, and it seems to. Um, uh, people's behavior seems to be um, improved for whatever reason. Thank you. Uh, I got Councillor Quinlan and then Councillor Nash. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I think it, it deserves noting that uh, the gatekeeper budget from last year, from the fiscal year that we're in to next year is actually the same $90,000, but we're cutting 25% of the hours uh, that the transfer stations open. Uh, so I wonder if, you know, if, if either those, those hours obviously could be spent with the orange vest directing traffic, uh, or if uh, they couldn't, if that, if that line item maybe shouldn't be considered because it, we're, we're reducing the service, uh, there would seem to me there would be less hours needed in that line. Well, you're talking about the hours for the gatekeepers? Yeah, it's the same ninety thousand dollars in both years. Yeah, so one of the issues is um, uh, the minimum wage goes up every year, um, goes up January first. So I do know that that's one of the reasons why that line item would go up, even though hours may be decreasing. Um, I don't know what we set the. We tend to set the wage a couple steps ahead of minimum wage. Um, I don't know where that's at, Susan, in terms of what we've raised that to for this fiscal year um, to try to stay ahead of the two. There's going to be a, uh, there was one in January. There'll be another one this coming January. Um, so that may be part of what you're seeing there. Susan? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what we use for an hourly rate, but I'm not, I, I'm not sure that the gatekeepers get minimum wage. I believe we, we pay more. I think they're paid. I think they're paid uh, fifteen dollars an hour. So I think we move them ahead. Uh, I think that happened actually this year. Um, uh, we we move them ahead um, to I think two fifteen dollars a year. So that's probably also part of that increase. But I can get you that. We can get. We can clarify well, that with Director Lascaria. 
it's thirteen. It's thirteen dollars an hour that we pay. But I, I will say, because of the uh, increased um, behavior oh, issues at the transfer station, it is hard to get people to do these jobs. So, um, and it's not easy to predict the hours um, because there are additional. Um, there are times when there are additional uh, activity there at the at the transfer station. There are different events that are run um, for recycling and other things that that end up costing more. Right, but on a, on a weekly basis, we're reducing the hours by twenty five percent with the same same budget. Uh, it's uh, you know when when we're also adding one hundred and ten thousand dollars to the security line. You know, it just doesn't, I mean, it's $90,000 on a $101 million budget, but it's still, uh, you know, there's, we're, we're cutting 25% of the hours. <laughs> well, we have, we have two officers on Saturdays. That is the plan. And then we will have an office. We've always had one officer on Saturdays. We will now have two right. officers on Saturdays and we will have officers on the other three days of the week. I think, um, you can't underestimate the amount of of incidents and hostility that the gatekeepers are subject to. People show up at four o'clock, the gates are closed, they are not happy. They are very belligerent and very unhappy. People park in the handicap spot and they don't listen to the people in the orange vests. They they just ignore them. Um, we've had we've had people threaten gatekeepers. Um, there are there are a lot of security concerns that the director raised with us, and this is why she felt that this would be an appropriate uh, level of security for her gatekeepers. But it also is very tied to the traffic flow. With the COVID-19, um, we have had to restrict the number of people that are actively taking the trash out of their cars and putting it into the various receptacles. And so we have to have some retain some sort of order. The other thing I'd like to point out is that because we will we have people coming in and they need to stay in line and they need to be, we need to have less people taking stuff out of their cars at the same time in order to ensure social distancing. There has to be order. You have to remember this transfer station is smack in the middle of our DPW yard. And three of those days, the DPW is open and they are trying to do their operations while a transfer station um, and traffic is coming in and around them. And the director has pointed out for several years now that that's a real problem. Um, someone's going to get hurt, people are going to get hurt. And so this added um, traffic detail is not just because of COVID, it's also because we have an active DPW yard that is also used as a transfer station and the amount of cars that are coming in and out um, create a difficult situation for other pieces of machinery that are moving around the yard. So I think there are an, there are multiple reasons the director felt that having a traffic increasing the traffic detail for this operation was necessary. Okay, Councilor Quinlan, you done? No, yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Nash. Thank you, um, uh, Director Wright. You. Uh, pretty much half answered my question. So that the the issue here, the need for the officer and the, the, the heightened stress has to do with the traffic pattern, the limited traffic pattern because of COVID-19 and all of the social distancing. If at some point those restrictions were lifted, do you think we could return to not requiring to have that officer there in the yard, and then it could go back to somebody in a vest. I mean, that's, that's I, 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 I'm not a regular there, but I have been in there with somebody with the vest and they've been uh, uh, forceful and clear, but I wasn't there during COVID-19 um, social distancing. And I, I can imagine that people get uh, kind of grumpy. And so, um, so I, it makes sense under the circumstances, but I'm wondering if it could return uh, once that gets lifted, whenever that is. Well, that would certainly be an operational question for the director. I mean, the director would be would evaluate that certainly, um, 
And that's, again, that would be something she would evaluate to see how it's going um, when, and when we are able to lift those, um, lift those restrictions. I mean, because the other piece of this is, um, you know, the, 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 the confounding factor is you're not only, you not only have people in close contact, but they're also carrying trash. They're carrying, you know, trash from their homes, which, you know, has its own potential issues in terms of, um, you know, recycle, loose recycling, trash, all those kinds of things. So, um, so, you know, we, we, um, you know, I think part of this is, uh, we want to see how it works out. We're also, you know, by compressing, um, the days, um, that may also have its own issues in terms of whether we'll see, you know, different days that will be more increased than others. We're not sure. So, you know, this will be, this, this will, you know, this will be something that she'll monitor. And if we don't need those, then um, she will move away from it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But I mean, certainly, you know, it's, it's within, you know, so, but in terms of the operational piece, that's what she wants to do. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Mary, did I see a hand? Keep doing that. Um, yeah, I think it was partly addressed. I was just going to mention that, um, you know, I'm wondering, I guess it's a question. I'm wondering why, if someone's actually being abusive to someone in a vest, uh, their their transfer station privileges are just suspended. We have had, we have, um, of using we have had restraining orders against some people from uh, that is not, we have pulled restraining orders um, against certain folks because of behavior uh, towards uh, gatekeepers. Um, so, yeah, uh, so that is something we can, um, and, and, and the DPW director does reserve the right to revoke people's stickers if they don't behave. And I think she has revoked them as well. Um, but again, the DPW director is not out there, um, you know, is not out there. So, um, you know, there's a policy that people receive when they get their stickers um, that sort of, you know, not a, sort of a code of conduct of sorts that you need to follow the rules of the of the transfer station and, you know, listen to the attendants, et cetera. Um, but but uh, sometimes that doesn't happen. And again, you know, it's sometimes it's, people are busy, they're come, you know, they're going to or from places, there's a crowd, they're trying to find a parking space, you know, whatever it is. Um, but um, but it's just not, it's already a um, uh, a challenging situation with the way the traffic works there and people walking and crisscrossing from cars um, and the um, the attendants trying to just manage everything um, to then add the um, those other issues on top of it just uh, 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 creates a tough situation for those folks to try to manage. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, roll call please on a positive recommendation. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Oh wait, hold on. Councilor yeah. Thorpe? Here, yes. Okay. Councilor Labarge? Yes. And Councilor Quinlan? Yes. Okay. Um, moving to 20.057 in order to approve FY 2021 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. Uh, in the city council on June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.057, in order to approve FY 2021 stormwater and flood control enterprise budget, ordered that the sum of 1,996,486, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation. 1,655,079 um, is to be raised from stormwater and flood control receipts and $341,407 shall be allocated to indirect costs. Um, and that is for storm drains, 496, uh, 415. Flood control, 200,248. Stormwater and flood control debt, 35,000. 
stormwater and flood control interest, 3,850. Stormwater and flood control water indirect cost, 341,407. Stormwater and flood control transfer for capital projects, 919,566. Um, nothing under stormwater and flood control reserve, total being 1,996,486. That is the order. Move to present uh, the order for stormwater and flood control uh, with a positive recommendation to the full council. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Discussion. Councillor Jarrett. Um, I don't. Not sure this is germane to the the topic at hand, but uh, you know I've certainly heard from another a lot of people that the formula used to calculate uh, the stormwater fees isn't fair. And at some point, I would just appreciate some information about uh, what the how to change that formula or what the process would be for that. Mayor Narkwitz looks like he's I'm trying to. It says I don't know. I have to unmute you. I'm sorry. Perfect. No problem. Um, and then I proceeded to mute myself again. Sir, certainly we can try. We can provide that information to you. Great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing and I would, only, I would just I would just say that this will be I think year seven or eight, um, and we have not changed or modified the the stormwater. Uh, flood control um, enterprise in terms of the size of it. We've kept it under $2 million, um, which was our sort of unofficial pledge for the first five years, and we've maintained that. So um, we have not raised those um, fees. Um, so anyway, just, just add that piece. Councilor Jarrett. Um, and is that, I noticed that we're using 919,000 uh, from the stabilization fund. Is that the what's used to to control that to make sure we stay right at the two million? Um, and is that sustainable? Oh wait, sorry. Hold on. Does that work? I had to get the unmute myself. Um, had to get the unmute myself um, button. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure that you're that uh, that you're. Um, I'm not sure where you're seeing that. That that. Um, I, I don't. I don't know that. We're, I don't believe that we're using that. Um, any retained earnings in this um, in this budget. Um, I'm on page, this is from page 19 of the budget. The oh. expenditure summaries. Susan, okay. Susan, yeah. you're not muted, so you can jump in. Okay. I was yeah, so, so we're not using any, we're, all of the stormwater and flood control enterprise fund is being paid for through the, um, through the fee. Um, it, what you're looking at on page 19 is are the expenditures from the stormwater enterprise fund. And we will be putting 919,566 into stabilization. If you look at the stormwater Enterprise Fund on page 87. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 89. Nine, you'll see that we're putting a, several things into drain replacement, the flood control levy, um, the 600,000 into the flood control levy, and 319,566 into drain replacement. And that, that uh, is that not clear? And that uh, those are capital those are capital projects that you if you pass this order you are funding six hundred thousand dollars for flood control levy and drain replacement. Those funds are 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 noted that they're put in the capital stable the stabilization fund and they're spent when the projects happen. Okay. 
that's clear. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, moving on to FY 2021 revolving funds. In City Council, June 4, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, in order to approve FY 2021 revolving funds, ordered that in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the city shall vote the limit on the total amount that may be expended from each revolving fund established by Chapter 16 by, of the city ordinances. Um, and these are the funds. Uh, 2420 Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund, $150,000. Uh, 2416 Hazmat Revolving Fund, $85,000. 2419 DPW Public Works Construction Services Revolving Fund, $85,000. 2408 Senior Services Transportation Revolving Fund, $100,000. 2428 Senior Services Activities Revolving Fund, $150,000. 243, uh, 2004, senior services, food services, result, revolving fund, 90,000. 2440, senior services, publications, revolving fund, 35,000. 2406, athletic league fees, revolving fund, $200,000. 2405, JFK Family Aquatic Center, $120,000. 2422 NPS Transportation Revolving Fund, $200,000. 2452 Smith Folk Agricultural High School Farm Revolving Fund, $100,000. 2435 Tur Tourism Directional Sign Program Revolving Fund, $10,000. 2436 Public Health Nursing Program Revolving Fund, $30,000. 2410 James House Revolving Fund, $85,000. 2439 Sharps Disposal Program Revolving Fund, $15,000. 2442 Fire Alarm Monitoring Program Revolving Fund, $60,000. 2443 DPW Reuse Committee Revolving Fund, $15,000. That's the order on the revolving funds. Positive re recommendation to full city council. The motion's been made for a positive re recommendation from Councillor Labarge. Seconded. And seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion on the revolving funds order. Seeing none, Mayor Narkowitz or Susan, anything you'd like to add? No. Okay. Seeing no questions for either of you, roll call, please, Laura, when you can. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. Uh, that moves forward with positive recommendation up to 20.059 in order authorizing acquisition and establishment of a municipal light plant. This is 20.059 uh, in City Council June 4, 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, in order authorizing acquisition and establishment of a municipal light plant, whereas the mayor and city council approved a two-phase market study and comprehensive feasibility study of municipal broadband as part of the FY 2020, FY 2024 capital improvement program. And whereas the city of Northampton is about to award a contract for the aforementioned two-phase study. And whereas if based on the results of those studies, the city of Northampton decides to implement municipal broadband, the city would be required to establish a municipal light plant in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 163, Subsection 35. And whereas establishment of a municipal light plan um, under Section 35 first requires two separate approval votes of the city council by a two thirds majority in two separate fiscal years. And whereas in the interest of 
not unnecessarily delaying a future potential municipal broadband project, it would be prudent to complete the first of those two required approvals in fiscal year 2020, ending June 30th, 2020. Now, therefore be it ordered, the City Council authorizes in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 164 of the General Laws and in accordance with the rules, regulations, and orders of the Department of Public Utilities and the Department of Telecommunications and Cable, the Municipal Light Plant, for all purposes allowable under the laws of the Commonwealth, and more particularly for the establishment of municipal broadband system for the city of Northampton. The mayor is hereby authorized to execute any documents necessary to effectuate this order. Make a motion. Second it. Motion has been made by Councilor Thorpe, seconded by Councilor, Councilor Labarge. Um, Laura, can I just note a Scrivener's error? Sure. Uh, where was it? Oh, um, fourth, whereas it's establishment of municipal light plant as opposed to plan. Okay, I'll make that change. Um, Councillor Dwight. Thank you. And, and um, I, I hope that everyone actually is on board with this, but I want to expand a little bit about what this what this involves. We, I think now for 10, 15 years now, we're talking about some kind of, and it, not just me, lots of people have been talking about the prospect of having municipal broadband for uh, the city of Northampton a, a, to actually render it as a utility. Because this is clearly right now, this the way we are now, at least for the foreseeable future, the way we're going to communicate, deliberate, and conduct quality. But more importantly, I and mean, part of the things that came out with our conversation with uh, Dr. Provost, among other things, is trying to establish equity, um, social equity, access to broadband for everyone. And that is one of the components in, of analysis in the proposed study is to um, offer competitive, if not better rates, certainly much better access and uh, more capacity uh, right now, basically the telecoms are sanctioned monopolies that basically dictate the rules and they govern and throttle the amount of service you can have access to. And if you want upgrades, you pay for that. Um, with hopefully with municipal broadband, um, we can offer excellent um, up and down load rates for the citizens that are on a par and equal to um, the, the businesses that would also enjoy a faster download speed and upload speed. So one, it's good for development of uh, businesses, but um, just as importantly for me is that it provides an opportunity for uh, the community that's currently isolated that has to go to um, um, Wi-Fi stations established in in, in uh, subsidized housing projects, uh, or to uh, um, hopefully rely on the schools. Uh, it, it's my hope that um, if we're if we're going to be a modern city with modern and and carrying out the modern ideals that we we poss you know that we've been proposing and you've heard discussed. Uh, uh, intensely over the last few nights. Um, this actually is one way towards that, establishing that equity, if it's viable. We need to know if it's viable first, which is the two-phase plan. And we want a very frank and clear uh, assessment from these people as to whether it is viable and it makes sense. If they say yay, then we go. And we should and go with all due speed. But in order to do that, there is this uh, this little hump here. You've got to approve it in this fiscal year and the next fiscal year. And then, to be perfectly honest, I don't know why that is, but that's that's what Mass General Law requires. So, um, I, I I hope that uh, you'd be so inspired to uh, give this affirmative vote, not only to recommend it out of the committee, but also to give it an affirmative vote once we get it on the floor. And thank you. Mayor Narkowitz, would um, would you like to speak to the order? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Councillor Dwight just uh, gave a great overview, and I want to thank him because he is serving on a um, on an advisory committee um, along with um, several citizens um, who are interested in this and who've been helping um, work on the both the RFP and now evaluating um, uh, the actual uh, submissions to the RFP, and will be working on some interviews um, to help us select. Um, the firm that will ultimately carry out the market study. Uh, the market study um, first to see is there is there actually market interest for this in Northampton, um, and then an actual feasibility study of what it would actually take um, to carry it out and to actually lay out a plan for it. So um, again, it's still just in an exploratory phase, um, but just knowing we have this requirement, not only do we have to have two votes of the council in two separate fiscal years, it then has to go on a ballot um, and be voted on by the entire city. Um, so we just knowing that we were close to the end of the fiscal year, that we were close to starting this, we should just get one of those votes out of the way um, so that potentially, you know, if, if we got a positive study, um, you could get a, a second vote in FY 2021 and potentially put something on the November ballot. We don't know. Um, but again, it's all, it's all, um, hinges on if it's viable under the plan. But um, so that's what this is about. And we're hoping to get uh, a vote on this tonight and then a vote obviously before the end of the month um, at, on the 18th, um, which would then complete that requirement of one vote in one fiscal year. Thank you. Questions and comments from councilors. I can tell you as I've heard from uh, quite a few residents in Ward 4 who are actually in favor of this. So, you know, I, I will be supporting this. Okay, Councillor LaBarge. Yes, um, I have to echo what Councillor Thorpe is saying. I received several emails of support of this happening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Other comments? Okay, seeing no more, um, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward to the council with a positive recommendation. Moving. <laughs> on to 20.060 in order to approve gift fund expenditures for street and transportation sharing. Uh, in city council, June 4th, 2020, on the recommendation of the mayor, 20.060 in order to approve gift fund expenditures for street and transportation sharing. Whereas in three previous orders, April uh, 2001, September, to, uh, 2012 and May 2013, City Council authorized the use of, of the city's tourism gift account for gateway signs and improvements, wayfinding signs, pavement markings, street and multi-use trail furniture and improvements, murals, sculptures, and art installations, and whereas leveraging funds from a $10,000 Solomon Foundation grant, the city is working with the Downtown Northampton Association and Florence Civic and Business Association and merchants to explore options for sharing streets to accommodate pedestrian flow, outdoor eating, curbside pickups, and attractive streetscapes that safely support the business community and the larger community. Ordered that Northampton City Council in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure, authorizes the expenditure of funds donated by the public through the existing tourism gift account to be used for all of the past authorized authorized uses and for street and transportation system sharing. That is the order. Move to approve this to with a positive recommendation to the full council. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan. Second. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, Mayor Narkowitz. So uh, the order is fairly self-explanatory. Mr. Fiden's on the call and has been on this meeting and I think he came for this order. Um, and so I feel compelled to call on him so that he doesn't feel like it was all for naught. Um, but this is part of our, this is one component of our 
plan that we've been working on with the DNA and with the foreign civic and business um, to, to, to try to stand up um, outdoor dining uh, very rapidly. And, and we've had some requests from people who want to make donations, but I'll turn it over to Wayne. This is something that he, um, this is a gift account that he already kind of manages and let him explain. Yeah, I don't have that much to add to it. I mean, you know, the short version is, is we've had this gift account for 10 years. We've used it for um, bike path equipment, uh, shared streets, other kinds of projects. Um, we've received some donations already. We just, we mentioned this project in our listserv um, and received like four or five donations since then. So I don't know how significant the donations will be. We have about a thousand dollars already, but it lets us supplement the work that we're doing from the Solomon Foundation donation, um, from the work that the merchants are doing themselves. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nash. And Wayne, could you speak to how this outdoor, it, so it, it, it provides the potential to get outdoor furniture, outdoor amenities for as we explore um, creating a more uh, public space downtown, correct? That's correct. So there's sort of two parts to this. For Main Street itself, which is a very complicated system, um, we've hired consultants to help us with that. That's the Solomon Foundation donation is going through. For Florence, for the side streets downtown, for the bike path through downtown, for a couple of alleyways downtown, that we're going to do on our own. We're sort of taking advantage of the lessons we've learned. So we're still working on the details of, of what that is. The idea would be um, let restaurants take over some public space nearby, sidewalks in front of them, uh, you know, the red brick pavers downtown, parts of the parking spots downtown, um, sections of the bike path. Again, there's sort of different areas out there. Um, merchants would be responsible for their own tables and chairs. We would work with them to make sure there's barriers so that cars don't conflict wherever people are dining. Um, we would buy our own street furniture for places that uh, are shared eating places. So there's additional spaces for somebody who wants to buy takeout food or not. So you know, it is, the merchants are opening their own restaurants, sidewalk cafes. Mm -hmm. We would be working with someone who wants to, you know, buy coffee at a coffee shop or do takeout or bring their own food and just be working where the activity is. Well, it, just to be clear, because you're kind of making it so maybe you don't have to be around in a little while, <laughs> but that if, um, you know, that this, this order is related to, you know, establishing the public environment as we do this experiment over the next, over the next few months. That's correct. Um, and, and it's going to be a combination of sources. So yes, you're, you know, I don't want to prejudge your discussion later this evening in terms of the order, but, you know, there's going to be a series of resources. So we have this $10,000 from Solomon Foundation. Now it's specifically about donations. DPW is very involved and DPW is going to bring down, you know, we're, we're restoring a golf course um, on uh, Old Wilson Road. And as part of the restoration of the golf course, we took out 102 concrete blocks that are six feet by two feet by two feet. Donate them to DPW is going to use them later for salt storage, but those things can be used downtown. So we're sort of collecting different goodies from around places. Um, you know, we, we in the same, same listserv that solicited donations, people come forward and said, oh, I have different things I can help contribute to this process. Um, so we're still doing the design, so I can't, I don't know yet what it will be. Um, but again, it's sort of it's remaking downtown and letting stores expand. This is, you know, this is also this is a grand experiment, but this is very immediate. We know that when the governor opens up restaurants, there's no in store in restaurant dining, uh, and so the only way those restaurants can stay alive, the only way we can eat out, is outdoor dining. Um, and there's just not enough space downtown the way we're configured to to serve that. You know, the scary figure I use is in any disaster. FEMA says that 25% of businesses that close because the disaster never reopen. And most disasters are much shorter term. This is, you know, hurricane or earthquake, the 25% don't reopen. This is much longer term. So this is, you know, we, we hope it's a fun experience for people, but it is an economic development action above all. Thank you. 
Council of the Barge. On the talk to Wayne? Yeah, yes. Councilor LaBarge? Wayne available? Wayne's right here. Okay, I don't see him. Oh, I do. He's there, I promise. Hi, Wayne. Hi. With this um, street and transportation sharing, is this to help our businesses in the city of Florence and also in Northampton. How long would it take to go ahead and start this? So we're still waiting for the governor to announce when things open. So uh, under his original order, restaurants might open as early as Monday, but he hasn't announced the final date yet. So we don't know when that's gonna happen. The first phase is going to be restaurants that own their own land. So Fitzwillies is looking at the parking next door. You know, Alexander's could take over the parking next door to them because um, that can happen very quickly. It just basically needs they have to do those actions. And for those who are serving liquor, they have to go before the license commission. The license commission is acting on the first, I think, six licenses on Monday that they're having a meeting. Um, this is sort of the next immediate phase. So very quickly, some places will be easier than others, you know, taking over. Um, uh, red brick pavers downtown is pretty simple. Moving into the street in both Florence and downtown is more complex. We're not going to be ready for that for a few days. But there is every department has been really involved. So DPW is very excited and committed manpower. Police is very excited um, and committed manpower for security. Um, planning in the mayor's office are sort of doing the overall coordination. Health department's very involved in amending orders. So there's a lot of support, but I can't tell you exactly how quickly we can get ready. I think this is a great idea. I mean, we need to get out there and help our businesses. You know, it's going to take them quite a long time to get back on their feet, and we all know this. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, Councillor, wait, oh, you just all rearranged. Okay, Councillor Dwight. <clears throat> yeah, and it's actually, I'm going to hold off. I'm just going to give a brief a little taste. I'm going to have some comments related to the, not this order, um, this financial order, but the one that's directly related to it that will be coming up, which will be authorizing the. Um, uh, ordinance changes in order to accommodate the, the co-opting of public space. And basically my concern is, and it's always been my concern for downtown, is these conflicts. And we are now offering private businesses our public space. And I don't know if everyone recalls the great bid debate, um, but, you know, I'm a little concerned about how this would impact the public conflicts that we've experienced for generations in this community, other communities, um, where some people feel they have primacy over the public space and try to deny other citizens who uh, they find conflict with their businesses. I, I'm all in favor, I'm very much in favor for uh, giving any of these businesses a leg up because they also provide all the revenue uh, uh, well, not all the revenue, but a substantial amount of revenue and plus jobs for people who are currently wanting and hurting very badly. So there's, I mean, I'm conflicted here to be sure, but I want to be very, I, I want to be, I want to express my concerns about the potential points of conflict and who will basically benefit and who will lose in these conflicts in public spaces. And I would be really reluctant to support any changes that might that would further diminish or uh, people's ability to pass in public on public property that's subsidized by the citizens of Northampton in a public space um, in in favor of a private enterprise if those conflicts come up. I'm not saying this very well because it's what. 1210, so I apologize. 
<clears throat> if it helps, one way that we view this is we're actually deprivatizing probably a lot of real estate because what we're talking about is parking spots that are basically the ultimate in privatized space that some will absolutely remain private now become restaurant space. I mean, restaurants have to put a line around, you know, a, a rope line around if they're serving alcohol, have to put a rope line in, and we do have to have that privatized space. But we're going to be netting out. If you just look at square footage, there'll be more public space at the end of the day during this next nine months or eight months than there is today. There'd be more private space as well and what there'd be less of is parking. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that. And I, I is there are also a consideration of digesting the road down to uh, one lane in each direction that would also expand beyond the parking spaces? So we, we have an engineering firm who's looking at this, the firm who had just finished a survey for us. So in that area between City Hall and King Street, which is where we have the extra lane, they're absolutely looking at that and, and trying to figure that out. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Any other questions or comments on this order? Okay, uh, seeing none, roll call please on a positive recommendation. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Wait. Councilor Thorpe? Yes. And Councilor Labarge? Yeah. Okay. That moves forward with the positive recommendation. Uh, last on finance agenda is 20.061 in order to rescind borrowing authority. City Council on June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, in order to rescind borrowing authority, two votes, it says. Ordered that the City Council rescind the following orders because such borrowing authority is no longer necessary. Order 19.081, $650,000 of borrowing authority authorized under the loan order approved on June 20th, 2019 to acquire land formerly known as Pine Grove Golf Course as the bor borrowing authority is no longer needed. Order 18.159, $625,000 of borrowing authority authorized under the loan order approved on September 20th, 2018 for improvements at the Florence Recreation Fields as the borrowing authority is no longer needed. Okay. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz. I'm gonna make a motion. I don't know if we've done one would... yet with the new council, but we're essentially, these are essentially um, borrowing author authorizations that we came to the council uh, for projects um, that we were applying for grants. Um, and we expressed to the council at the time that the borrowing authorization sort of showed the city's investment in the project, but we had no intention of actually borrowing the money. Um, it was part of applying for the grant. Um, and in both cases, we did receive grant funds. Um, and so now we want to rescind that borrowing authority um, because it does, even though we're not planning to use it, it does show up against our, um, you know, as part of our, our overall debt picture, um, because we do have that authority hanging out there that we could utilize. So, um, so these two votes, we would basically like the council to rescind the borrowing authority and sort of take them off the books. Okay, Councilor Quinlan, I think you were about to make a motion. I was going to make a motion. I do make a motion to uh, recommend this to the full council positively. Okay, the motion has been made. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion or questions on rescinding this borrowing authority? Seeing none, uh, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Councilor Thorpe? Yes. Can't hear me? Yep. No. There we go. Yes. Okay. okay. Councilor Labarge? Yes. And Councilor Quinlan? Yes. Okay. That moves forward to full council. Positive recommendation. Uh, that is the entirety of the finance committee agenda. 
move to adjourn finance. Motion has been made by Councilor Quinlan, second by Councilor LaBarge to adjourn finance. Roll call, please. On... Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. And Councilor Shara. Yes. Okay. Finance has been adjourned. And we come back into the full council where we will take up those orders. First up, 20.053, in order to approve FY uh, 2021 general fund budget. So this is gonna this is gonna be a little bit complicated. And we're gonna do things as was sort of indicated before in finance in an unusual way to accommodate Councilor Jarrett's conflict. Um, there's been a lot of discussion with the city solicitor to come up with this plan. So it's gonna be a little bit of a call and response dance. I will tell you what I need and I will need you to make the motions. Um, so the first step on this order is that, um, Oh dear, my my flow chart just disappeared. All's lost. Oh, and here it is. Okay. Um, so, Councillor Jarrett, did you want to speak to this before you remove yourself? Yes. Please let me know um, when I when we are in the phases where I uh, should uh, remove myself. But I can just say that through the Pedal People's contract um, with Central Services that I must step back um, in the areas where we are considering that or the areas where um, we are, you are considering whether to separate the items. Okay. Is that accurate? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so we're at step one of this process, which is one of the steps in which you should remove yourself. Okay. Okay. Um, this is, don't mind me turning. I've now, this is now my third monitor I have to use. Um, so step one is going to be a motion to put the adoption of the FY 2021 general fund budget on the floor for discussion. This is not the order. This is a motion to adopt. Councillor Dwight. I move to put the order on the floor to adopt. We're going to try just, we're just going to tweak that one a little bit. It's, what needs? Take, remove the word order. We're going to say I'm it's sorry. a motion to, uh, a motion to adopt uh, the general fund, but 2021 general fund budget. I move. <laughs> I move to adopt the 2021 budget, the proposed 2021 budget. Second that. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget. Okay, we're up to step two in this process where we need a motion to divide the question to separately consider the $38,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. Wait, wait, I'm, <laughs> wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, everyone hold up for one sec. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, we made that, we, uh, okay, hold on. Laura, help me out. Yeah, yeah, you're doing it right. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, the overall budget's on the floor, and now we're pulling out that one item that um, has a conflict, that there is a conflict on. Okay, so we made the main motion. We haven't voted on the main motion. We're now making yeah. the subsidiary motion. Right. Okay, and okay. And then we'll, yeah. Just checking. You're doing okay. it right. <laughs> okay. So. All right, you're going to you're gonna have to repeat the language by which I end up on my next motion for removal. You've got it. Um, this is a motion to divide the question 
to separately consider the $38,000 line item. I make a motion to uh, separate the item of uh, the $38,000 line item under the, central services. I'm sorry, what am I missing? Parts and maintenance. In parts and maintenance under central services that, con that refers to the contract with pedal people. Yeah. That's not dead on, but it's close enough. That'll. Motion's been Second. made. Second. Who seconded that? Councilor Thorpe. You've all seconded it. Okay, Councillor Thorpe. Great. So that's step two. We vote on that removal? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that the motion okay. Any discussion on that the motion to remove that item? Seeing none, roll call, please. Okay. Um, Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Now I know Councilor Jarrett has removed, I'm not sure if I call his name or if he's already understood to be removed, but um, I, I know that he's gonna be shown as abstaining is from this vote. Right. Um, it's a recusal. Thank you. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Okay. So passes by. Okay. Eight. Okay, so we passed step two. Now we're going to ask Councillor Jarrett to come back for step three. <laughs> there he is. Um, okay, step three is the vote to adopt. So this is that main motion that was first made. So the vote to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget with that $38,000 line item removed from it. Now, again, this is not the order. We will vote again on the order later, but this is where we have the discussion. Oh, thank you, that's in the back. Councillor Dwight. Uh, um, um, a procedural question. I mean, it's all, I, I, I'm pretty confident that um, members are going to want to discuss, particularly the $194,000 plus item in the uh, police budget. And they're going to want to separate that at some point to discuss. And I'm not sure where that comes in this process. Um, if we discuss and vote on the the main uh the main budget now minus uh the the pedal people line item um does that include also parsing out uh the police item am i making myself clear at all does that make sense uh you are and um i uh so attorney Seawald has been hanging on, oh, there he, how'd you know? <laughs> has been hanging around. I've been um, <laughs> I know we went Thank over this many times, moment. but please, here's your moment. Uh, this would be the time to, uh, to discuss uh, anything you might want to uh, discuss with regard to the general fund. Um, I, would, uh, I would envision that you have uh, already discussed uh, all your concerns about the general fund, both the main general fund and the uh, $38,000 line item that's been removed. Um, and then you would just have a vote on the order, which would be more perfunctory in what's needed for DOR. Um, would, would that include, are we required to separate 
the uh, $194,000 plus uh, line item and the police budget that obviously is of, of very of, of great concern. And are we obliged to separate that out or as we um, proceed with the discussion on the vote? Uh, not unless somebody has a conflict that you're wanting to cure. Okay, so uh, that's know, the only, okay. Yeah, that's, you know, the only reason we're doing the, the carve out is, you know, be, to cure the conflict for Councilor Jarrett. Um, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, deductions or amendments to the to the uh to the mayor's budget now's the time to do it okay thank you very much thank you. Next, <laughs> um okay uh i see councillor na okay can you guys if you guys can use the raise hand function that'll just help me remember um i've got councillor nash i, I see councillor jared i see councillor mayori um, we'll get there. So let's start with Councillor Nash. You're unmuted. Thank you. So uh, where uh, where the where did Attorney Seawald go? He's still here. He's still, oh, here. He's still here. Oh, okay. So the the question is: so this hundred ninety four thousand, what is the best way to put it in a package where we can contain it and have the discussion? That I I think that we're pretty clear that that's the, the contentious piece to talk about, we've, we've been hearing about it for the, the last few days. And, um, and so to best move forward, where should, how should we, should we just deduct it or do we set it aside kind of like we did with the pedal people thing? No, I don't think you would set it aside. I think you would discuss whether this is, there are any amendments and I'm not just talking about that particular right. um, line item or those particular line items, um, whatever changes you might want to make to the mayor's budget, now's the time. And there's no reason to segregate it. At, segregate it. Got it. We just put it on the table and discuss it. I would imagine. And so, just to be clear, uh, um, Attorney Seawald, that um, that we can reduce that overall budget, but the mayor can still decide later where reductions can actually happen within, or, or can we specifically say this line item we're, we don't want to fund? Not only can you say that, you must say that. If you want to, to reduce the budget, you have to reduce specific line items so that the auditor knows exactly what's been appropriated. So when contracts or some other thing comes along and she needs to certify the appropriation, she has a basis to know that this is what the appropriation was. Uh, if you're just cutting numbers, she has no idea what line item was cut, what wasn't. Thank you. Um, okay, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. So first, thank you all for going through the machinations of uh, allowing me to participate and represent my constituents on this item. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and launch into the discussion and I'll also speak a little bit uh, about the, um, you know, I think what I see as our options here. Um, so I want to start by first acknowledging the hundreds of people who emailed and called me and everyone who spoke last night and today. I appreciate your testimony and the courage that you all had. Um, I find being a city councilor a wonderful experience and I'm also filled with anxiety to speak out. Uh, I kind of feel like the first time I spoke before the council <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I won't let that stop me and I don't want that to stop you too. So let's fulfill the promise um, of our democratic process and, and hear from all voices. I have been horrified by the murder of George Floyd and by violent actions of police toward black and brown people around the country. Um, the protests we've seen across the nation and here in Northampton demonstrate the built up anger and frustration at continued oppression on top of centuries of systemic racism that deny people of color uh, economic security, safety, and respect. Uh, I'm also humbled and impressed by anyone who will put their lives on the line to protect the public, and our public safety departments do this every day. 
Um, I think the emergency response work that the Northampton Police Department does is crucial. Um, and our police department has and will be undertaking significant steps to be fair uh, and impartial and to, to understand racism and reduce the use of force. And these actions are absolutely necessary. Um, the first person testimony on mistreatment by the Northampton police that we've heard in the hearing yesterday and today was heartbreaking. Um, I do trust the intentions of Chief Casper and it is clear uh, that there is much more work to do. And um, there may be individuals in our police force who don't act appropriately, but I, I do see the bigger question uh, is systemic. And also the any actions that the NPD takes to improve don't get to the core of the problems that our society faces. Uh, economic inequality, racism, addiction, domestic violence, to name a few. And I think it is worth looking at our city's budget from a new perspective. So my questions uh, are, you know, how many of our police officers tasks can be done by people who are not armed uh, with and with with specialized training uh, with better outcomes? I know last night I asked um, Chief Casper how many of the department's calls were related to a mental health issue, and the answer was about one in five, and spoke about a program in Eugene, Oregon, where one in five uh, calls are responded to by mental health first responders rather than police. Um, I researched this further and found articles stating that specifically trained mental health workers, unarmed and not in a uniform, uh, can reach better outcomes with much less cost. Um, and I, it made me wonder, you know, how many of these stories that we heard uh, would have ended differently if we had had a program like this. Um, also, how could reallocation of the funds that we are spending on policing alleviate the problems that policing is needed to solve? Uh, for example, housing. Um, how much does it cost the city to police the unhoused? How much does it cost also the separate but the state to provide health care to people for whom the emergency room is their doctor's office? Would it be cheaper and create much better outcomes uh, to simply house them? So I see this as an opportunity to move something forward that is not new, uh, but becomes clearer and clearer every day that a paradigm shift in our response to social problems is needed. Um, and I say that let's start by level funding the police department. I understand that this will likely require a layoff or reduction in some equipment. Um, and I asked the mayor to increase our social services instead. Other tasks we can take on uh, are to create a body to explore alternatives to policing. Uh, we could start a select committee and work with the mayor to use funds to support and educate it. We can enact legislation to to increase public safety and create policy. Um, we can work to create a civilian oversight board for the police with the power to investigate wrong, wrongdoing independently. So it is the job of our council to provide oversight of the budget and it is entirely appropriate for us to use that power if we believe it is in the best interests of the city. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the mayor could speak to this further, but um, I, I've heard from the mayor, if we do reduce the budget, that he has told me that he will not redirect it, but allow it to go back into the fiscal stability fund. Um, that is his choice, uh, but we can follow our hearts and he can choose to, to act or not in, in that manner. Um, and so then moving to the, my understanding of our process tonight. So if this order does not pass, meaning that four people vote, uh, just vote against it, um, then it will go into effect on July 1st. So too many no votes tonight um, are the same as a yes vote, uh, and there would not be a second reading. Um, I don't feel like I can in good conscience at this time vote yes. If we choose to reduce or reject, we must specify particular line items. The budget uh, is an important document. I have not done the research as to which line items would be appropriate to reduce. Um, therefore, I would wait until the June 18th meeting um, in consultation with the mayor, the police department, and the community as to which line items to propose to reduce to achieve level funding. Um, <clears throat> I, so I guess now I'm turning, uh, you know, a question back is what are our options 
moving forward um, <clears throat> since you know, I, I think we, if we're going to reduce particular line items, we want that to be a very educated, uh, I, uh, you know, decision. And I, I don't feel like we have that. Um, so, if anyone would like to speak to their thoughts on on that, well, thank gonna, you very much. Um, Mayor Narkowitz, I think, wants to speak. I just was going to say, there's there's only three increases to the budget. If you look at the document that you. If you look at the document, you know, the, 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 um, the police uh, narrative, I don't have the page number in front of me, but there's, there's an increase in PS, there's an increase in OM, and there's an increase in OOM. Those are the only three increases to the, do to the budget. So um, level funding, it means you don't give those three increases. That's what level funds the police department budget. I think I need an explanation of what a line item is, because when I... You know, look here, I see um, many items, including all the salaries. Um, let's see. And then, uh, you know, all the salaries and then a, a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, overtime, court time, training, etc. Are those line items or are you saying that there's, it's simply PSOM and OOM? What you're voting on, if you look, you know, if you look the order that Councillor Sierra read through so meticulously was those columns in every department, a PS, an OM, and an OLM. That's kind of what you're voting on. Um, okay. so, and that's what DOR looks at, and that's what the auditor looks at. Um, and there can be movement between those um, PS line items and um, but really, it's the overarching PS, OM, OOM lines that you're, that you're voting on. And that's what the auditor is going to use. And, um, and that's, so that's really what you would be modifying if this order were amended. Okay. Um, so and, you would, I mean, and we would, you, I mean, you would just need to make motions to reduce, you know, or, or, PS, OM, OOM by whatever amounts that you're talking about. Okay. Um, so it, se it seems possible the, then for us to proceed tonight because of- Is the finance director on the line? I don't know. I want to just can- uh, Hold on. Yep. Yes. They, you were voting three numbers for the police department, the PS, the OM, and the OOM. Now, if we wanted to move money from PS to OM or OM to OOM, that requires your vote. But within each of those line items, the more detailed line items can be moved. You know, different expenses can happen. But what we are held to, to carry out is your vote, which is only expend X amount on PS, X amount on OM, and X amount on OOM. Great. So thank you for that clarification. Um, I would love to hear other councilors' thoughts. Um, okay, Councilor Quinlan is next. Uh, thank you. Um, I have. I wanted to make a, a statement, and then I wanted to ask a few questions as well. Uh, I, I woke up this morning um, still pretty tired, um, but also. Uh, feeling like, how do, how do I make my statement on such a complex issue? Um, and after talking with uh, a couple of different people, uh, it just became apparent that what's important is to, you know, exactly what, what Councilor Jared just said, what's important is what's in our heart, what we believe. So I made a statement based on, on that. You know, I'm a lifelong and proud resident of Northampton. Uh, like people last night, I'm also a Cooley baby. I'm a product of Northampton Public Schools. I do believe that Northampton is a progressive and welcoming place. I do believe that all people should be treated justly. Last night, we heard testimony about our police force dehumanizing residents. We also heard testimony dehumanizing members of our police force. I do believe that we have to treat each other as equals and fellow human beings to find common ground. I do believe that our police officers are put into difficult situations when we expect them to do social work which as we've heard seems to be many, if not most of the calls they respond to. I believe we should put social workers into those situations. 
Maybe we should employ social workers as part of our paramedic team. They could be part of an emergency response unit. I do not believe in buying five new police cars when the city is in financial crisis. The current model re reflects a five-year cycle of vehicle replacement. I do believe that could be six or seven years, especially when revenue is tight. I do believe that the budget of this city should reflect the values of this great place. A friend and I were recently talking about how the city is run and he made a great point about the role of the mayor and the role of the council. You don't run the city, the mayor does. Your role is to take people's wishes and make sure the mayor is using the tax dollars to address those wishes. That's our job. In 2018, I went on two business trips that year for my day job, each to visit family businesses, one in Argentina and one in Portugal. These families aspire to be the best they can in their fields. In both cases, the families have crafted 100 year plans to be better. In Argentina, they're only in year 32. The current owner knows she won't be alive to see the process through. In Portugal, they're just in year 12. And again, the current generation will not see the end, but they're taking steps forward, making progress every day that they're at the helm, handing off the baton to the next generation to keep making that progress on that plan. For me, I see a clear first three steps for us to, to take and I'm willing to work hard at them along with all of you as they evolve or change to meet the wants and needs of our community and this council as it chooses. Step one is to reallocate this budget to reflect the needs and desires of this great place. Step two is to think about hiring social workers and mental health experts as part of our paramedic corps. Increase our response to not just medical aid, but mental health aid. And then in step three for me, in 2005, Mayor Higgins enlisted a steering committee to create a comprehensive plan for a sustainable Northampton. Every five years it's revisited and updated with current information. And as Councilor Dwight noted last night, it's a beacon for our central service and planning offices. It found funding from eight organizations to do that work. Last year, the city council created a select committee on pesticide reduction. And that committee worked very hard to create something very special for our community. Tonight, I urge the mayor, our council president, and my fellow councilors to consider enlisting similar panels to study the future of Northampton policing and emergency response, along with how to provide social services to continue the downward trend we see in crime. This panel should be made up of a community members representing people of color, various races, genders, and socioeconomic statuses. It should include the police department. It should include members of our city government and experts in social work, grant-based work, and addiction services. Please join me in trying to be the leadership community we consider ourselves to be. I did have a couple of questions about this, the police department budget for the mayor. Uh, Pop, I can't hear uh, in a sec. What's that? Oh, he's there, okay. I imagine he'll pop back in in a second. Uh, or, or Susan would probably I'm know. I'm gonna unmute well. Susan. Um, uh, Oops, hold on. Okay. It's not letting me. Um... You, we can hear oh, you. There you are. Oh, good. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. You know, uh, I was curious about the line item in OM called police supplies. Uh, I was curious about if we could have a more clear understanding of what that 92,000 might be spent on. In 2019, that was just $58,000. And then last year and this year, it was increased to 92,000. With crime going down, does that number need to be 92,000? I'm just getting to that uh, page. Sorry, Counselor. Oh, thank um, you. Page 52, thank you. Yeah, so basically the, um, the way the supplies break out and we sort of, the, is that you've got the, um, I just want to get to that. Um, uh, 52, sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah. So they've got, they've, they basically put all any, any of their supplies have sort of now been all consolidated into that. And that is everything from, you know, crime scene tape to bat to, to, um, to storage bags, to equipment, to boots, to, uh, replacement batons to, you know, it's, it's the, um, uh, the, the, um, the you know the the roadblock um, uh, saw horses. It's it's basically everything and anything other than the items that are called out in separate um, 
you know, in separate, whether technology or medical testing or gasoline or diesel um, or uniforms, basically it's everything, everything else, um, fingerprinting equipment, all those kinds of things. So it's basically okay. everything is wrapped into that. Um, and they, and we had been buying some of that equipment um, in capital, uh, in the capital budget over time. Sure. Um, as budgets got tight in the, um, you know, in the, in the nineties and early two thousands, um, things that are really just everyday supplies started getting pushed out into the capital plan, um, because it was a way to try to, to, to keep those things going, but the general fund couldn't support it. Um, actually that's sort of what happened with the cruisers and it's what happened with ambulances in the fire rescue department. Um, those used to be, um, in the capital plan, um, because we couldn't, um, afford them in the general fund. Um, but it, because, you know, police cars, you know, and ambulances are such critical parts of their equipment. Like it's not like, and, so, and we're constantly rotating them. They're on the road 24 seven and we're always in a rotational uh, process. We move them into the actual operating budget and we call them out as OM or OOM. So it's, it's basically everything um, that they use to do their job. Okay. Um, and again, that, that number so is uh, so $34,000. Yeah. So part of the increase was some of it moving from the capital plan into the general fund budget. Um, okay. It also includes computer replacements. It, it includes, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's anything that they have to replace vests, you know, all those kinds of things. That's not you know, any, anything that's not uniforms, which is a separate item. And then obviously right. um, gasoline, diesel, those kinds of things. So it is sort of an all encompassing um, item for all of their supplies. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and speaking of gasoline and diesel, I noticed that the allocation's the same as last year. Um, we heard from the chief last night with some pride that there's hybrid vehicles on the road. Should we anticipate not spending as much on gas? We have two hybrids on the road so far, and we were hoping to add um, some more. Um, so we That's have thir two 13% of the fleet. What's that? That's 13% of the fleet. Yeah, I know. I, I just, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what the plan is in terms of, um, I, I don't know how that will, will factor in now that this is being, sure. now that we're changing the, um, the number of vehicles we're purchasing. I don't know. Um, but that's a number I can check with her on that, how she made that calculation. Okay. And then the, the last question I have for you is I just happen to notice, this is just kind of a, a one thing that, that popped off the page at me. There's a $65,000 training line in PS and there's another $65,000 training line in OM. Yes. Wouldn't there be 130 in one? Is there, is there a reason they're divided? I'm, and that was just a curiosity. Yeah. So, um, the, um, when officers, for example, have to do, um, so, so they have to do active shooter training um, uh, twice a year. And so they have, they get called, they basically get brought in uh, like on a weekend um, on, on mass to do that. And so there's a PS part to that as well, because they're paid overtime for that as part of that training. Um, so that has to be paid out of PS. The OM would be bringing in uh, that would be paying for, you know, non-PS related, um, you know, bringing in trainers or the training equipment or those kinds of things. So anything that's paid to personnel um, has to be on the PS side. Um, anything that's paid to a con to a third party or obviously supplies or things like that is paid out of OM. So that's why they're separated that way. Okay. Uh uh, thank you. And, and when when our my fellow counselors are ready to discuss it, I do have some some line item ideas, uh, but I'll, I'll let some other people take the floor. Thank you. Um, next is Councillor Foster. You muted? You're not muted. I'm not muted. I was I was ready to to unmute. Um. So as the other counselors have acknowledged, um, you know, I definitely want to offer some comments regarding um, the funding uh, for the police department. I have received hundreds of emails. My phone's been ringing. Um, it, it's been kind of incredible. Um, and 
it's clear that there is a lot of pain and there is um, a real call for change in action. And I acknowledge that. And, and when I ran for city council, um, one of the things people ask me sort of is, why are you running? Um, you know, and, and I love the city. And honestly, the, the longer and deeper I serve, um, the more impressed I am um, with our city's leadership. Um, it's, you know, sort of each little peek behind the curtain. Um, you know, I really feel um, how much people care here. Um, and I also think on that token that we always need to look and say, here we are in a room and whose voice is not being heard or here we are in Zoom, I guess, in modern times. Um, and, and what we've seen is an outpouring of people whose voices I don't think had been in the room uh, for a long time. Uh, I know that sporadically around issues, um, you know, there's been some outcry, but I have seen people make their first public comment. Um, and, you know, I, I really want to acknowledge that there are people who, who have not been part of these conversations before. And I think that's really critical to pay attention to. Um, I've heard from constituents um, who I know well, who have not made public comment, um, but whose opinions I deeply respect along with people who I've gotten to know over the last couple of days. Um, I've tried to respond to every email that I knew was somebody in Ward 2. Um, that being said, um, one thing I heard mentioned repeatedly during comment was about um, sort of there not being a need to fund the contractually obligated uh, pay raises that we have. Um, I'm a supporter of unions. And also I believe that people who work in public service need to be paid for their service and policing is a public service. Um, if we look at not honoring, or, or if it's not, I know I recognize legally it's not on the table, but the idea of not honoring a contract or not paying people who work in public service their value, what that does is it means then that public service jobs are only open to people from privileged backgrounds. And I don't think that's the direction we're going for. Um, people who need to earn wages commensurate with experience, people who need to support families, need to earn wages for their public service jobs. And that's something I respect and I believe is really worth um, investing in people. Um, we also have multiple priorities. Um, you know, one of the, the very biggest issues people talked to me about um, early on was climate change and climate change can't wait. Um, people are deeply, deeply concerned about it. And so I recognize the line item increase request um, in the proposed budget to convert from gasoline to hybrid powered cruisers. It's not, um, it's not something, it's not a flight of fancy that sounds good. It's something that's actually helping us meet goals of this city, which is to Im um, improve our climate impact. Um, so I'm just sort of naming the priorities I see, and I don't think that they're competing with each other, but the way it's been sort of laid out um, has been in competition. Um, I also come, I think most people know, I come from a social services background. I have worked with at-risk youth. I've worked with people who've been incarcerated. I used to be a public school teacher. Um, I work in human services now. And the research is incredibly clear that funding for human services reduces the need for, um, policing for the criminal justice system. Um, the research is there, the numbers are there. Um, and, and I do believe that that's very, very clear. Um, there are alternative models of policing. Um, there is the option for social workers or mental health specialists, addiction specialists to respond to many of the calls that we're asking our police officers to respond to. And they're doing it. Um, and they're requesting training to be better at these jobs. And I think that's impressive. I also think that there are people with these skill sets um, who could do that well. That being said, I want to express um, that I have a deep appreciation for Chief Casper. Um, she is listening. Um, she, I have seen her um, be willing to consider these issues. Uh, I've seen her want to work with our community. And I believe it's very important uh, to show that respect and appreciation um, for her work and her values. Um, and I believe she's somebody that we can work with on reform. And that's something that, that I think is an exciting opportunity that we have uh, here in Northampton. Um, and also um, just wanted to reiterate, I've heard other counselors mention this, the Massachusetts uh, Black and Latino Legislative Caucus has called for municipalities to consider establishing civilian oversight 
um, committees to look at policing. I fully support that. Um, I believe that there are ways that we can bring all of these messages together and that we can look at reforming policing. Um, I also recognize that it can't happen on a dime and yet the pain for communities of color that we've heard um, for people who, who don't feel safe for their current policing system, there is an urgency to that and I respect that and I hear that. I also don't feel good about say making a large cut to a police budget without an alternative plan in place for how we're going to handle these services that the police are currently handling. Um, so I view this as a process um, and it's, it's something that, that I have really heard um, and I'm committed to being a part of this process. Um, I guess that's all I wanted to say as we take this up. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe, you Thank are you. unmuted. Thank you. I, I don't want to uh, re reiterate too much of what everyone has said before me. I, I appreciate and respect all the counselors and what they've just, uh, what they've said. Um, who would have predicted where we would be at today? Who uh, in the state we're in? And what we are witnessing is nothing new. From the Watts riots in California in 1965, Rodney King in the 1992 riots, to Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Eric Gardner, Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and numerous others before them. This is nothing new. And I want to make it clear, I respect Chief Casper and the work the department does. And uh, a lot of people know the work I do, uh, being in probation. And uh, I do have a lot of respect for that department. I have a, a lot of good collaboration with a lot of police departments in the area. As a council, I ask that we come together to really try to implement some of the ideas that we have been seeing in our emails, from looking at mandating new approaches to the safety of members of our community, reform policies to improve interaction and de-escalate, doing the real anti-racist work that goes beyond training and requires a leadership team that is willing to do the work and people willing to educate themselves. I cannot do this alone. And to um, reiterate with um, Elisa Klein, former counselor Elisa Klein said, we need to address institutional racism in concrete ways. I truly appreciate everyone who attended last night's um, hearing and spoke and, and is here with us this evening and has spoken. So. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, going over the budget. And I can tell you that my my first concern was the uh, increase in vehicle costs. So uh, I, we have some discussion to do. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Mayori. Unmuted. Yeah. Well, I will say that I had a lot more to say um, and because of the late hour and because of the real eloquence of our engaged residents who have been so dedicated over the last you know, few days through email and calls and, um, and here with us, I don't really feel like I wanna, I need to say it all. I think a lot's been said. What I would I would like to say is that I do have a, I have a lot of compassion around this budget process. Um, you know, listening to Superintendent Provost describe make, making a projected budget, you know, with whether the override passes or doesn't, and then um, with the pandemic, and then with the delayed override. I mean, you know, there's. I think there's been a lot of uh, mastery, you know, in this case, especially around. Um, the school, the school budget. Um, so, and I, I think the budget was made in earnest and and with thoughtfulness. But things are changing fast, and uh, and we're also really needing to listen to our residents. I also want to note that I am concerned about uh, the super superintendent provost really made a case for concerns about per personal protective equipment uh, for schools, and that that's an issue. And so I really think we, yeah. So I would like to say that I've, I, residents who, who talk to us, I hear you. Um, and I think we owe it to our community to take this opportunity and reset our priorities and align our budget with our values. Um, and to be incredibly cautious now with with how we, how and what we fund, 
in a time when so many are suffering and sacrificing. I mean, we just heard how some, I think Smith College therefore going raises so no one would have to be laid off. Um, there are painful, you know, but necessary cuts happening from the senior center to the mayor's office. And that's the framework we're working in now. And um, I think we need to really hold that when we're thinking about this. Um, I, I, as well, um, think what's needed is some bold action and not, I've heard the pain um, that residents have expressed, the, the negative and, and terrible experiences often um, in the city. I'm, I think beyond that, the issue to me is the systemic nature of, um, of, of policing and the, the systemic racism that we all hold, including um, police departments. So when I, what I, I, when I'm hearing people, what I want to make clear is that I am looking for alternatives to policing, not just progressive policing. And if we have civilian review boards, um, and we, we have a task force that looks at alternatives to policing, there has to be some amount of independence to these boards, and they have to be funded, and they have to have some authority, or it's just going to be. Um, I'm afraid it won't, it will fall flat. Uh, you know, we've seen bold moves, people have mentioned in LA, reducing the budget, the, the police department budget by a hundred million um, and specifically reallocating the money to invest in communities of color, those being policed. Um, so I, yes, I think we, should, we need to consider um, police insurance and all sorts of options. And we need this task force to think about that. But I, at this point, I am not satisfied that uh, with this proposed budget, that's the current proposed budget we have, I am not satisfied uh, with the direction it's taking us in. And I believe we can do better. I have a question about a line item. Um, at some point we can answer it now or other people can speak and then I could ask it. Well, I'll put it out there and then we can decide. Um, it's about the, I, I want some clarification on the the, vac the assistant sergeant vacancy for $74,000. I know um, Chief uh, Casper um, explained some of that in her um, budget statement, but I would like clarification on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan, I saw you appear. Did you wanna answer that or I don't see Mayor Narcos yet. Oops, there. there we go. Uh, yep. Okay, good, sorry about that. Just had to wait for that box to come up in the middle. Um, I, I didn't hear the, the end of the question, Counselor. Lauren, she'll get her box. There we you always go. do that thing where we both like unmute and mute. Sorry, um, yes, I was um, wondering, I, I, I remember, I know that Chief Casper addressed uh, something about that line item, but I'd like um, clarification. The um, assistant sergeant, seventy-four thousand dollars on page fifty-one. Seventy-five, excuse me, can't read. Seventy-three to five-seven. Um, halfway down the halfway down the list there. I guess I'm asking about this vacancy and whether we should be filling it at this point. Uh, I, I'm not sure I see uh, uh, administrative sergeant. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a it's a position that um, is is currently vacant, um, most likely due to promotion. So um, that's yeah. That there and frequently they they do have vacancies um, sometimes due to injuries, um, sometimes due to promotions, sometimes you know. There's, there could be patrol officer vacancies because they're waiting for someone to go through the academy and get certified. Um, I'm not really sure I know what your question is. Um, the question um, that we're talking about tonight is, um, again, your, your role is to cut the budget, not to cut individual positions. So you would, if you, if you cut the budget, then we'll have to cut positions. Uh, if you cut the PS line item, uh, then we'll yeah. have to cut positions. So thank you, Mayor. I, I, I was just confused about uh, what was Alex had alluded to before about the idea of cutting in line items. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, because that would be, um, yeah, that would not, you know, cutting individual positions on this list would not really be something, um, yeah, it would be more cutting, cutting 193,000 or cutting 100,000 out of the uh, budget would re will require eliminations of positions. So that's, um, that's, that's just the way it would work. We still have to pay the contractual obligations. So the way to, to do that is to eliminate positions to be able to afford to meet those contractual obligations. So that's sort of the way in PS that it would work. So whether it's a vacancy or it's a vacant or it's a vacancy and a um, um, and an existing officer or officers that that but that's all that that's also controlled by you know seniority and other sorts of things. So it's not that specific. So okay, thank yep. you. That that clears it up. Thank you. Okay, um, I just want to do a quick clarification. I think I'd heard Councillor Quinlan mention this word earlier. It's been mentioned many times. Um, reallocate, just just to be clear, um, so we cannot reallocate anything within the budget, right? So we can just. I was I was using the paper we. Oh. <laughs> okay, just just so everyone understands, uh, Councillor Labarge. Councillor uh, Shira, um, this is a question for the mayor, please. In the um, the Northampton Police Department, the largest portion, which is stating here, of that increase is forty five thousand four hundred and sixty five thousand, which is vehicle cost, Mayor. Is there any way that we could hold off on those vehicles because I don't find that to be an urgent, urgent situation here? We have a senior center that have elderly people. We need to get transportation or a van available for them to pick up the elderly people during the COVID crisis happening here. And to me, at this $45,465, I'm pretty sure that for some reason, the department of our, our police department would agree with the COVID virus, what it has, the crisis that it has brought in our city, that the vehicles can be placed off to the side for a while and let's use that money and help our elderly at the senior center by using a van, taking them to medical and also shopping for food or wherever we could use this to help our community. I'm just very concerned about right now taking that 45,000 and just putting it down for vehicles when we know to me that's not critical. It's the community, it's the people, our elderly, who have all been living here under fear. And now we're having problems with all the emails. We I have never received so many emails as long as I've been a counselor. I have a total of 375. And even when I had a person here tonight, the other night I had phone calls coming off from residents about how upset they are with the police department. I have never had a problem with the police department, I have to say that, but I have a nephew of color and has had problems and who was targeted at when he was younger. And you don't forget things like that. And I am just very, very concerned here of hearing the strong voices that every one of us received on our emails and your phone calls. And I have never heard those strong voices like that in 21 years. And it hit me right in the heart. In the heart. I want to hear those voices. That's my job as a counselor. And they're asking us to do something. I, I don't know anything about the salaries. I think the mayor can explain that to all of us. 
if for some reason the salary part of it or the increase can be put on a hold, just like we did with the proposition two and a half for the moratorium. But I'm concerned of money here in the police department buying vehicles to me, that is not a necessity right now. Right now, it is the people living here in our community and it's our job to help them. So figure it out at $45,000, that's a lot of money. Let's take a look at another $8,000 for training. Yes, training is important, very important, but it is our job to help our community. The voices are telling us to come forth and help them. So yes, we can look at this budget. We cannot increase it, but we can decrease it and say, well, we'd like to use this money, Mayor, or the department or the police department for these items that we feel that are of importance to the people here in the city of Northampton, or if not, bring it or give it to the schools. That's our job right now. We're hearing the voices. And I think it's serious. It's very, very serious here. And I think, and I also feel that, and I've heard it, and I've heard it not just the past couple of days, for a while, about having social workers being involved here in the city. And I think that is extremely detrimental here. Social workers and healthcare workers, which is like the problems we've had with our homeless on the streets. I don't think police should be involved in that. I think it should be social workers, people who are educated, very, very educated. That's their careers. And I also think there should be some form of a committee that is formed, or if not a consultant be hired on which way that the, the police department should be going in what direction because I think after what I have seen with my eyes and, and what's going on, I mean, people are so upset with our police department and we got to straighten it out. Hear the voices. I hope you counselors make the right move because I know where my heart is. I'm going to help my community out and they need it. They need it bad. $45,000 is very, very serious here for our seniors at a very bad time of the year. So thank you very much. Okay, let's let, uh, let's let Mayor Narkowitz answer. Thank you. Um, so I guess I want to sort of take this in separate parts. Um, so the senior center, um, obviously we the senior center, we own vans, like we, we own vans. The reason, we're, the reason we don't have a transportation program right now um, is because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And so the van program stopped very early on in the program, in, in, in the crisis, um, largely because people weren't using the service for obvious reasons, people weren't, and also our drivers were all retirees themselves who are high risk. So the senior center is closed right now. And so several of the programs that, um, that were obviously running prior to COVID-19 have shut down. We're no longer, people aren't able to come to the senior center. We're not able to um, offer the meals that we were providing at the senior center. Um, and we, um, and our, we do, we've maintained all the core staff, the, the full-time core staff are still working and they're working remotely and sometimes working within the center. Um, and they're, they're, um, working incredibly hard to do a lot of outreach to seniors. They're, they're doing hundreds of phone calls every week to seniors. Um, they're doing online programming. They're doing Zoom activities for seniors. They're teaching seniors how to use Zoom. Um, uh, uh, Marie Westberg is working on uh, grants to, um, to obtain um, iPads and, uh, and, and other technology for seniors who don't have access to it. Um, so we're fully committed. The challenge is, and I think I'd said this before, um, you know, seniors are the most vulnerable population here in the COVID crisis. They have been, hurt, they have been um, uh, those who've, who've had the most fatalities in Massachusetts of those who've tested positive for COVID-19 have been people 60 years and older, which is exactly sort of the senior center population. 
Um, so we don't know when, if, and when the senior center will open. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, our recreation programs for the summer are not going to happen. Um, our pool's not going to be able to open uh, this summer um, because of the new regulations and because of the school issues around COVID-19. And the senior center, again, I don't know when it will open. I don't believe, um, I personally don't see a way that we'll be able to safely open it um, by the end of the year, um, just given the situation. So we've made reductions there. Um, a lot of those are revolving fund type programs um, and obviously no one's using the programs right now. So we, we are working though on a transportation program um, utilizing taxis, um, which are safer than the van service. And we don't have all the issues with us having to disinfect vans as well as find drivers who are not seniors. Um, and we're also working on some volunteer rides program, which we've always had that program as well. So we are working on a transportation program. So it's not a matter of needing vehicles for the vans. It's just more of an operational issue and the fact that we're in the situation we're, we're in right now um, with regard to the senior center. So that's the senior center issue. So it's not that there's a need for more money uh, to pay for vans from OM. So taking OM, uh, again, you if you believe that we should not um, purchase additional cruisers, then you should vote um, to, to cut that OM out of the police budget. Um, but that's not the issue with the van program. It's not a vehicle issue. It's really the COVID-19 issue that is the problem. Question for you. I think here I have it going. You're there. Oh, cannot hear you. You're not muted, but we cannot hear you. You're now muted. I'm going to unmute you. You're unmuted. Okay. I wanted to speak to the mayor. Yes. He's listening. Oh, okay. Mayor, okay, you're saying up to 45,000, we don't need bands or anything like that, but our city needs help. So what about like the schools? We could use that money for the schools. I mean, why are these four or five vehicles so critical right now when we know the schools need the money, definitely need the money? And why couldn't we just take that 45000 and bring it to the schools? So I guess, Councillor, the process we, um, am I muted? Okay, no, make sure good. I'm not muted. So, I mean, the process is I submit a budget to you um, and then the council scrutinizes it. And if you believe that we're overspending in certain areas, you have the right to cut that and delete items. Um, and so I'm not really, I'm here, I'm not, I'm here before you answering questions, but I'm, this is not a, um, it's not an interactive process where we're moving money around together. It's really your, you, you um, have the ability to make cuts to the budget. And, um, and I'll obviously honor those that need to be made. Um, so, you know, that I, I think I've spoken my budget message about the commitment I've made to the schools. And if you go down, in the in the revenue um, in the expenditure summaries, because um, I know I've heard people talk about uh, you know the budget. You'll see that I mean schools is the largest uh, the single largest expenditure increase in the budget. Um, and if you look at the education uh, line item as a percentage, um, you know it's almost five percent. It's four and a half percent. It's four point four eight percent. And that's not on six million dollars. That's on you know that's on a you know almost where is that number? Um, uh, you know, that's almost forty million dollars of that of that general fund budget. So it's the largest we have. We have, and and part of what I tried to do by making these other cuts in the general fund was to try to not have to make any cuts to the schools and to give them as much funding as we could. So I mean, I feel like, you know, I feel like 
obviously this budget was delivered on May 18th. Someone made the reference earlier that we're in a different place. I think it was Councilor Thorpe. I mean, this budget was delivered on May 18th. Some have implied that I delivered it, you know, in response to what happened in Minneapolis or something like that. And I mean, I'm just as, uh, as upset and angry about what happened in Minneapolis, but I do take issue with people that say that I'm, you know, my reaction to it was to increase the police budget because that is not, that is just not accurate. Uh, this is the budget that I submitted, um, may, making the recommendations that I feel were in the best interest of the city, obviously, you know, we're in a different place now. And so people have a different view of that. And I respect that. And so, but in terms of what you want to do this evening, um, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about any of these um, items. Veterans is another one I would ask uh, to talk about because I've heard the idea that, uh, that we're cutting veterans uh, services. Um, and if you actually go to the veteran service uh, budget, you'll see that we're increasing PS and we're increasing um, um, OM, really the only change in that budget which causes the decrease is that there's one, there's one light item, um, which is our benefits line item. And that's the benefits that we pay out and then we get reimbursed every year um, by, the, by the state, 75%. Um, and those benefits have been going down, the amount of benefits that we've been dis dispersing, it's all based on how many veterans are out there. Um, and so we, we update that number every, every, you know, every so often to represent a three-year average. So if you look at that budget, it's really just that one line item that has gone down and it's because that number has gone down. Um, and so we've lowered it to be, to be a representation of the three-year average, but everything else in the veteran, no staff are leaving the veterans services department. Um, it, they're getting increases in their PS, they're getting increases in other parts of their OM, um, but it's because that other item um, is going down, uh, you know, th that, it, that it's um, showing a decrease for veterans. But, you know, Mr. Connor submitted this budget. He understands, he understands, you know, that this is to represent those, um, those benefits accurately. Um, you know, public health, we're, you know, I heard somebody say earlier, we should be putting more towards health. We're increasing the public health budget by 46%. Um, because we understand that what we're in right now is a public health crisis. So we're trying to divert resources to public health. So that's an area that we're increasing exponentially because, um, you know, because we've seen what our public health department um, was already doing, but now has to do during this crisis. So, um, you know, our arts and our libraries were holding harmless, um, schools holding harmless. So, you know, we've tried to make and, and, and I was quite clear, we were trying to maintain public safety and, and, and fund level service public safety budgets, which is what I'm doing. This is not an expansion of our police department. We're not adding any officers. We've had the same number of sworn officers probably for the last 20 years. Um, so this is not an expansion. It is maintaining level services. Um, and that was the goal, was to maintain level services in our three public safety um, departments. Um, we have made strategic cuts, even that we've made cuts in public works. But if you look at the public works uh, budget, um, you know, the public works budget, even with the cuts we've made is still going up almost 3%. Uh, but we have made strategic cuts there, again, trying to lower that overall um, bottom line, um, so that we don't, um, so that we, and again, if you read the Boston Globe today, you know, there's a story about the, the, the dire sort of the, four, the fourth quarter uh, revenue numbers that are coming in for the state. And they're about two and a half billion now behind where they need to be. So, you know, I fully anticipate that when the legislature finally screws up its courage to actually try to pass a budget for FY 2021, that we may have to come back. I may be coming back to you to make more cuts. Um, again, th and that was sort of what I was trying to convey to you. So, if you believe that that um, there's more cuts that need to be made, and it partic particularly as it relates to the police department, and you feel that you want to make a um, you know uh, level funding the police department it is the message that the council wants to send. That is that is completely your purview, and so and I've explained how you would do that. You would basically reduce 
those three, you know, PS, OM, and OOM um, by the increased amounts, um, and then that would be the process. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Dwight has been waiting patiently. I'm sorry, it's it's 125, and I'm, I'm going to spare a lot of lot of noise from me, but it's it, at the risk of stating the obvious. I mean, we, we're in the midst of a zeitgeist shift. I, and there's an opportunity for us to seize the moment. I mean, I've called it the great recalibration. I think that, you know, it's not just, in, this is what I tried to say in my question, well, in my in my comments to uh, Chief Casper, it's, it's not about this $200,000 necessarily. We're talking about, a, 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 at least in this country, a universal uh a dramatic change in inspiration by the public to to change what it means to police and to be police. Uh, I you know I, I I was genuinely moved, like all of us, and I was really gratified by the unprecedented outpouring of, of the citizens motivated to engage us, inspired by their their very real distress. I. I I also want to say that, you know, during the course of these, the advocacy, they were driven by passions, and we've experienced these passionate conversations before. And it, 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 for a lot of people, it, 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 well, it, you know, the, some of the comments are designed to hurt. They do hurt. They, 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 if we prick us, we do bleed. And I just want to say that every member here in this council is devoted to the process of public service and they're governed by their conscience. Um, we are moved by the amount of phone calls and the uh, amount of uh, emails, obviously, that, that particularly in this case, they were so, the enormity is unprecedented, as I said, but and I, but I, I would encourage any one of you to run for office, not as an act of retaliation, but because you're inspired to serve, just like the members who are sitting here. And I hope the energy displayed tonight is to be engaged and contribute that we've witnessed over the last couple of meetings it sort of translates into community members stepping up and working to serve our community, just as, just as uh, I, I mean, if to harness these passions and to harness these concerns and to capitalize, if you will, on the fact that as many people said, it's the first time they've ever participated in a city council meeting or even witnessed one. And by the way, I would I'd like to point out, this is not an average, these are not average meetings by any stretch. They do run much shorter as a rule. And so don't let that discourage you. But the fact is, is that if you want to be a counselor, please run. Uh, and and uh, the thing with the budget, former Mayor Claire Higgins actually famously described this budget, and I bring this up every time, as a moral document. It is a reflection of our priorities, the things that we value and hope for. And there has been a significant change in those priorities, depending on who you talk to, of course. And it, it seems to me, based on what I've heard so far of everyone talking, uh, that it seems very likely that that the police department, this go around, will be level funded as uh, uh, the ultimate outcome. And I'm, I'm in favor of that, actually. Um, Although Council Jarrett makes a, a, an excellent point about our need to be precise before we commit to the vote, because if we vote the budget in toto down, then it basically we're we're cutting off our noses to spite our face, and there uh, and because of the way these things are processed, it uh, it would not work to anyone's satisfaction, um, particularly the people who have, have, have testified to us. Uh, over the past few days. Your Honor, I think it's appropriate that we should point out, I mean, we heard people say over and over and over again that we should rechannel these monies into supplying housing, 
to fund tapestry, for instance, to um, uh, create subsidies and and the like. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because as I understand it, we cannot allocate tax dollars that we take for departments and then allocate them outside beyond uh, uh, to agencies beyond our control other than grant funds. But uh, I'd appreciate it if you, you actually touched on that a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly we can't appropriate monies to to private agencies or, or private, you know, we have, we do, we, we do give money to many of the agencies that I heard mentioned. Um, it's primarily through our two major grant programs, um, the CDBG program, Community Development Block Grant Program, um, and we give money through the, um, through the CPA, obviously, uh, people apply, particularly in the area of affordable housing, uh, through CPA dollars. Um, so um, at, at this point, uh, yeah, certainly there's not a, there cannot really be a direct appropriation. Um, you'd have to do some kind of a grant process or or a contract. You know that would be the other thing. You know, contracting with um, with a, with an agency. Um, so um, the only other instance I can think of is obviously the Whiting Trust, where we. But that's again part of a a trust that has a specific purpose of giving funds to um, so. Yeah, so it's it's not I you could not put a line item um, to um, you know tapestry or service net in the um, in the city budget. That's just not that that wouldn't work on a number of different levels. And it is, I mean, it, it, this is part of the frustration because I understand um, you know people these seem like elegant solutions that when people propose them and they weren't thinking at home and they're they're just you know working things out on a napkin, trying to figure out what's the best way to allocate funds in order to um, to augment or offset um, uh, the, you know, the police involvement. But the fact is that we are limited by mass general law and a number of other constraints. And, um, but I think, and I know that you've heard it and we've all heard it, that, that there is, Actually, to to allude back to uh, former Councilor Klein, who who uh, always spoke with great passion about these things, and actually uh, makes a good point, and and that, and it's also embedded in in the language of the resolution that we will that will come up in in uh, in new business at four o'clock in the morning. Um, that uh, there has to be a conversation. That's not only monitored and instigated by us, because I think it has to be, there has to be, because our status as elected officials confers upon us some, some kind of authority. I would prefer the community where everyone's on equal footing, that we don't set the agenda. The agenda, we participate in an agenda set by others, by members of the community. But I also think that it's also important for us to, um, to create our own committee to review and to consider and discuss what it is, these very big questions and discussions that, that need to be had. And then with solutions that hopefully evolve from that and with policies and changes and ordinances and, uh, and, and uh, executive decisions on these things, I, I look forward to that conversation. It was multi, uh, multiple conversations uh, by through multiple agencies. So um, I, I, I would like if we could, and I, I know that maybe other counselors who want to speak, but I, I like if we could, if we could move on this, because I think it's actually somewhat, I'm going to make a presumption this is already a foregone, foregone conclusion. Um, there are people who have been sitting up very late uh, watching from the gallery, and then there's those of us who are participating in this uh, with a, a rather large agenda. But I, I think it's a, a suffice. I think hopefully people feel moved to at least appreciate the fact that they were heard. We understand, and we are we are committed to one um, address this two hundred thousand uh, dollar this hundred ninety four thousand dollar 
uh, uh, difference and then also to go beyond that. It's not, it doesn't just stop at the end of this budget discussion because this is, this is the catalyst of the conversation. Well, actually, the catalyst is even greater than what we're experiencing in the rest of the country and what we have experienced and the cumulative impact that has finally inspired a nation to rise up and reject what has been normal and change it to something that is more aspirational. So um, there I, I went and said that I was going to be brief and I wasn't even close to brief. And I would just ask that, um, uh, you know, maybe if we could cut to the chase and I'm more procedurally concerned, actually relative to what Council Jared pointed out, I don't, I don't want to botch this. And I think, I, and Councilor Jarrett's absolutely right. We have to be very precise about what it is that we're planning on excising and very clear. Um, and I don't think we can get away with just saying level funding, um, the, those three pillars of the budget. Um, we actually have to uh, stipulate amounts. So anyone who's willing to work towards that ASAP would uh, be much appreciated. Mayor. The three amounts are the three amounts that are in the um, in the budget narrative on page 51. Um, that's right. So the, the three amounts, the, the, the three amounts that Chief Casper was explaining and I was explaining and it's the, the PS increase, it's the OM increase and it's the OOM increase. So the way to level fund the budget is to not increase it. So those are the three proposed increases. Uh, is Solicitor Seawald still with us? Only in Northampton does the mayor give instructions on how to cut his budget. I, I yeah. absolutely agree. Only in Northampton. Uh, and, and, and I have to say, I am very grateful. And I, and, and, and I very much appreciate your explanation and your patience with this. And, and, and I do appreciate your collaboration as well. Here's the uh, solicitor. Solicitors here. Uh, I, Alan, I have to say that I'm not looking at the budget at this moment. No, no, I understand. Um, I'm trying to find in the narrative here the actual precise numbers. Uh, ba, 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 ba. They're in the upper right hand corner of page 51. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There I am. I'm looking at page 50, which is why I wasn't finding it. Um, all right. So those totals are to, uh, from PS 140,000. Is that 42? Yeah. And then from OM $8,000 and $8,072. My glasses aren't working at all. And OOM is 45000 Four hundred and sixty-five, right? Your glasses okay. aren't working because you're not wearing them. No, I know. When I wear them, they don't work at all. They make it worse. I, okay. I'm, I'm, I can't even see the page. They're great glasses. I recommend buy your glasses online. Really brilliant. Anyway, um, so if, so the, those would be the three line items that you would want to uh, reduce as an amendment to the mayor's budget. All right, so would it be appropriate for me now to advance an amendment to the mayor's budget, uh, reducing those numbers that I just recited? Because please don't make me them again. But um, so I can't uh, hear him. Oh, all right. So I'm hearing, I'm getting lots of hands waving at me. Um, and Council of the Barge can't hear you. So let's. Uh, Councilor Nash has actually been waiting for a very long time. Um, let's go to, hold on, go to Councilor Nash. Um, I don't know if people have other suggestions before you make a motion, but everyone got very active. Okay. okay. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I'm going to demonstrate how to be brief and uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, I, a lot has changed. Uh, just, uh, I, it might have been 10, 12 days ago, I had a discussion with uh, Chief Casper. Uh, there's been 
during public comment, we've had people calling in from my ward requesting more police presence around their apartment building. It's a public housing building. And that, um, and that you know, I, I, we spent about a half hour on the phone talking about how to improve uh, uh, enforcement uh, within the, the residents over at Cahill Apartment. And, um, and uh, at the end, we, we spoke for about a half hour and at the end, Chief Casper, you know, said, you know what, Jim, you know, that a, a lot of this has to do with that, you know, that people have emotional issues and we get called for everything, you know, and that they, that she said, you know, there's times where, you know, we know the person and we're contacting, you know, CSO or we know their case manager and we're actually, we're trying to get the right people in there. But there's times where you just don't know where it's, is, is it a criminal justice issue or is it something where you can actually just make that phone call to, you know, to have a caseworker go out? And this is all to say that Chief Casper in the NPD is well aware of what it is we're talking about. And that what, part of what's gone on over the years is there's been a drop in, uh, in the funding for those particular programs, that they used to be more robust, that there used to be a lot more programming going on here in Northampton. We used to have, we used to have a social security office uh, that, and so what that means is that for our police department, that more of that stuff is falling on their table. And that, and I, I think this is a conversation that the, the NPD would be interested in having because uh, frankly, part of what's going on is just the, the mission creep for what we're asking our police officers, officers to do has just gotten so broad. You know, I, I, if there's a bank robbery, I, I think we need a bank, we need a police officer showing up at that event. Um, if it's somebody who um, needs some uh, consolation and is maybe off their medication, maybe it's not a police officer. And, and we can talk about how to build those programs. But the thing is, those those programs actually exist in our community. They they've dwindled over the years, and um, but the NPD would be interested in having this discussion. So um, the um, boy, it's late, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, the, the other thing I want to say, uh, two, three other things. I want to thank everybody who showed up and and shared um, information with us, and and their and their ideas. I really enjoyed yesterday afternoon. I tackled about 30 phone calls with young people. And, you know, we had some of them running 20, 30 minutes on the phone uh, talking about different ideas. I have a whole list I, that, I, that I'll come to when we have that committee, if we, if, once we get it started, that um, uh, I, I've got a list to bring as, as you all do. Um, the other thing is I wanna thank my colleagues on council here. I, I was anticipating like, oh, how are we gonna to come together on this? And, and as Councilor Dwight has pointed out that we have all, I, I can sense the consensus here. And the other thing is I really appreciate the five new colleagues first stepping up to the plate in the discussion here. I, I wanna congratulate you for all doing that. Um, uh, and the last thing before I give things up and we move on to really tackling this, I want to do a shout out to uh, Councillor Shara for the way she has led this very, very difficult discussion. I mean that um, she has projected the, the, the facade that the open, you know, door that we want to have as our council. And I think people have felt heard and welcomed and multiple opportunities to, to speak with us. So really nice job, GL. And I'm gonna give up the floor with, let's make a motion and let's get something done. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you for those kind words. Um, now I feel really bad about uh, thanking you for your illustration of brevity, which was not very brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I am. <laughs> okay, where are one. we? 
<laughs> Councillor, um, I know that there was like a lot of hands before. Uh, Councillor Mayori, I see. Councillor Jarrett, I had seen a hand. Uh, uh, Councillor Quinlan's hands now up. Okay, I'm going to go to Councillor Mayori, then if Councillor Jarrett wants, and then we'll go to Councillor Quinlan. But um, yeah, we do need to talk, guys. It's 1.45. Um, I, I really feel for Laura. So this is now Laura's second night doing this. So Laura, like we're sitting, there's a lot going on, but Laura is literally typing nonstop. Oh, um, this is her second okay. night. Don't worry about me. <laughs> I personally have pretty much not moved from this spot for 18 hours. So we, and there are things that we must do on this agenda this evening. Um, uh, Councilor Maori. Yes, good. Yes. Um, I hear you on this, but to me, this is just an important point and um, we can move on, which is if we are really serious about making change, we can't just talk about level funding the police department. We really need to talk about what we're, and it doesn't have to be all right now, but we need to talk about reallocation. And I hear that we're, that's not our jobs to some extent. I, um, I would urge the mayor to, to not just put the money back in the stabilization fund, but to think about um, moving it to schools and social services. And I would certainly be inclined to, um, to support that. Um, and I just want to, on this vein, just because I've had this confusion and bear with me, I was looking at the Bureau of Municipal Finance Law. I, I would like maybe Solicitor Seawald could answer this. It says, may the city council add items to the annual budget without a recommendation of the mayor. A city council may only add an item when there is no recommendation of any kind for that particular spending purpose in the mayor's budget. And if it follows procedures found in G, um, general law 44, section 33, recommendation, um, and it says, if no recommendation of any kind has been made for an item on or purpose the city council considers necessary, the council must vote to request that the mayor make a recommendation for appropriation for that purpose. So my dream, yeah, I would like to see that 130,000 and change go to a Department of Transformative Justice. So I'm kind of curious about this, this stipulation here, uh, Solicitor Seawald. I know it's a long uh, time, so I really wanna hear, I just wanna hear this one thing. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's not something I'm gonna answer off the cuff. Um, I'm not really sure what a Department of Restorative Justice is and who would be in control of it. I don't really know what, no, what exactly the, that no, is. No, the point is just this. I'm just talking I, about our ability to reallocate in this, in the, which is part of the municipal finance law. Let me, I, I'm going to have to look into and research. I'm not going to answer off the cuff. Okay. Sure. I can send you what I'm looking at. Um, okay. Thank happy you. to look at it. No problem. Can't wait for my department. <laughs> um, okay, it was Councillor Quinn. No, Councillor Jarrett. Sorry, sorry. Councillor Jarrett, then Councillor Quinlan. Um, I was just ready to make the amendment, uh, you know, to, to state the specific language that we needed. But um, let's hear from other folks if they want to speak before we actually make that amendment. Okay, I see that Mayor Narkowitz popped back here, I don't know if you wanted, maybe that was inadvertent. <laughs> An inadvertent popping, it happens. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to address what counselor, oh, yeah. he disappeared. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that means he did not. Uh, counselor what Quinlan. The, what was the what? question? I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was missing. What, oh, what was the question? Um, I didn't know if you were going to um, say something to what Councillor Maori had said that then Councillor Seawald said he he was gonna. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all I can say is, um, you know, we have the charter, which is a state law that governs Northampton. So I, I don't, I'm not familiar with what um, is in the municipal finance guide. That might be something I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but the charter is very clear on the process that we follow. In Northampton, um, and you know, furthermore, the charter is also clear about how agencies are created, and they're not created by an appropriation of the city council. They're created by an administrative order of you know that emanates from the mayor and then gets approved by the city council. So, um, and the charter is pretty clear that 
um, you know, city council cannot cannot do that. So, so I think that that's that's my take on it. But obviously, if there's something in a municipal finance guide that uh, the solicitor can look at, that's great. But the charter is fairly fairly clear, um, and that's a that's a state law in and of itself that I would assume, um, unless yeah, that's one that I'm not familiar with. Councilor Quinlan. Well, I, I was looking at this level funding concept here, looking at the three line items, the three lines, PSOM, OOM, and saying, let's just cut those numbers off the end, to me is not a solution. Uh, you know, I agree with what uh, Councilor Foster said earlier about our contractual obligation to these people. We've signed a contract and we haven't signed a contract, but the mayor has signed a contract with them. Uh, I think it's important that we live up to that. That's our, you know, as the city, I think that we've made that agreement. So my proposal would be to slow down the purchase of the vehicles. Uh, cutting 45,000 doesn't mean anything. These vehicles are $70,000 cars. They're buying five of them for 70,000 and uh, $250, something like that per vehicle. My concept would be, let's eliminate three of those cars. That would get the police department onto a seven year rotation, two cars every year. And that would be $210,495 right there. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz, I, I sensed you had a clarification. No? Okay. Um, okay. Um, Councillor Jarrett, you were letting other people speak first. Are you, um, can I, there? It's, that would be fine, but I was going to respond to Councillor Quinlan. Okay, quick response. Okay. Um, I, you know, we would take away these amounts, but we're the mayor's office to request a, a, a movement from one to the other um, at, you know, after consulting with the police chief. I mean, I think that I would be very receptive to any change there to really give the police police department as much flexibility as possible within the, the budget that we're you know, the limits that we're giving them, but, you know, whether that's personnel, ordinary maintenance, or other than. So if, I don't know if that uh, helps. So it's, it's kind of, you know, their decision, I, I see, as to where they, they want to move, given the, the funding restriction that we're giving. Yeah, I'm not, I wasn't really clear on that. I thought that we, that we dictated the amount in each, in each line. I think we do, but we can also change that upon request. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am going to go to Councillor. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Foster and then Councillor Thorpe. Thank you. Um, one, I guess I have two thoughts on this. Um, I'd like to echo Councillor Jarrett's um, point that I definitely feel flexibility um, should requests for. Um, changing changing funds from one line to another uh, were to come before the council. So I just wanted to state that. The other thing um, is I recognize this is not the role of the council, but it's two in the morning and I'm gonna jump out of my lane here for a second to say that one concern I have is that in our overall budget, $200,000 um, could go back into the general fund and, and, and disappear. Um, I'm the director of a nonprofit. We call our operating expenses the beast and the beast just, swallows things unless I earmark it separately. And if we're really going to look at this as an opportunity to create change, then I just am making the strongest recommendation I can. I know that I don't have the authority to do this, but I would like to see funding allocated toward a position who can write the grants, do the work um, and, and a paid position to help create the change that we're talking about here. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because I think that that is, um, it's one thing to make a statement, which in some ways um, cutting funds from the police department's budget will in some ways hamper efforts toward change because we're now reducing um, the resources that they have available to them. Um, and I believe very firmly, I've, I've heard this, I believe it, that we can do with less policing here in Northampton at the same time to create change is going to create an investment in resources. And I, I just would like to see 
um, that effort be made. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sierra. Whoever I am at this I jump point. On and, uh, I appreciate what Councillor Quinlan had to say uh, regarding the uh, contract, uh, contractual salaries. That was one of my big concerns is that we have that obligation uh, to fulfill. I appreciate what Karen Foster had to say about that as well. That was my position as well. And coming from Ward 4, I've heard from both sides on this matter uh, regarding funding. I've heard a, a large portion of people um, regarding you know, defunding and uh, not increasing the budget. And I have a good amount of people in Ward 4 who are very supportive of the police department and wants the, um, you know, the, the budget to remain as it is. So it's a, it's a balancing act that uh, we're going through. I, I was definitely on board to have the, um, the, the vehicle cost removed. And from what I'm hearing from all the counselors, I just want to make sure, are we ready to move forward tonight on this? Or do we need time to look at some of the stuff that people were bringing up tonight? That's my own thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Zabar, did you have final thoughts? Yes, um, a quick one. I just want to thank everybody who has called all of us counselors and in emails of their concerns and their thoughts of what to do with money if we could get it and where to put it. So I want to just thank them. Thank you. Council Councilor Dwight. Uh, point of order, um, the, uh, uh, we're debating an amendment that hasn't been made. Yes. Yeah. So somebody needs to- Councilor Jarrett, I think Councilor Jarrett, you were queued up to uh, make an amendment. Sure, I'm happy to. I'm not sure I'll get the language exactly right. Um, but I move to amend the police department's budget to remove uh, one hundred and forty thousand and forty-two dollars from PS, eight thousand and seventy-two dollars from OM, and forty-five thousand four hundred and sixty-five dollars from OOM. I second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Any Who was the second? Yes. Sorry. Who was the second? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Dwight. So again, this is <clears throat> this is a motion to adopt the FY twenty twenty one general fund budget with the um, with that thirty eight thousand dollar line item removed from it. Um, so the motion has been made to amend it um, by a reduction of that amount from um, the police department. <clears throat> Counselor, what page is that on? I'm trying to find that. 51. Upper right hand corner, 51. One, Counselor. 51, 51. Thank you. Upper right hand corner. I got it. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor with that amendment. Um, we're in discussion, Councillor Nash. Just is this to the the question to this motion? It is to the it, it is, and um, that the the concern that was raised by Councillor Foster and Quinlan around contractual obligations. So by adopting this uh, motion, we those those issues are taken care of. I'm just so tired. I want to be clear. <laughs> uh, Mayor Narkowitz. Did you? So we are required to pay the contractual salaries. And so, um, and it, we have, um, and so the money that we allocated is to meet the contractual salaries for the number of officers that we have. Mm -hmm. So um, by reducing that amount, we'll, 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 we'll need to reduce officers. Um, that's just, that's, you know, PS, that's the only thing PS pays for is for, for staff. So that will be the effect, but it's not, that's not a violation of the collective bargaining agreement necessarily. It's that we only have enough money to pay those um, negotiated wages for a set number of employees. So we would just, we would need to reduce um, the number of employees. That's the way the process would work. Thank you. 
So it's not, it's not a violation, you know, we're not, we're not, so we're not asking, um, we're not taking away any benefits. We're required to pay them, but um, that's, that was the, you know, the, the whole idea of this being a level service budget was maintaining the same amount of staff, but paying the contractual, um, you know, and again, this happens in every one of our departments, every one of our departments, you'll see increases in PS and it's to cover, not because we're adding staff, but because we're, were, um, you know, matching their contractual obligations. So that there's no, I guess the question I'm hearing is, is this some violation? Um, and it's not. No, that's not what I was saying. It related to Councillor Foster's and Quinlan's concerns about if we're meeting that, that we don't want to be doing things where we're not meeting our contractual obligations. So, um, so maybe we're seeing the both same thing very tiredly. <laughs> if I may, I think Councilor you're, you're muted, Mayor. We're both saying the th same thing at two o'clock in the morning, and it sounds different, probably. But yeah. Okay, I saw Councilor Foster, Councilor Quillen, Councilor Mayori in that order. Councilor Foster. You. Thank you. Um, so I guess I have two thoughts. One is it's two o'clock in the morning um, and I am looking at the names on this budget of people who serve our city. Um, there is, so I have two thoughts on this. One is if there's a desire and a need to move ahead tonight, there is a vacancy and I would propose that rather than, than simply cutting the PS line, the 140, 140,000, 42, that instead we cut it by the amount of the vacancy of the administrative sergeant, 73,257, um, to either make that amendment or what I would really prefer would be to have this discussion at another time when we've, uh, when it's not two o'clock in the morning, when we don't have other pressing things on the agenda and we have a chance to be um, incredibly thoughtful about exactly what numbers and exactly what line. Mayor Norkowitz, did you, um, were you gonna respond to that or no? Um, um, I'm, again, I think that you're voting on the bottom line numbers. Um, certainly you could pick a number that's equal to that, but again, um, there's, um, that's a that's a that's a sergeant position that just became um, vacant because of um, a retirement, and so um, there will be a promotional opportunity for somebody to move into that. And so there, so it's it, I, I just don't know that you can say we want to eliminate that one position. Um, so I think you'd be safer picking a number that's equivalent, or just picking the number which is again the increases that that everyone seems to be so concerned about the. Um, expansion of the police department. So um, that's um, that's all I'm that's all I'm just cautioning against is that that's not really um, you have you can cut a number in PS, but you can't really you can't cut a position in PS. Um, right. th that precisely. Thank you. Yeah, and that's sort of what I was proposing was to change the number in PS that we were considering cutting. Okay. Councilor Quinlan. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just the same, the same as Councilor Foster. I'm, I'm thinking about the people, and while we've been urged to, to, you know, shrink the police force, I'm not sure that this is how we want to do it. Um, I, I think the, the 194 or the 210,000, if it was three of those vehicles that are 70,000 bucks each, uh, would be effective in reducing the overall budget without uh, risking losing jobs in the city because we've already, we're already laying nine people off. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Councillor. I, I don't want to keep reiterating this, but it sounds like we might need a little bit more time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jarrett, I saw your hand and um, we can, Councillor Jarrett, and then we'll discuss options. Sure. Um, yeah, just to re reiterate my earlier point of, you know, since 
I believe that we as the council would be flexible about moving items around between PSOM and OOM. We're not necessarily, you know, we, we would respond to, to a change. Um, I'm sorry, it is pretty late and I'm repeating myself. So that, that's all. You're not the only one. Um, okay, so I, I'm hearing um, a desire to talk about possibilities. Uh, Councilor Dwight, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, to some degree, actually, given we actually have in our rules um, a requirement, we used to have in our rules a requirement to end the meeting at a certain point because uh, uh, just what Councilor Foster was referring to is our ability to actually legislate. I wouldn't even say it our best, but to to, to legislate at least. Your sound's our, going a little bit wonky. Maybe like adjust around the beard or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, thanks. How's that? <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yeah. That worked. All right. So uh, when we start to get punchy, we're not doing anyone any good, and there we have a rather substantial agenda, as everyone pointed out, beyond this, and. Um, we may have to actually have a special meeting. Um, I mean, I hate to do that to you and any of us, but we may have to consider that, that we, we are not doing what we should do if we continue the meeting to three, four o'clock in the morning. If it is, if, uh, if we, we, we can barely manage now. Everyone's running on fumes. Um, I there think for four, the there are like three more steps just in this order part exactly, of the process exactly so I, I i would i would recommend that we get through this part of the process uh, and then we would uh postpone the rest uh and continue at a meeting of uh, you know a special meeting substitute so okay um i i hear that request i'm going to note there is there's at least one item on the agenda that is very time sensitive um, so, uh, we hold up Mayor Narkowitz. Yeah, that's so I was just screaming, but you couldn't yeah. hear me, uh, that we kind of need, there's the downtown ordinance. That's yeah. pretty critical because the governor is going to make an announcement on Saturday. So, right. Um, so we cannot postpone the rest of the agenda. We do need, um, we could continue this part, um, and move on to the to the at least the thing that must be handled tonight. I I don't disagree with that. I think actually uh, we we do have time flexibility with the budget to do. I think as far as the rest of the world is concerned about this discussion about the the items relative to the police, um, maybe there's some level of satisfaction when people have a sense of how it's going to shake out. And um, it would give us an opportunity to recollect ourselves and have uh, had the opportunity to still have an extended debate about it, about the end. because I, I think I agree I think those points are very they're cogent uh, uh, meeting contractual obligations and then basically forcing the situation that requires layoff is um, cause for concern and I, I take Council Jarrett's point but it's not a given. And so, um, so we, I don't think we've got the bandwidth or the stamina to continue the debate and give it its um, due diligence at this point. You're unmuted, Mayor Narcos. I guess I, just, I guess I just want to say that I've been obviously offering all kinds of helpful suggestions, but I, I support the budget that I put forward as does Chief Casper. So, I, and so if you're expecting us to come up with a series of cuts for you, that's not really what we're gonna be doing. Um, you know, you're the city council, you're the legislative body, we can certainly provide information, um, but that's not really what we're, so I just wanna, I mean, that, if that's what you're thinking that we're gonna come back to you with a set of cuts, that's not really what, because I don't believe we should cut. Um, I believe that you know we should maintain the level services that we have. Um, that's the that's what I brought forward to you. I was not expanding the police department. I was bringing forward level services. So, um, so I mean, I think it's pretty it's pretty easy. I mean, you've 
you people want people don't want you to increase the budget for the police department. So it's a pretty straightforward thing, three numbers. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there because I I was concerned hearing that we can talk to Chief Casper, or we can figure out what the right way to do this is. And I can tell you, Chief Casper doesn't support cutting this. So that's the challenge. So anyway, I just wanted to make put that on the record. Um, Noted. <clears throat> Okay, so what would, uh, um, Laura, I know you're as tired as I am. Uh, yeah. What would this look like? It would, we would need a um, motion to continue the motion, debate. Motion to continue. And then if, uh, well, let's just deal with this one. Um, okay. That's what we need, apparently. I move that we continue the debate on the budget to a meeting to be determined. Mm -hmm. Where was that second? Councilor Nash, okay. Motions are made and seconded. Discussion, I will just start with the discussion. Um, so uh, we can set up a special meeting. Um, as we know, this process needs to be done by June 30th. So that is the timetable we're working with. Our next meeting is in two weeks on June 18th. 13 um, days. Say again? 13 days now. <laughs> 13 days, yes, less than two weeks away. Um, closer every minute. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Labarge, this is to the motion to continue. So I, I was just going to ask if we have a city council meeting on the 18th of June, why don't we do it earlier instead of seven o'clock at night and finish off what we're doing this evening? Oof. Like do it earlier. Let's like actually that. do a double header. Is that what you're proposing? <laughs> um, okay, that's a thought. Uh, Councilor Mayori. Apologies, I'm not following what's happening here. I couldn't really hear Bill. And I just, I don't, are you saying we're not going to pick this up tonight after all these people have been on? waiting and we're going to leave with nothing resolved is that what's happening i'm just really not the, getting it the motion on the floor is to continue this um the, and just to remind everyone what this is this is the adoption of the general fund budget um uh with the removal as amended i believe right removal at uh, alex jarrett's uh, Councilor Jarrett's part, right? I guess what, so. We're, we're after we were about to make a motion to to, to level fund, and now we're not going to do that tonight. Is that what's happening? Well, this motion can fail. There's been a motion made to continue this. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any further discussion to this motion to continue? Well, yeah, I'm not, uh, I would rather d get something done after all this work tonight. <laughs> I know. Maybe I'm not, you know. I agree. I, I think we put the time and we were almost about to, to, to take a motion. Um, so, I mean, I'm kind of would feel a, a big sense of accomplishment if, if we could get through this item and then the, the, the immediate item that that's the time sensitive item. Yep. That's my opinion. Okay, there were other voices also. that that um, weren't necessarily comfortable with making that final decision at this moment, but I'll let someone else speak to this if they'd like to. Otherwise, we can take a vote on this motion to continue. Uh, I... yeah, at that time, um, yeah. Council, that um, with hearing from uh, Councillor Foster and with Councillor Quinlan that maybe some time was more time was needed because just to figure things out and how late it was and um, so 
I understand where um, Councilor Mayori is coming from, um, but I would still, I, I would still not oppose moving this um, to another date. But if people want to move it forward tonight, I would do the vote as well. Thank you. Councilor Dwight. The thing is, is if anyone has any doubt of what the outcome is going to be, I think people should be fairly assured that essentially the consensus already has been described that there will be double funding. It is how that manifests and what people are concerned about. And I think it's, we are at 215. We we're, are not we're going to- We're struggling to hear you again, I think. We're at 215 and we're likely to go till at least 230 uh, with the rest of the items. So I, I, I think that given the fact that folks have a pretty good sense of how this is going to shake out, um, it's not a fait accompli, it's not, you don't get to, to celebrate necessarily, but I think anyone who's been attending has, has a pretty, should have a pretty good idea how this is going to pan out. And, and now the devil's in the details, and that's what we have to work on. And at 2.15 in the morning, working out the details, probably not the optimal time. It would not do the question justice. And we, I mean, it, we are obliged to do this. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to continue? Well, uh, um, yes, and it should be noted that we um, working out those details is something that we have to do in public. So that would mean that we're not going to do this um, in this interim time uh, with each other, but not uh, in a meeting. What that would mean is a special meeting um, Sorry, can you not hear me either? Um, what that would mean is a special meeting um, to to do that in an open public meeting. Okay, uh, I think I was about to call for a roll call. Okay, Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Oh, hold on. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. No. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. We will be continuing um, this motion to adopt the fund budget with that removal as amended um, and uh, we will need to figure out when we are going to continue that too um, and make sure that it gets it will be posted posted um, uh, properly to follow open meeting law but we will make sure that people are aware of when that is um, okay so we are moving on to 20.054. Uh, so I'm like in, working in very slow mode, it feels like. Um, uh, order to approve FY 2021 sewer enterprise fund budget. Um, so. Motion was made by Councillor Dwight. Yes. Second. Seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Um, is there a uh, discussion? Seeing not, this is an order to approve FY 2021 sewer enterprise fund. Um, uh, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. 
Councillor Labarge. Councillor Labarge. Yes. You said Councillor yes. Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Moving on to 20.055, in order to approve FY 2021 Water Enterprise Fund Budget. Move to approve. Motions are made. Second. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Uh, that passes in first reading. We uh, okay. I'm going to go to Councillor Jarrett. You are unmuted. Yes, um, I uh, need to step back for step away for uh, this next one because I have a conflict to describe before. Okay, thank you for disclosing <laughs> that. Um, okay, this is twenty point zero five six in order to approve FY twenty twenty one. Uh, solid Waste Enterprise Fund Budget. Move to approve. Motion's been made. Been, been made and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Oh, excuse me. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Yeah. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Uh, Councillor Jarrett, we, there you are. Um, okay, 20.057, in order to approve FY 2021 Stormwater and Flood Control Enterprise Fund budget. Move to approve, please. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight. Second. Seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. That passes in first reading. We're up to 20.058 in order to approve FY 2021 revolving funds. Move to approve, please. Motion's been made. Second. Second. Seconded Jared. by Councillor Jared. Jarrett. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. We didn't hear you, Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Is that a yes? Or, yeah. I don't know if, think so. I wasn't sure if he's. It's, it's an on now. the move yes, I believe. Okay. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. On to 20.059 in order authorizing acquisition and establishment of a municipal light plant. Move approval, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Maori. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Councillor Dwight. Yes. 
Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Uh, now 20.061, in order to rescind borrowing authority, two votes. You missed 20.060. I sure did. Apologies, 20.060, in order to approve gift fund expenditures for street and transportation sharing. Move approval, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Joyce, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Discussion. <laughs> Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. That was 060, correct? Yes. yes. That does not need a second reading. Am I right? Oops, hold up. Uh, uh, oh. There is a request, I guess, for two. I know there's a request. For the other one. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't aware of a request, but maybe. Hold on. Sir, You're getting on. unmuted. Hold on. Sorry. I was just going to say that it's because we're, um, oh, it's still rela it's related to the downtown project that if you wouldn't mind, it would allow us if we got some gifts, we'd be able to expend them. So um, right now we've got some gifts, but we wouldn't be able to expend them until you approve this. So if for buying umbrellas or chairs or whatever it is. So you can wait if you want, but if it sort of is a corollary to the other order. Okay. And it'll Move be one last thing on your next agenda. <laughs> yeah. Motion Move to suspend the rules. rules. Okay. Motions are made by Councilor Foster, seconded by Councilor Dwight to suspend rules. Discussion on suspension of rules. Seeing none, roll call on suspension of rules, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Can you hear me? If you turn towards us, we can. <laughs> Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay. Uh, rules have been suspended. Move second reading, please. Motion's been made. Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Jarrett to um, second reading. Uh, discussion on second reading. Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. Uh, 20.061 in order to rescind borrowing authority, two votes. Move approval, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Nash. Discussion? What, the, what does two Jarrett. votes mean there? I think. Uh, Mayor, it's, oh, Susan, hold on, hold on. And I'm the one who gave it the title. It's just oh. referring to the fact that there's two separate borrowing votes that are being okay. rescinded. rescinded. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes, I'm looking at you. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Councillor Labarge, we can't hear you. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. We are moving on to orders. This is 20.062 in order temporarily suspending the effect of certain ordinances in response to efforts to reopen restaurants. This is first reading. Um, um, I haven't, we, I haven't, uh, I didn't read this, right? I don't think I read this. 
I'm going to read this. Uh, in City Council, June, it's now June 5th, people, but it says June 4th, 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. Uh, 20.062 in order temporarily suspending the effect of certain ordinances in response to efforts to reopen restaurants in compliance with the requirements of COVID safe social distancing. Whereas a sudden generally unexpected occurrence of circumstances demanding public action has arisen worldwide, including the city of Northampton due to the coronavirus slash COVID-19 pandemic, uh, quotes the pandemic. And whereas on March 10th, 2020, the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts declared a state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the pandemic. And whereas on March 16th, 2020, the mayor of the city of Northampton declared a state of emergency in the city of Northampton due to the pandemic. And whereas on March 20th, 2020, Northampton Board of Health declared a state of emergency in the city of Northampton due to a pandemic. And whereas on March 15th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an order prohibiting on premises, consumption of food or, or drink. And whereas on June 1st, 2020, the governor issued his four phase plan for reopening Massachusetts, which includes outdoor restaurant table service in phase two. And whereas in order to facilitate the reopening of restaurants and outdoor only table service restaurants in certain zones of the city as depicted on the plan entitled COVID, uh, quote, COVID-19 restaurant response zones, and quote, may need to include contiguous and non-contiguous outdoor areas, including some within public ways and some on other property of the city. And whereas phase two of reopening Massachusetts is tentatively scheduled to commence on June 8th, 2020. And whereas the city council finds that encouraging, promoting and facilitating reopening of restaurants and COVID-19 restaurant response zones by temporarily allowing certain activities to take place within public ways and on other public property would not otherwise be allowed absent the state of emergency in order to allow orderly opening of restaurants consistent with the requirements of the governor's phase two order, it is in the public interest. Now, therefore, the Northampton City Council orders as follows. <clears throat> One, notwithstanding any order of the city council to the contrary, within the areas depicted on the plan entitled, quote, COVID-19 restaurant response zones, unquote, the zones, the city council mm -hmm. hereby authorizes the change of use of any property within the public way or on other city property, city property, to outdoor restaurant table service seating the outdoor table service areas. Uh, two, the mayor shall, in his discretion, designate the locations of outdoor table service areas, may enter into licenses, easements, agreements, and other instruments as he deems necessary, may designate rules and regulations for the use of the outdoor table service areas, and may take such other action as he deems necessary to effectuate this order. Three, with regards to outdoor table service areas and ancillary areas within the adjacent zones, sections uh, 121, 285-5, 285-8, 285-11, 285-29, and chapter 303 are hereby suspended to it, to the extent necessary in the mayor's discretion in order to effectuate the intent of this order. For notwithstanding the schedule set forth in article seven, parking spaces in the zones may be redesignated as outdoor table service areas in the mayor's discretion. The mayor may designate other areas within the public way as parking in lieu of spaces redesignated as outdoor table service areas. Five. Notwithstanding the foregoing enumeration of ordinances, the intent of this order is to suspend temporarily, to the extent necessary, those ordinances that would inhibit, interfere with, or prohibit the, com uh, the conversion of city property within the zones to outdoor table service areas. Six, this order shall lapse on November 15th, 2020, or upon the lifting of the governor's declared state of emergency, whichever occurs sooner without further action by the city council, thereupon all ordinances suspended in whole or in part hereunder shall revert to their full force and effect immediately preceding this order. Um, I move it for purposes of discussion. Second. A motion has been made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Nash. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Oh, wait, hold on. So can I uh, speak to um, this? Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz, would you like to speak to this first before? Um, I just, I was, the, as the sponsor, I was just going to, I mean, we've already talked about it a little bit earlier when Mr. Biden was on, and um, essentially it's going to sort of doing what's similar to what's happening at the, at the state level. The governor has, um, has issued an order that includes some relaxation of some of the state regulations. Um, and there's actually a bill that's in process right now that will do even more. Um, 
but we want to be able to, when the governor makes an announcement on Saturday of when phase two begins, we want to be able to um, quickly um, ramp up outdoor dining space. We've had a planning committee of six different city departments working with DNA and the Florence Civic and Business. And um, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of um, uh, anticipation for especially for restaurants who've been closed or, or trying to get by with just takeout service. And um, so there's a lot of moving parts, but this is a key part of it. The city solicitor uh, went through our ordinances to try to figure out which types of things would be triggered by trying to move into the public way or, um, you know, with license commission is working on extension of premises issues, but this is just a temporary measure that expires in November or whenever the governor's um, uh, executive uh, order uh, state of emergency ends. Um, and it just will allow us the flexibility to be able to accommodate this outdoor dining. Councilor Dwight. The reason I, I did the focus, purpose of discussion is that I want to reiterate my concerns and that, and I'll just be brief. These are public spaces, public ways, and we've often had conflicts between business owners and um, people that they felt were undesirable. And, had, and um, this actually kind of ties in with the larger conversation that we've had for the last two days. I just want us to be conscientious. I understand and, in fact, agree that we should do whatever we can to get businesses back on, our, on their feet because, one, it generates revenue for the city, but two, it also provides jobs and opportunities for people who are desperate for those right now. But at the same time, I don't want a presumption of primacy on the sidewalks by businesses asking, uh, calling in the police when they, if they feel that someone's behaving inappropriately proximate to their restaurant, that, that, uh, that they're at, it, it, when they're, conducting themselves in the way that, that would be normally allowed. So I, I just want to be clear on that. And I, I am prepared to vote for this, but it was is with these caveats that I want to be, I, I think we should definitely pay attention to how this is prosecuted. Um, thank you, Councilor Dwight. I share those concerns. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I want to, um, First, uh, thank Mayor Narkowitz and his staff for uh, working on this and responding to the concerns of the downtown businesses, the, both the chamber and the DNA, um, that, uh, that as a member and part of some of their discussions, they've been, they've been trying to be optimistic, but they've been pretty glum at the same time. And that this will uh, provide some measure of optimism for them. Um, and the other piece is that um, I, I, to, uh, I, I share Councillor Dwight's concerns about if we're, if we're uh, broadening uh, the use of private use into this increased public space, um, that we need to be careful about what we're doing. And that's why I was asking um, uh, 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 Mr. Fiden those broader questions, because I didn't think he'd be here at this time about the, the bigger plans for downtown. And when there, there will be some demonstration projects coming this summer where we do a whole road diet for downtown and where this uh, type of use of the public space for like outdoor seating would have, would have been part of that. So um, anyway. I, I, I am supportive of this and I share Councillor Dwight's concerns and this will all end um, in, in November and it is part of a, a broader experiment that, uh, that we are doing with our downtown to see if we can um, enliven it and at the, right now actually revitalize it a bit, so. Uh, I've unmuted um, Wayne because he deserves credit for still being here. <laughs> Are we sure? <laughs> I think he's he's in the list. There he is. There he is. Wow. Oh my word, he is up. Right? That deserves, I mean. Well, Alan's here too. Alan's yes. working in the background. Yeah, Alan. Alan Wolf, Alan Seawald. Oh, Seawald. Susan, yeah, wow. I don't know if Susan's still here. Yes. 
Susan is still here. Ever, everyone should know that. Oh, look, <laughs> you can all just get in here. Um, I want to okay. see people's pajamas. <laughs> Uh, uh, Councillor Foster. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, where credits do um, with you know Amy Kaylane and DNA and Wayne and the mayor and and DPW and um, police department all working together um, to support. Uh, the downtown businesses. Um, I've heard a lot of interest, um, you know, as, as other communities are are exploring this as well. Um, and so I wanted to express my support and also really appreciate the thoughtfulness that Councillors Dwight and Nash and, and Shara have brought to the discussion around um, the use of public ways. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure these will probably be ongoing discussions, but um, I'm really excited uh, to, to see this um, be moving forward. Uh, thank you, Councillor Foster. Other councillors? Um, I see you, Ezekiel. I cannot call on you. <laughs> um, any, oh, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I think opening the street space uh, for people to dine is a wonderful idea and support our businesses. Um, I want to clarify, and maybe Director Fiden could, could do this. I don't think uh, you should have to spend money to be able to sit uh, and eat downtown. Um, and also, the, you know, if there's takeout restaurants that don't have seating, that there, that there would be some seating where people could get takeout and then go to those. Um, so I'm concerned about the wording that we're only allowing, uh, let's see, it's where it says outdoor restaurant table service seating. Um, will there all, I just, you know, could you speak to that, Director Fine? Um, certainly the intention is to include some public seating that's not related to a specific restaurant. Um, it's probably a question for the city solicitor whether he thinks this ordinance covers or this order covers that as well. But that's only our intention to, to create some spots. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> Table service seating is the language that's contained in the governor's order. And that's what we're trying to fulfill is the governor's order that there be outdoor table service seating um, because there's no indoor seating. So to the extent we're gonna get our restaurants going, it's gonna be outdoor table service. So that's the language that was used and I carried it forward. Um, Alan Wolf. Having, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, so uh, Councilor Jarrett, one problem with having random tables for takeout seating in the city is that the nice thing about having a seating assigned to a given restaurant is that restaurant then becomes uh, accountable for the social distancing, the cleaning, the disinfecting. And if you have random tables on the street, we, we talked about doing this and frankly, the health director said no. So until we move further along in the phases, we can't just have a table. We thought about having a spot where people could congregate voluntarily, but unless we then hire someone to clean it every time they get up and leave, um, we can't do it. So it's not part of the current plan. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, one more question. Um, the current order, and I realized this when I went downtown to eat, uh, you know, you can't wear a face mask and eat at the same time. So is the health director planning on updating that? Who's it's already gonna... been done. Mr. Siebel says it's been done. Anyone else want to weigh in? I see nodding. Hold on. You're muted, Mayor. Yeah, I'm just saying the governor's order specifies that too. I'm pretty sure that that masks aren't required at the mm. table when you're eating. So yeah, but I know Meredith's already working on it, right? It's already been issued or already been updated. Wait, yeah, I, I, I did the revisions and she approved them. Okay. I don't know so, whether she issued it or not. And the other one that is on the table and we're waiting to hear any minute is the ability to go into the restaurant and use the restroom. Um, and rumor is that that will be clear by the time we're ready to do this too. So that's at the table only. So for example, someone couldn't uh, go sit in the grass physically distant and take off their mask and eat under this order. 
I mean, under the the health That's department. Right. right. The the health department order right now that I drafted was for the table service. Um, we haven't discussed. I haven't discussed with Meredith at all um, anything about any other eating downtown and removing of masks. That doesn't mean that she wouldn't be amenable to it, but we haven't discussed it. Right. So I'm just concerned that we're setting, we are setting up a situation with that where you can only eat if you've purchased something at a restaurant. Um, you can't, you know, come into town in another fashion and eat the food that you've brought, even if you are being physically distant. So, but, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot to consider there, but I'm just putting that concern forward. We can talk to Meredith about that for sure. Other counselors? Okay. Um, seeing none, um, Alan uh, Seawald, oh, just disappeared on me. Um, since, well, this might be a council rules question so um so this is not being referred do we need i think we need to suspend rules because it's not being referred to legislative mm -hmm. matters people seem to be concurring I, um I think, I think that's true okay so we it's on the floor um Whoever made uh, help. Can I make a recommendation? Yes, please. Um, we could send this to legislative matters which meets Monday. And if it's on the LM, and then we have a special meeting that's coming up that will allow us to vote on this in two readings in a timely fashion that will allow for um, them to go into effect and when the government's order is changed. Um, we didn't have a special meeting before, so that was problematic. But now we do have a special meeting, so that we can we can do this fast enough. Um, okay, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to unmute Wayne and the mayor because I know they have things to say on this. And the the three of you that are in here, I like seeing your faces. It's really hard for me to focus and uh, click on the right people, and I'm really sorry. So I'm going to ask if you could turn your video off just so I can we can just get we can get there. Thank you. Just two things. One is obviously notice for if you wait if you wait till Monday, can you get the notice in time? And the other thing is just obviously every day we can get it sooner, the more we can start setting things up. So we'd like a vote tonight if that's possible. If that's not possible, we're obviously late. Yeah, I would concur. I mean, we're 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 you know, the governor's gonna make an announcement on Saturday that they're saying it could be as soon as Monday. It could be as soon, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and so we we've already got we've already got people that are queued up to go before the license commission on Monday, um, and so I just feel like I, um, I, I would I would ask that this be be waived so that we could get this in place. So I mean, we're looking around us, Amherst, everyone else is getting ready to stand these up, and that's going to be the other piece of it. It's not just to it's not just to support restaurants; it's to bring people into downtown. Who are then also going to go to retail stores? Who are then also going to, you know, just sort of re reinvigorate downtown? So, if like, oh, you know, Northampton couldn't get its act together, and so let's all go to Amherst or go wherever. I, I'm just, I just don't want us to disadvantage our businesses um, downtown by not. It's already been hard to get this thing rolled out because the governor has been very, you know, close to the vest and how, how he's going to do this. And even when he did release his four phase plan, it was still very cryptic. So we're having to do this very fast and very rapidly. So that would just be my plea that we, um, I guess I, I just trying to understand what would, what would, what would necessarily change. Um, but that's my take on it. Councilor Dwight. Nothing would change. Well, what is changing, of course, is, is the protocols and, it's, um, and the opportunity for, um, I mean, we, here we are as a tenant to uh, public participation in the conversation wouldn't be, wouldn't be available. So that's my own concern. I, I do appreciate 
the necessity and the circumstances. So I'm willing to, to, to let that pass. We're lucky in that. But, uh, and for the four people who notice or care, that's what. Uh, Hold your mic up. That's my statement. <laughs> um, other Sarah. Yes. Legislative matters doesn't have a posted meeting on Monday, so it wouldn't be possible. If I understood him correctly, it wouldn't be possible to meet and consider it Monday. Good point. Good yeah, point. I was. Okay. Councilor Nash. I'll be fast. Other other states are ahead of us. New Hampshire and Vermont already have outdoor seating going on. People are out. I was up there last weekend, probably uh, illegally, but it was it was very nice to sit at a table outside. And um, in Hanover, the downtown was getting reinvigorated because people were there enjoying the restaurants. I, I I think the sooner we can get it going, the better. Um, okay, so I'm still, we have a motion on the floor, um, but we have other ones we need to make. I also. Well, we got to get through this vote, the first vote. And then we can, right. And then we vote for a second reading. Actually. And yes, yet, except the problem the is. The referral. Yes. Oh, the the referral. Referral. What's the problem? The referral. Uh, the, we have to, we have to suspend Suspend rules. rules. A different, a we need to double it. We need to do two suspensions. Right. Different roles. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to suspend rules to uh, bypass the referral. Motion has been made. Second. Seconded by Councilor Quinlan. Discussion on the suspension of rules of, um, uh, what's it called when we do this? We refer, refer it <laughs> to legislative matters. Seeing none, I don't see Councillor Labarge. I don't know if we lost her. Um, uh, roll call, please. Okay. Um, and the second was that Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I keep muting myself. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. She stepped away. Okay. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The rule to refer has been suspended. Um, uh, Councillor Jarrett? Um, I don't know if the mayor is still here. Uh, you know, I do feel comfortable moving forward on this, but I do feel like we are putting a lot of trust uh, in the mayor to consider the issues of um, making sure that everyone is has the it, the downtown is accessible to everyone um and so these the questions of you know whether you could eat not at a table um and such so i just would appreciate your assurance that 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 is something you will take strongly into account and most definitely i mean we want to create we want to create a vibrant we want to create a, a space that people can move around and have access and and i agree with you that if you um if you do get a pita pocket and want to go sit in the park and eat it there then the mask rules should apply there as well so i think that i'm totally amenable to talking to um i've, I've had a one constituent who's been um i'm asking me this question over and over again about if i go sit in the park and i eat with my mask I take my mask off. So I think that's something we need to address anyway for that purpose. So I, and I understand the concerns that Councillor Dwight has as well, but we wanna make downtown, we don't wanna cordon off sidewalks or make it impossible to walk around. Um, so we're, that'll be part of what we're trying to do. So we will 
try to maintain access, sidewalk access, and, um, and as well as allow people that don't want to come downtown to eat, but just want to come down and move around and just enjoy downtown. That's what we're going for. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Call Laura, do we still have, what's that? Call the question. Well, the question is, what's, is there the question? To call, uh, Laura. Do we still have the initial motion for the first reading on the floor? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Seeing or the question has been called. Roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. She's still. Oh, stepped away. I'm not able to see her, so. I don't. Uh, I don't see her in the list. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. And Councilor Dwight. Yes. Uh, okay. Move to suspend rules to allow for a second reading. Second. Second. Motions been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Nash to suspend rules. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? Hearing none, roll call on the suspension of rules, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Again, step away, I'll stop calling. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Uh, um, move second suspended. reading, please. Motion has been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Jarrett for second reading. Um, discussion on second reading. Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Uh, Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. That passes in two readings. Okay, the last item we have on our agenda is new business, um, which can be introduced and it cannot be deliberated. Uh, we, Alan, did you have something to say? No? Oh, he disappeared again. Um, new business can't deliberate it we can introduce it um we um, could also choose to uh have it on the next agenda um as it which it would be anyway um tell me your pleasure it's timely but um Councilor Dwight my concern is that Councilor Thorpe has to get up in half an hour to start running <laughs> <laughs> and I <laughs> and and there's three people left to hear the the resolution. And there are apparently actually 45 people left. And if oh. I can if I can Amazing. chime in, uh, 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 counselors. Yeah. So I was going to ask you earlier if we should continue, just because we we had two public comments earlier, and I didn't know your thoughts around what was mentioned, and if you even wanted to even take a look at the uh, 10 point plan that the Black and Latino Caucus put out to include. Well, we'd now be getting into deliberation. Oh, sorry, forget it, forget it. So we're not gonna talk about that, but- Can we um, continue at this? Can we, what, what, when, when would we continue at the special, could we continue at the special meeting? No. It would, um, yes, it could be on, it, it would be on the next agenda. That's okay. Right. So I don't, uh, Council Thorpe, I would defer to you if you want to read the uh, resolution for folks to know what the resolution is. I think that would be appropriate. If, and I also understand that you are exhausted and you are insane and get up at 3.30 or something. I, 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 I defer to your choice here. I have no problem doing it. Um, and um, let me ask you this, uh, Councillor Dwight, if we were to do this and you wanted, if we wanted to make some adjustments, would we be allowed to do that after we read it here tonight? We would do it on the next agenda. We would make amendments and additions. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay, so I can uh, I can go through this right now, and uh, I can go through it pretty quickly. So um, we have um, 20.064, a resolution in response to the most recent killings of African Americans. This is upon the recommendation of Councillor William H. Dwight, Councillor John T. Thorpe, Councillor Gina Louise Sierra. Whereas George Floyd, an unarmed African American man, was asphyxiated by a Minneapolis police officer or officers on May 25th, 2020. And whereas Brianna Taylor, an African American emergency room technician, was shot eight times and killed in her own home by Louisville police on March 13th, 2020. And whereas Ahmaud Arbery, an African American man, was shot and killed by two white civilian men while jogging through a South Georgia neighborhood on February 23rd, 2020. And whereas Mr. Floyd's, Ms. Taylor's, and Mr. Arbery's death and the manner of their deaths are yet more examples in a list of countless examples of an endemic culture of oppression and racism that exists in our country. And whereas the widespread revulsion demonstrated by our fellow citizens to this and to all the accumulated historical racist actions requires a reckoning and a commitment from all of us to confront this greatest threat to our society. And whereas in the absence of presidential leadership, it is incumbent upon local authorities to respond to the suffering that racism inflicts. And whereas silence and lack of expressed outrage and sorrow reflects complacency and by extension, complicity in these atrocities. And whereas we continue to mourn the most recent deaths chronicled in this resolution and all of the racially perpetrated deaths that preceded them. And whereas the city council of Northampton has for decades decried and condemned by resolution and laws, the myriad racist acts committed by individuals and persons of authority. And whereas the city council of Northampton will continue to stand unified in our commitment to confront institutional racism, implicit bias and bigotry in all forms and violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city council of Northampton reasserts its unequivocal opposition to expressions and acts of hate and be it further resolved that we call for increased resources from the Commonwealth for comprehensive anti-racism trainings for state and municipal employees and students, and be it further resolved that we will not sanction oppression done in Northampton's name, and be it further resolved that we will devote our efforts to expanding the challenging but necessary community cons conversation on racism in all of our respective culpabilities, and be it further resolved that the administrative assistant shall cause a copy of this resolution to be delivered to Governor Charles Baker, Attorney General Maura Healy, Senators Elizabeth Warren, Edward Marquis, Congressman James McGovern, Massachusetts Senator Joe Comerford, and Massachusetts Representative Lindsay Sabadosa. Thank, Thank you. you, Councilor Thorpe, for introducing that, uh, which will be on the next agenda for deliberation. Um, one more, one more motion. Um, motion to adjourn, please. Is there a second? <laughs> no. Yeah, not here. An all nighter. <laughs> Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by. Second. Seconded no. by Councillor Foster. Um, <laughs> we need a roll call on adjourning. Okay. Um, Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Sure, why not? Why not? <laughs> Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think this is officially my latest council meeting. Thank you to everybody. Um, 